The True, History or the American Revolution By Sidney George Fisher Francis Libber Philadelphia and London J.B. Lippincott Company 1902 Copyright, 1902 Preface The purpose of this history of the revolution is to use the original authorities rather more frankly than has been the practice with our historians. They appear to have thought it advisable to omit from their narratives a great deal which, to me, seems essential to a true picture. I cannot feel satisfied with any description of the revolution which treats the desire for independence as a sudden thought, and not a long growth and development, on which assumes that every detail of the conduct of the British government was absurdly stupid, even from its own point of view and that the loyalists were few in numbers and their arguments not worth considering. I cannot see any advantage in not describing in their full meaning and force the smuggling, the buying of laws from the governors, and other irregular conduct in the colonies which led England to try to remodel them as soon as the fear of the French in Canada was removed. Nor can I accept a description which fails to reveal the salient details of the great controversy over the rather peculiar methods adopted by General Howe to suppress the rebellion. This controversy was a part of the revolution. It involved the interesting question of Howe's instructions from the ministry and the methods which the ministry intended to use with the revolted colonists. Whatever we may now think of Howe's conduct, and in whatever way we may try to explain it, the fact remains that it was once a subject which attracted universal attention and aroused most violent attacks upon him in England and among the loyalists in America. Some of these very plain spoken arraignments, with the evidence in support of them, can still be read in the writings of Galloway, Van Schack, and others, or in Howe's own defense, which some thought was the strongest argument against him. Why should these documents and the evidence taken before the Parliamentary Committee of Inquiry be concealed from the ordinary reader, with the result that if by chance he turns to the original authorities he is surprised to find that the revolution they described is entirely different from the one in which he had been taught to believe? Some of us might possibly not accept these attacks upon how as just or well founded, they might think that his reply, which we can still read in his published narrative, was a complete defense and justification. There is no reason why we should not adopt any opinion or explanation which seems best. But I protest against the historians who refuse to give us a chance to form an opinion of our own on either the one side or the other. I protest against the concealing of this subject, of suppressing the whole of the evidence against how as well as the evidence in his favor and I protest because his conduct necessarily produced momentous results in the revolution. To my mind the whole question of the conduct of General Howe is as important a part of history as the assistance rendered us by France, for if what the people of his own time said of Howe be true, his conduct directly contributed to bring about our alliance with that country, and ultimately our independence. There has, it seems been a strong temptation to withhold from the modern public a knowledge of the controversy over Howe's conduct, because it is impossible to disclose that controversy in all its bearings without at the same time showing that the British government, up to the summer of 1778, used extremely lenient and conciliatory methods in dealing with the revolted colonists. The historians appear to have felt that to admit that such gentle methods were used would be inadvisable would tend to weaken our side of the argument, and show that we were bent on independence for mere independence sake. The historians seem to have assumed that we do not want to know about that controversy, or that it will be better for us not to know about it. They have assumed that it will be better for Americans to think that independence was a sudden and deplorable necessity and not a desire of long and ardent growth and cautiously planned intention. They have assumed that we want to think of England as having lost the colonies by failure to be conciliatory, and that the revolution was a one-sided, smooth affair, without any of the difficulties or terrors of rebellion or a great upheaval of settled opinion. The taint of these assumptions runs through all our histories. They are, I think, mistaken assumptions and an affront to our people. They prefer to know the truth, and the whole truth and there is nothing in the truth of which they need be afraid. 
having decided to withhold from the public a knowledge of the contemporary opinion of how, the historians naturally conceal or obscure his relations to the Whig party, the position of that party in England, its connection with the rebel colonists, the peculiar difficulties under which the Tory ministry laboured, and their instructions to how on the conduct of the war. Unless all these conditions are clearly set forth, most of the events and battles of the revolution are inexplicable. Before I discovered the omissions of our standard histories I always felt as though I were reading about something that had never happened, and that was contrary to the ordinary experience of human nature. I could not understand how a movement which was supposed to have been such a deep uprooting of settled thought and custom a movement which is supposed to have been one of the great epochs of history, could have happened like an occurrence in a fairy tale. I could not understand the military operations and it seemed strange to me that they were not investigated, explained, and criticized like those of Napoleon's campaigns or of our own civil war. I was never satisfied until I had spent a great deal of time in research, burrowing into the dust of the hundreds of old brown pamphlets, newspapers, letters, personal memoirs, documents, publications of historical societies, and the interminable debates of Parliament which, now that the eyewitnesses are dead, constitute all the evidence that is left us of the story of the revolution. Those musty documents painted a very vivid picture upon my mind, and I wish I had the power of painting the picture as the original sources reveal it. I understand, of course, that the methods used by our historians have been intended to be productive of good results, to build up nationality, and to check sectionalism and rebellion. Students and the literary class do not altogether like successful rebellions, and the word revolution is merely another name for a successful rebellion. Rebellions are a trifle awkward when you have settled down, although the Declaration of Independence contains a clause to relieve this embarrassment by declaring that governments long established should not be changed for light or transient causes. The people who write histories are usually of the class who take the side of the government in the revolution and as Americans they are anxious to believe that our revolution was different from others, more decorous, and altogether free from the atrocities, mistakes, and absurdities which characterize even the Patriot Party in a revolution. They do not like to describe in their full coloring the strong Americanism and the doctrines of the rights of man which inspired the party that put through our successful rebellion. They have accordingly tried to describe a revolution in which all scholarly, refined, and conservative persons might have unhesitatingly taken part, but such revolutions have never been known to happen. The revolution was a much more ugly and unpleasant affair than most of us imagine. I know of many people who talk a great deal about their ancestors, but who I am quite sure would not now take the side their ancestors chose. Nor was it a great, spontaneous, unanimous uprising, all righteousness, perfection, and infallibility, a marvelous success at every step, and incapable of failure, as many of us very naturally believe from what we have read. The device of softening the unpleasant or rebellious features of the revolution does not, I think, accomplish the improving and edifying results among us, which the historians from their exalted station are so gracious as to wish to bestow. A candid and free disclosure of all that the records contain would be more appreciated by our people and of more advantage to them. They are as fully competent to judge of actions and events as any one of their number who takes upon himself the tasks of the historian. It will be observed that I invariably speak of those colonists who were opposed to the rebellion as loyalists, and not as Tories. They never fully accepted the name Tory either in its contemptuous sense or as meaning a member of the Tory party in England. They were not entirely in accord with that party. They regarded themselves as Americans who were loyal to what they called the Empire, and this distinction was, in their minds, of vast importance. I have labored to describe them strictly from their own point of view, with the arguments, facts, principles, and feelings which they used in their pamphlets and documents and I give them the name which they preferred. They were far more numerous than is generally supposed, and on the difficult question of their numbers I shall give my readers the advantage of all that I can find in the records.
In the illustrations of this volume I have for the most part avoided reproductions of portraits, because they are apt to be misleading. I have given, however, the portraits of two loyalists, whose fine clothes do not perhaps misrepresent them. We can have faith in very few of the revolutionary portraits as likenesses, and the handsome clothes or magnificent uniforms in which it was easy enough to paint patriot officers, and the modern illustrator's efforts to produce elegance or quaintness, are altogether inconsistent with the agitation, ragged poverty, suffering, and apparent hopelessness which marked one of the most remarkable political outbursts of history. 1. Early Conditions and Causes the great underlying conditions which brought about the revolution were the presence of the French in Canada, and the extremely liberal governments, semi-independence, and disregard of laws and regulations which England, in the early days, was compelled to allow the colonies in America. The increasing power of France in the north compelled England to be liberal and even lax in governing her colonies. As their attitude of France became more and more threatening down to the year 1763, England could take no severe or repressive measures with the Americans, who were growing up very much as they pleased. In our time colonies usually are regarded as places for the overflow of the mother country's excess of population. But down to the time of our revolution England had no overflow of population. When England began to have colonies in America, about the year 1610, her population was only 5 million. At the time of our revolution it was barely 8 million, and large districts of country, especially in the northern part of England, were still almost as primitive and uncultivated as the American wilderness. Colonies were in early times regarded as places for obtaining gold, silver, and furs and it was hoped that if people could be forced to go out to them they might be able to extend trade, furnish England raw material, and create a market for manufactured goods. The people who settled in America were either mere adventurous characters, like the first Virginia colonists, or Puritans, Quakers, and Roman Catholics driven out of England by the severities of royalists and churchmen, or they were royalists, like those of the second migration to Virginia, driven out of England when the Puritans under Cromwell got into power. When persecution ceased there was no migration of any importance to the colonies. Migration to New England ceased after 1640, and in all the colonies the migration was comparatively small. The people increased in the natural way by births, and increased with remarkable rapidity. The two million white colonists of 1776 were largely a native stock, whose ancestors had been on the soil for many generations, and they had grown out of an original stock of immigrants which had not numbered 100,000. Asterisk this native and natural growth is worth remembering when we are seeking to explain the desire for independence. Alluring promises of gold and easy systems of government were the great persuasives to English colonization. The British government, only too glad to be rid of rebellious Puritans, Quakers, and Roman Catholics, willingly gave them liberal charters. This explains that freedom in many of the old charters which has surprised so many students of our colonial history. Some of these liberal instruments were granted by the Stuart kings, with the approval of their officials and courtiers all of whom showed by almost every other act of their lives that they were the determined enemies of free parliaments and free representation of the people. Connecticut, for example, obtained in 1662 from Charles II, a charter which made the colony almost independent, and today there is no colony of the British Empire that has so much freedom as Connecticut and Rhode Island always had, or as Massachusetts had down to 1685. Connecticut and Rhode Island elected their own legislatures and governors, and did not even have to send their laws to England for approval. Asterisk no modern British colony elects its own governor, and, if it is a legislature elected by its people, the acts of that legislature can be vetoed by the home government. A community electing its own governor and enacting whatever laws it pleases is not a colony in the modern English meaning of the word. Connecticut and Rhode Island could not make treaties with foreign nations, but in other respects they were, as we would now say, 
semi-independent commonwealths under the protectorate or suzerainty of England. The obtaining of this extremely liberal Connecticut Charter has sometimes been explained by suggesting that W. Intiowers Op, who went to England to procure it, had money to distribute among courtiers. A pretty story is also told of his having a ring which had been given to his father by Charles I, and this ring, when shown to Charles II, is supposed to have worked the miracle of the Liberal Charter. Neither Connecticut nor Rhode Island changed its form of government during the Revolution. The Connecticut Charter was found to be liberal enough to serve as the constitution of an American state, and Connecticut lived under it until 1818. Rhode Island lived under her charter as a constitution until 1842. But the liberality is more easily accounted for by the desire of the British government to encourage planting, as it was called, and get rid of rebellious and troublesome people. England had not then made up her mind exactly what she meant by a colony, except that she was anxious to have people go out and settle on the wild land in America which was hers by right of discovery. The year after the Connecticut Charter was granted Rhode Island obtained a liberal charter, almost word for word the same as the Charter of Connecticut, and the agent in that case was the Reverend John Clark, a Baptist minister of the gospel, who had no money and no ancestral ring. Some thirty years before that time Massachusetts had obtained a liberal charter. It was possibly intended that the governing body under this charter should remain in England, but the Puritans who had obtained it moved the whole governing body out to Massachusetts, elected their own legislature and governor, and did not submit their laws to England for approval. They assumed several of the attributes of sovereignty. They coined their own money, and issued the famous pine tree shilling. They established by law a form of religion, sometimes called Congregationalism, which was not recognized by the laws of England. They ceased to issue writs in the king's name. They dropped the English oath of allegiance and adopted a new oath in which public officers and the people swore allegiance, not to England, but to Massachusetts. They debated what allegiance they owed to England, and concluded that they were independent in government, that no appeals could be taken to England, but that they were under an English protectorate. When some captains of vessels reminded them that no English flag was displayed in the colony, they debated whether the British flag should be allowed to fly on the fort at Castle Island, and concluded that it might be put there, as that particular fort was the king's property. But they had given so little attention to allegiance and the symbol of it that at the close of this debate no English flags could be found in Boston, and they had to borrow one from the captain of a ship. Asterisk. Under the charter which allowed so much freedom Massachusetts existed from 1629 to 1685, when her disregard of British authority and the killing, whipping, and imprisoning of Quakers and Baptists had reached such a pass that the charter was annulled, and Massachusetts became a colony, with a governor appointed by the king, and controlled in a way which, after her previous freedom, was very galling. These instances show why New England was so hot for independence from 1764 to 1776. Virginia was also ardent, and there, too, we find that an extremely liberal government had been allowed to grow up. Virginia had, alone and single-handed, in 1676, rebelled against the whole authority of the British government, because she thought her privileges were being impaired. Such an outbreak as this and a similar rebellion in Massachusetts in 1690 warned England to be as gentle as possible with the colonies, while France was becoming more and more of a power on the north and west. The other colonies never had so much freedom. None of them elected their own governors, they had not had such a taste of independence as New England and Virginia, which from the English point of view were regarded as the leaders in rebellion but they had all had a certain measure of their own way of doing things, and had struggled to have more of their own way, and had found that England was compelled at times to yield to them. It is not necessary to describe the details of this struggle, its successes or failures. It is of more importance to describe a method of government which grew up in all the colonies that did not elect their own governors, a method which they regarded as the bulwark of their liberties which in England was regarded as scandalous, and which had an important influence on the revolution.
it arose out of the system by which the people of the colony elected the legislature, and the crown, or a proprietor under the crown, as in Pennsylvania and Maryland, appointed the governor. Under this system the legislature voted the governor his salary out of taxes which all these colonial legislatures had the power of levying. The governor had the power of absolute veto on all acts of the legislature, and, as representing the crown, he wanted certain laws passed to carry out the ideas or reforms of the home government. The members of the legislature cared little or nothing for these reforms. As representing the people, they had their popular measures which they wished carried out. These measures the governor usually wanted to veto, either because he deemed them hostile to the interests of the crown, or because he wished to punish the legislature for failing to pass crown measures on which his reputation at home depended. The governor and the legislature being thus dependent on each other, the question of salary threw the balance of power into the hands of the legislature. They quickly learned the trick of withholding the governor's salary until he had assented to their measures. The system became practically one of bargain and sale, as Franklin called it. The people, through their legislators, bought from the governor, for cash, such laws as they needed. The petty squabbles with the governor, based on the detailed working of the system, were interminable in every colony where it prevailed. They fill the minute books and records, making colonial history more tiresome than it might otherwise be, except in one instance, where Franklin, who often came in contact with the system, described it in his inimitable manner. Hence arose the custom of presents twice a year to the governors, at the close of each session in which laws were passed, given at the time of passing, they usually amounted to a thousand pounds per annum. But when the governors and assemblies disagreed, so that laws were not passed, the presents were withheld. When a disposition to agree ensued, there sometimes still remained some diffidence. The governors would not pass the laws that were wanted without being sure of the money, even all that they called their arrears, nor the assemblies give the money without being sure of the laws. Thence the necessity of some private conference, in which mutual assurances of good faith might be received and given, that the transaction should go hand in hand. What name the impartial reader will give to this kind of commerce I cannot say. Time established the custom and made it seem honest so that our governors, even those of the most undoubted honor, have practiced it. When they came to resolve, on the report of the Grand Committee, to give the money, they guarded their resolves very cautiously, to wit, resolved that on the passage of such bills as now lie before the governor, the naturalization bill and such other bills as may be presented to him during the sitting, will be paid him the sum of five hundred pounds. Do not, my Courteous reader, take pet at our proprietary constitution for these our bargain and sale proceedings in legislation. It is a happy country where justice and what was your own before can be had for ready money. It is another addition to the value of money, and, of course, another spur to industry. Every land is not so blessed. Works, Bigelow Edition, Volume 3. Pages 311 to 316. What was thought and said of this system depended entirely on one's point of view. Franklin ridiculed it when it worked against him. Afterwards, in the revolution, when he saw that colonial self-government depended upon it, he became, like Dickinson and other patriot leaders, a staunch upholder of it. Asterisk in England it was regarded as corruption. There was plenty of corruption in England at that time, but outside corruption always seems the more heinous and this particular corruption blocked and thwarted nearly all the plans of the mother country to regulate her colonies. It was believed to have seriously interfered with the raising of supplies and aids for the war against the French and Indians. If anything of the sort existed in our time, if a territory of the United States, or an island like Puerto Rico, were governed in that way, we would denounce it as most atrocious and absurd, and in all probability put a stop to it very quickly. It was very natural that England, acting from her point of view, should start to abolish it as soon as France was driven from the continent, and this attempt was one of the fundamental causes of the revolution. The colonists who had become Americanized, tinged with the soil. 
differentiated from English influence, or, as Englishmen said, rebelliously inclined, were all enthusiastic supporters of the bargain and sale system. They loved it and were ready to die for it, and resisted any change or reform in it. They would not hear of fixing regular salaries upon the governors, because they knew that the moment the governors ceased to be dependent on the legislatures for their salaries, the legislatures would be powerless to accomplish the popular will, and the colonies, except Connecticut and Rhode Island, would fall completely under control of Parliament and the King. Each legislature was called and adjourned by the governor, and he would hardly take the trouble to call it, except to pass crown measures, unless he was dependent on it for his salary. In every colony where this system prevailed there was a body of popular laws on the statute book which, in the course of fifty or a hundred years, had been secured, one by one, by this bargaining with the governor. The people, who were patriotically inclined, loved these laws, and had enjoyed the contests for them. They had heard and read the details of these contests at the taverns and coffee houses, the self-confident, haughty, or scolding messages of the governor, and the astute or sarcastic replies of the legislature, and they fought the wordy battle over again with keen interest. So long as they controlled the governor's salary they felt themselves freemen, once lose that control, and they were, as they expressed it, political slaves. The system extended to the judges, who, though appointed by the crown or governor, were dependent for their salaries on the annual vote or whim of the legislature. In New York the judiciary was believed to be notoriously dependent. A chief justice, it was said, gave a decision against a member of the legislature, who promptly, in retaliation, had the judge's salary reduced fifty pounds. The local magistrates in New York were controlled by the assemblymen. Some of these magistrates could not write, and had to affix their marks to warrants. Asterisk. The colonists insisted that they must retain control of the judges' salaries, because, if the Crown both appointed the judges and paid them their salaries, the decisions would all be Crown decisions. They were willing to compromise, however, and fix permanent salaries on the judges if the home government would agree that the judges should be appointed for life and good behavior instead of holding office at the pleasure of the Crown. This apparently reasonable suggestion the English government would not adopt asterisk they seem to have feared that the judges appointed by the tenure would gradually drift to the side of the colonists, and make regulation and administration more difficult than ever. It was already extremely difficult to get a jury to decide in favor of the crown. The control of the colonies seemed to be slipping away, and the ministry must retain as much of it as was possible. Those acts of Parliament by which the money raised from taxes on the colonics was not to be cast generally into the English exchequer, but to be used for defraying the expenses of government and the administration of justice in the colonies, and therefore would be all spent in the colonics, read innocently enough. What could be more fair and honourable towards you, Englishmen would say, than an act which takes no money out of your country? It is the same money which you now raise by taxing yourselves it will be spent, in the same way as you apply it, to pay governors and judges, and on a fixed and regular system. But the fixed and regular system destroyed what the Americans considered their fundamental, constitutional principle, by which executive salaries must be within popular control. That principle was vitally necessary to all the colonies, except to Connecticut and Rhode Island. It would become vital to Connecticut and Rhode Island if they should lose the right to elect their own governors, as was not improbable when England began her remodeling after the expulsion of France from Canada. One effect of the system was to divide the upper classes of the colonists, and indeed all the people, into two parties, comma, those who were interested in the governor and the executive officers, and those who were interested in the legislature. Around every governor appointed from England there grew up a little aristocracy of powerful families and individuals, with their patronage, influence, and branches extending down through all classes. The people of this party who had means and education considered themselves the social superiors, because they were most closely connected with England and the king, who was the source of all rank and nobility. They considered themselves the only American society that deserved recognition. 
nearly all of them became loyalists in the revolution. Among the legislative parry, as it may be called, there were individuals and families of as much means and as good education as any in the governor's or executive party. But they formed a set by themselves, and were sometimes hardly on speaking terms with the executive party. In some of the colonies the two parties were on friendly terms, but in Pennsylvania, New York, and Massachusetts the contests and hatred between them were, at times, extremely bitter and violent. Prominent men whose names have become household words among us, Hancock, Adams, and Warren, of Massachusetts, Schuyler, Hamilton, and Livingston, of New York, Reed, Morris, Dickinson, and Mifflin, of Pennsylvania, Parker and Chase, of Maryland, and Lee, Washington, Bland, and Harrison, of Virginia, were all of the Whig legislative set. They were more or less distinctly separated from the high society that basked in the regal sunlight which, even when filtered through a colonial governor, was supposed to redeem America from vulgarity. Had the revolution terminated differently, another class of names might be household words in America, comma Hunt, Galloway, Allen, and Hamilton, of Pennsylvania, Delancey, Van Schack, and Jones, of New York, Leonard, Sewall, Kerwin, and Oliver, of Massachusetts common names which once filled a large place in the public vision, but which now are meaningless to nearly everyone. England's easy method of dealing with her colonies had certainly produced a confused and irregular state of affairs, which was worse than has yet been described. It is important for us to remember many of the details of this condition, because they show the beginning of English dissatisfaction with the colonies and of the desire to have a sweeping remodeling as soon as France was out of the way. The colonies, in exercise of the extreme liberty that had been allowed them, had taken on themselves to create their own paper currency. In some of them, especially in New England, the paper currency was very seriously depreciated. In Pennsylvania the currency never depreciated, asterisk but this did not help matters, because conservative people in England would regard it as merely a delusive encouragement of an evil system. This paper money the colonists considered absolutely necessary to supply the place of the gold and silver which were so rapidly drained from them into England to pay for the manufactured goods they bought. There seems to be no doubt but that they were right in this, and so long as the issues of paper money were kept within safe bounds, as in Pennsylvania, no harm resulted. But there were such disastrous results in other colonies that there was a great outcry in England. To many Englishmen this paper money seemed to be a mere dishonorable device to avoid paying the heavy debts which the colonists sold to the British merchants, who sold to them the axes with which they felled the forests, the plows with which they tilled the land, and the utensils in which they cooked their dinners. This opinion was strengthened when it was remembered that some British colonies had attempted to pass stale laws to prevent English merchants from collecting debts, and that this risk had to be removed by an Act of Parliament in 1732, giving English merchants the same right to seize private property for debt in the colonies that they had in England. One finally, in 1751, Parliament tried to remedy the paper money evil, and passed an act declaring the paper money of the New England colonies an illegal tender in payment of a debt. Good people in England and many members of Parliament looked upon the whole revolutionary movement as merely an attempt of debt-ridden provincials to escape from their obligations. A nation on a firm gold basis always despises a nation struggling with a depreciated currency. We ourselves have had this feeling towards the West Indian and South American republics. The people in England also heard a great deal about the convicts who had been transported to America, and that some of these convicts had been employed as school teachers. Historical writers have given the number of these convicts that were sent here at from 10,000 to 25,000, most of them going to Maryland and the middle colonies. Asterisk we may believe that this had no demoralizing effect upon us, and perhaps it had not but English people would naturally think that it had tinged our population, and they would exaggerate the evil effects, as we would ourselves if we should hear of 20,000 convicts dumped into Japan or Cuba, or England itself. In early colonial times piracy had been almost openly practiced, 
and respectable people, even governors of colonies, were interested in its profits. The distinction between privateering, smuggling, piracy, and buccaneering was slight, the step from one to the other easy. The fascinating life of these brethren of the wave cannot be described here, except to say that piracy had been another item in the list of colonial offenses. Protections to pirates were openly sold in New York, where the famous Captain Kidd lived, and handsome presents given to the governor and his daughters. It was a profitable occupation, and pursued as eagerly as modern stock jobbing and speculation. Charleston was equally deep in the business. Lord Bellamont was sent out to New York in 1695, as the result of what we would now call a reform movement. He reported a most licentious trade with pirates, Scotland and Curagoa. The people of New York, he said, grew rich, but the customs, they decrease. Asterisk. Piracy, however, had passed away, and it was only a recollection of disorder, part of the ancient training of the colonists in self-will and love of independence. With regard to the other offenses, bargain and sale legislation, dependent judiciary, or the reforms and remedies of them, both the colonists and England were in a constrained position so long as France kept strengthening her power on the north and pushing round to the westward into the valleys of the Ohio and the Mississippi. Calm, the Swedish botanist, who travelled in America in 1748, reported that the presence of the French in Canada was all that held the colonies in submission to England. He met both Americans and English who prophesied that the colonies would be absolutely independent within thirty or fifty years. 2. The more we consider the conditions at that time, the more it becomes evident that the English-speaking communities in America were not colonies in the modern acceptance of the term. England had never fully reduced them to possession, had never really established her sovereignty among them. If she had encouraged them in the beginning with liberal grants for the sake of persuading them to occupy the country, and after that she was unable to repress their steady and aggressive increase of privileges so long as France hung as a menace in the snowbound north. The lucky colonists were ridden with a loose rein and given their heads until a large section of them began to believe that their heads were their own. The colonists, however, needed the assistance of England's army and navy to withstand France. They detested the thought of becoming colonies of the great Celtic and Roman Catholic power, and they were willing to hold in check their desire for extreme privileges, or anything like independence, until France was removed from the continent. Thus France occupied the peculiar position of encouraging our independent spirit and at the same time checking its extreme development. When the great event of her removal was accomplished, when the superb organizing genius of William Pitt had carried to a successful termination the long war lasting from 1654 to 1763, a totally new condition of affairs arose. Canada being conquered and England in possession of it, the colonies and England suddenly found themselves glaring at each other. Each began to pursue her real purpose more directly. England undertook to establish her sovereignty abolish abuses, or, as she expressed it at that time, to remodel the colonies. The patriotic party among the colonists resisted the remodeling, sought to retain all their old privileges, and even to acquire new ones. 3. 2. Smuggling, rioting, and revolt against control. One of the greatest irregularities in the colonies, the most conspicuous rejection of British authority, was purposely omitted from the previous chapter, because it deserves to be treated separately, and because it was the first irregularity which England attempted to remedy as soon as France was out of the way. There were a number of laws on the English statute books known as the Navigation Laws and the Laws of Trade. They constituted a great protective system of penalties, tariffs, and duties, designed to build up the shipping, the trade, the commerce, and the manufacturing interests of Great Britain and the colonies. They were to protect the colonies from foreign traders and foreign interference, and to unite them closely with the mother country in bonds of wealth and prosperity against all the rest of the world. In the commercial competition in which England was involved with Holland, France, 
and Spain it was thought important to prevent those nations from trading with the British colonies. If England permitted those nations to trade with her colonies, her reason for protecting and governing them was defeated, it would be hardly worthwhile to have colonies. Each nation at that time kept, or tried to keep, its colonial trade exclusively for itself. To accomplish this for England was one of the objects of the trade and navigation laws. Another guiding principle that ran through them was, that the profits of trade should be shared between the colonies and the mother country. The colonies must not monopolize any department of trade. Still another principle was that the colonies should confine themselves chiefly to the production of raw materials and buy their manufactured goods from England. We find the beginning of these laws in the earliest period of the English colonies. The first important product from the colonies was tobacco from Virginia, and the king, who could at that time, without the aid of parliament, impose duties and taxes, put a heavy duty on this tobacco. The Virginians accordingly sent all their tobacco to Holland. This simple instance shows both the cause and the principle of all these navigation laws. If Holland, England's rival in commerce, was to reap all the advantage of Virginia's existence, of what value to England was Virginia? So the king ordered that no tobacco or other product of the colonies should be carried to a foreign port until it had been first landed in England and the duties paid. This regulation was not merely for the revenue from the duties, but for the advantage of English tobacco merchants, and to prevent Holland's trading with Virginia and establishing a connection there. Soon afterwards, in 1651, Cromwell's Parliament took the next step, and an obvious one, by prohibiting the ships of all foreign nations from trading with the colonies. This was part of Cromwell's vigorous and successful foreign policy, one of the methods he employed for building up the power of England. It was intended to keep for England all her colonial trade and encourage her shipbuilders, shipowners, merchants and manufacturers by the same method other nations pursued. Cromwell was of the same dissenting religion as a great many of the American colonists. He favored the colonists, and was generally regarded by them as a great prototype of liberty. But his parliament passed the first navigation law, and the colonists were often reminded of this when, during the revolution, some of them argued so strenuously and violently against those laws. In 1660, when the Commonwealth period of Cromwell closed and monarchy was restored in England, the famous Navigation Act was passed, carrying the protective system still farther. 1. No goods were to be carried from the colonies except in English or colonial built ships of which the master and three fourths of the sailors were English subjects. 2. Foreigners could not be merchants or factors in the colonies. 3. No goods of the growth, production, or manufacture of Africa, Asia, or America could be carried to England in any but English or colonial ships. And such goods must be brought direct from the places where they were usually produced. 4. Oil, whale fins, fish, etc., usually produced or caught by English subjects, must, when brought into England by foreigners, pay double alien customs. 5. The English coasting trade was confined exclusively to English ships. The colonists never objected to these provisions, because most of them favored the colonists as much as they favored England. They built up and encouraged colonial shipping. The provisions relating to the coasting trade we ourselves adopted as soon as we became a nation, and we still confine our coasting trade to our own vessels. We also, in 1816 and afterwards, passed navigation acts somewhat similar in their provisions to these clauses of the English Act which have been cited. There is no question that these and similar protective provisions assisted in building up country. The colonies must not monopolize any department of trade. Still another principle was that the colonies should confine themselves chiefly to the production of raw materials and buy their manufactured goods from England. We find the beginning of these laws in the earliest period of the English colonies. The first important product from the colonies was tobacco from Virginia, and the king, who could at that time, without the aid of parliament, impose duties and taxes, 
put a heavy duty on this tobacco. The Virginians accordingly sent all their tobacco to Holland. This simple instance shows both the cause and the principle of all these navigation laws. If Holland, England's rival in commerce, was to reap all the advantage of Virginia's existence, of what value to England was Virginia? So the king ordered that no tobacco or other product of the colonies should be carried to a foreign port until it had been first landed in England and the duties paid. This regulation was not merely for the revenue from the duties, but for the advantage of English tobacco merchants, and to prevent Holland's trading with Virginia and establishing a connection there. Soon afterwards, in 1651, Cromwell's Parliament took the next step, and an obvious one, by prohibiting the ships of all foreign nations from trading with the colonies. This was part of Cromwell's vigorous and successful foreign policy, one of the methods he employed for building up the power of England. It was intended to keep for England all her colonial trade and encourage her shipbuilders, shipowners, merchants, and manufacturers by the same method other nations pursued. Cromwell was of the same dissenting religion as a great many of the American colonists. He favored the colonists, and was generally regarded by them as a great prototype of liberty. But his parliament passed the first navigation law, and the colonists were often reminded of this when three during the revolution, some of them argued so strenuously and violently against those laws. In 1660, when the Commonwealth period of Cromwell closed and monarchy was restored in England, the famous Navigation Act was passed, carrying the protective system still farther. 1. No goods were to be carried from the colonies except in English or colonial built ships of which the master and three fourths of the sailors were English subjects. 2. Foreigners could not be merchants or factors in the colonies. 3. No goods of the growth, production, or manufacture of Africa, Asia, or America could be carried to England in any but English or colonial ships. And such goods must be brought direct from the places where they were usually produced. 4. Oil, whale fins, fish, etc., usually produced or caught by English subjects, must, when brought into England by foreigners, pay double alien customs. 5. The English coasting trade was confined exclusively to English ships. The colonists never objected to these provisions because most of them favored the colonists as much as they favored England. They built up and encouraged colonial shipping. The provisions relating to the coasting trade we ourselves adopted as soon as we became a nation, and we still confine our coasting trade to our own vessels. We also, in 1816 and afterwards, passed navigation acts somewhat similar in their provisions to these clauses of the English Act which have been cited. There is no question that these and similar protective provisions assisted in building up the greatness, and power of England and the prosperity of the colonies. But there was a clause in the Navigation Act of 1660 which did not please the colonists. It provided that no sugar, tobacco, cotton, indigo, ginger, fustic, or other dye wood should be carried from the colonies to any port on the continent of Europe. Such commodities must be carried only to England or to English colonies. The reason for this provision was, that if the colonists sold their commodities on the continent of Europe they would reap all the profits of the sale and the mother country would get nothing. It seemed fairer that these articles should be taken to England and sold to English merchants, who might then resell at a profit to continental merchants. Thus the profits would be shared by the mother country and the colonies instead of the colonies getting them all. These colonial commodities which could not be carried to continental Europe became known in history as the enumerated articles. Asterisk judged from the point of view of the times, there was nothing harsh or tyrannical in this provision. But the colonists, having ships of their own, very naturally wanted to trade directly with the continent of Europe. They wanted all the profits for themselves. They wanted full control of all the natural advantages of the separate country in which they lived, and in this respect they were not unlike the rest of the world. Accordingly this regulation about trading with the continent of Europe was disobeyed, 
or, if conform to at all, it was to such a slight extent that it was practically a dead letter. The colonists repealed it as though they had had a parliament of their own for the purpose, and while France held Canada they could do so with impunity. In 1663 another act was passed, to parts of which the colonists had no objection. They certainly approved of that clause which prohibited tobacco planting in England, and complained that the weed was still cultivated there in spite of a previous act prohibiting its culture. The object of this act was to favor the Virginia and Maryland tobacco planters. In consideration for sending all their tobacco to England they were to have the exclusive monopoly of tobacco planting. The great object of the trade laws was to bind together by reciprocal favors the colonies and the mother country as a unit against all of England's rivals. But one of the clauses of the Act of 1663 forbade any commodities of Europe to be taken to the colonies except in English built ships and from English ports. Asterisk this was to compel the colonies to buy their manufactured goods and articles of luxury from England. Why should the colonists enrich the merchants of France, Holland, and Spain? Why not enrich the merchants of England? This regulation displeased the colonists and they disobeyed it. They willfully and wickedly carried the enumerated articles to Europe, and on the return voyage they brought back European products in their own ships and without obtaining them at English ports or from English merchants. Many a cargo of manufactured articles from France or Holland, and of wine, oil, and fruit from Portugal, and many a cargo of the famous cheap Holland tea, snugly packed in molasses hogsheads did our vessels run as it was called, to the American coast, to the great damage and underselling of British merchants, and to the great profit of the natural enemies of Great Britain in France, Spain, and Holland. If we could raise from the mud, into which she finally sank, any one of our ancestors curiously rigged ships, with her high turreted stem, her queer little mast out on the bowsprit, her latin sail, and all the contrivances which made her only a slight advance on the old Mayflower which brought such vast cargoes of ancestors and old China to Massachusetts, we would be tolerably safe in labeling her smuggler. Most of our ships were engaged in that profitable business. The desire to share profits with dear old England was not very ardent. In 1676 Edward Randolph was sent out to Massachusetts as an agent to look into its condition. He reported the navigation laws unexecuted and smuggling so universal that commerce was free, and the governor of Massachusetts, he said, would make the world believe they were a free state. He returned in 1680 as collector of customs, and tried to enforce the navigation laws. The notice of his appointment was torn down, and the assembly created a custom office of its own so as to supersede him and administer the navigation laws in the Massachusetts manner. When he attempted to seize vessels he was overwhelmed with lawsuits. The people were against him, and he returned to England disgusted. Asterisk. There was an Act of 1696 requiring the trade between England and the colonies to be carried in English or colonial built ships, but to this the colonists of course had no objection. In 1733 another trade act was passed, which levied duties on spirits, sugar, and molasses imported to the colonies from any of the French or Spanish West Indies. This, as the preamble of the act explained, was to protect the English sugar islands from competition with the French and Spanish sugar islands, as well as to give the mother country a share in this trade. But the colonists found the trade so profitable that they preferred to have it for themselves without any tax or duties. They carried many of their products to the French and Spanish islands, making a good exchange for the spirits and sugar, and bringing back gold and silver money which they needed in buying supplies from England and in decreasing the amount of paper money they were obliged to issue. The Act of 1733, levying duties on this trade, was a subject of much discussion during the early stages of the revolution, and was usually spoken of as the Old Molasses Act, to distinguish it from a sort of supplement to it passed in 1764, called the Sugar Act. Our people made a dead letter of it, as they did of all the others that interfered with their purposes.
it is hardly worthwhile to discuss what has sometimes been called the excessive restraint or tyranny of these trade laws, because the American colonists promptly disposed of any element of severity there was in them, by disobeying them. These laws were generally regarded by Adam Smith, and other political writers as much less restrictive than similar laws of other countries. As to risk the trade of all the Spanish colonies was confined by law to Spain, the trade of the Brazils to Portugal, the trade of Martinico and other French colonies to France, the trade of Curagoa and Suriname to Holland. There was only one exception, and that was in the trade of Street Eustatius, which Holland allowed to be free to all the world and through that island a large part of the American smuggling was conducted. This system, long since outworn and abandoned, was generally believed to be particularly fair and liberal, because it was mutual, because, while the colonies were compelled to trade exclusively with the mother country, the mother country, besides protecting them with her army and fleet, was compelled to trade with the colonies. The British merchants were as closely bound to buy their raw material only from the colonies as the colonies were bound to buy manufactured goods only from the British merchants. The people of Great Britain, as we have seen, were not allowed to raise tobacco or buy it anywhere except in Maryland and Virginia. The colonists were paid bounties on all the naval stores, hemp, flax, and lumber, which they produced and the large sums thus paid to them were considered as fully offsetting any inconveniences they might suffer from restrictions on their trade. South Carolina had a bounty on indigo, and could carry her ice to all European ports south of Cape Inista. The laws which prohibited the colonies from importing directly from Europe were mitigated by a system of drawbacks on the duties. Their great staples of grain, lumber, salt provisions, fish, sugar and rum they were allowed to carry to any part of the world, provided they took them in their own or in British built ships of which the owners and three-fourths of the crew were British subjects. The British West India colonies were compelled to buy their provisions and lumber from the American continental colonies. That colonies which had cost such a vast and long continued expenditure of blood and treasure should be closely bound to the mother country in trade should take part in a system which would at the same time enrich the mother country and themselves, seemed to most Europeans natural and right. The Americans were prohibited from manufacturing. They could mine ore and turn it into iron, but they were not allowed to manufacture the iron into steel, tools, or weapons. They were prohibited also from cloth manufacturing and similar industries. But they paid little or no attention to these laws. They were not very strongly drawn to domestic manufacturing at that time, because they saw their greatest field of profit on the ocean, in trade, in whaling, and in the fisheries of the Grand Banks. But to such moderate manufacturing as their hearts inclined they turned openly and without even a wink at the royal governor's dot asterisk. In theory and by law a colony must share with England the profits its own ships might earn, it was prohibited from making nails hatchets, and guns out of the iron dug from its own soil, or making coats out of the wool of its own sheep, or hats from the fur of the beaver that lived on its streams, a colonist could not give an orange to his sick friend unless that orange had made the voyage from Portugal by touching at an English port and passing through the hands of an English merchant. But none of these regulations could be enforced, or at best were only partially enforced. If England had had sufficient authority and power to enforce them from the beginning, we might have been a milder people, like the Canadians, with no revolution, with less inventive genius, and without our self-reliant, aggressive, or, as some would call them, disorderly qualities. The smuggling we indulged in so universally was not a daring occupation. A vessel would enter her cargo as salt or ballast, or would pay duty on part give hush money or some goods to the customs officials, and run the rest, asterisk and the officials seem to have been easy to deal with in this way. They no doubt felt that their wages were so low that they would starve to death if not assisted by kind captains and merchants. Their presents were not always money. They were given parts of the cargo, often choice boxes of wines and fruits from Spain and the Mediterranean, so beautiful and luscious that it seemed impossible they could contaminate. 
the moral aspect of the situation was not allowed to pass unchallenged. We find a pamphlet asterisk written, as is supposed, by John Drinker, of Philadelphia, implying that nearly all merchants were habitual custom house perjurers, or procured others to commit perjury, and that such a system was ruining the morals of the country. In our time a reform club would have been organized to deal with the question. In spite of the long series of trade and navigation laws, filling so many pages of her statute books, the revenue received from us by England was only £1,000 or £2,000 per year and it cost £7,000 or £8,000 to collect it. In the French war it was discovered that the New England merchants were regularly supplying the French fleets and garrisons with provisions under flags of truce to exchange prisoners. In the hope of preventing such scandals, and of repressing smuggling, the practice of issuing writs of assistance, as they were called, was adopted by the British officials in America. These writs empowered an officer to search generally for smuggled goods, without specifying under oath a particular house or particular goods. Such writs were allowable under English law, but contrary to the principle adopted by Americans that general writs authorizing an officer to go into any house he pleased should never be issued. A test case was made of them in Massachusetts and James Otis delivered against them a most famous argument, which in a rhetorical and exaggerated sense was described by John Adams as the birth of the American Revolution. The colonies did pretty much as they pleased for over a hundred years. Their ships sailed in every sea, making of the colonists staring, hardy sailors, and giving them a contempt for the acts of parliament which they had violated for generations. They were men who won careers from rugged nature, who therefore believed in themselves, who were conceited, pushing, lanky, gaunt, unpleasant, and ludicrous in English eyes, but the same men whom the eloquent Irishman, Burke, delighted to describe, as pursuing the whales among the tumbling mountains of Arctic ice, or following the same dangerous game beneath the frozen serpent of the south. What else had the colonists but their ships and their farms? Those were their two principal occupations. They ploughed either the sea or the land, and are not those the rough pursuits of angular, independent, vigorous, self-willed men, dexterous with tools and weapons, but very awkward in manners. Viewed from this standpoint, and setting aside for the moment that part of the population which was aristocratic, loyal, or lived on government salaries, the colonies were merely a long straggling line of settlements, scarcely 200 miles wide, containing about 2 million white men and 800,000 slaves, extending along the sea coast from Maine to Georgia, comma, fishermen, farmers, sailors, and traders. Their ships seemed everything to them, because their ships seemed to give a large part of the value to their farms. When, therefore, the British government, after the French war was over, resolved on more regular and systematic control, when revenue cutters became more numerous, when the customs officials were stiffened for their duty and struck at what the colonists called free trade, and what in England was called the infamous crime of smuggling, it seemed to many of the colonists a terrible thing. The blow that irritated them most of all was struck at their trade with the French and Spanish West Indies, the trade which, as we have seen, had been prohibited by the old Molasses Act of 1734. They had evaded it for thirty years. But now in this famous year 1764, with France out of the way, and the reorganization of the colonies resolved upon, instructions were sent to men of war and revenue cutters to enforce the laws against the Spanish and French trade, and a new navigation act was passed which the colonists usually spoke of as the Sugar Act. It reduced by one half the duties which had been imposed on sugar and molasses by the old Molasses Act of 1734. This reduction, like so many other parts of the system, was intended as a favor to the colonists and a compensation for restrictions in other matters. But as the colonists, by wholesale smuggling, had been bringing in sugar and molasses free, they did not appreciate this favor of half duties which were to be actually enforced. The Act also imposed duties on coffee, pimento, French and East India goods, 
and wines from Madeira and the Azores which hitherto had been free. It also added iron and lumber to the enumerated articles which could be exported only to England, and it reinforced the powers of the Admiralty Courts which could try the smuggling and law-breaking colonists without a jury. This Sugar Act of 1764 required the duties to be paid in specie into the Treasury in London, and this the colonial merchants bitterly complained of, because it would drain them of specie and force them to pay per money acts to supply a currency in place of the specie, and at the same time Parliament passed another act to further restrain the paper currency of the colonies. England was evidently very much in earnest. From the English point of view the Old Molasses Act and the Sugar Act were necessary to protect the English Sugar Islands from French and Spanish competition, were, in fact, part of the great system of protection for all parts of the empire, the system of give and take, by which inconveniences suffered by one locality for the sake of another were compensated by bounties or special privileges in some other department of trade. The attempt to enforce the Sugar Act and the old trade laws aroused much indignation among a large number of the colonists. Loyalists afterwards said that the indignation was confined to the smuggling merchants and some radical and rabid dissenters. The indignant ones, however, made themselves very conspicuous, for they combined to protect and conceal smuggling, and at times they broke out into mob violence and outrage which made Englishmen stare. When the officials occasionally succeeded in seizing a smuggled cargo it was apt to be rescued by violence which was actual warfare, but into which the perpetrators entered not only without hesitation, but with zeal, energy, and righteous indignation, as if they were performing a public duty and a perfectly lawful act. The English regarded these proceedings as a riotous and unlawful rebellion against legitimate authority. The colonists were being driven crazy, it was reported, by certain books about the rights of man, books written by men called Berlamaqui, Bicaria, Montesquieu, Grotius, and Puffendorf, which told them that all men were politically equal and entitled to self-government, and the Englishman, John Locke, who was exiled and driven from Great Britain, had written a mad book to the same effect. The customs regulations became more elaborate. A board of commissioners of customs was created in 1767, for enforcing the revenue laws and the laws of trade and navigation, and instituting a general reform in America. In the fleet on the American coast, each captain had to take the custom house oaths, and be commissioned as a custom house official to assist in the good work. The admiral of the fleet became, in effect, the head of a corps of revenue officers, and, to stimulate the zeal of his officers, they were to receive large rewards from all forfeited property. Some of the captains even went so far as to buy on their own account small vessels, which they sent, disguised as coasters, into the bays and shoal waters to collect evidence and make seizures. Asterisk. But a people who had been left so long to themselves were not easy to bring under the discipline of a more methodical government. The new commissioners of customs sent out more than twenty fresh cutters and armed vessels to cruise for smugglers. But they rarely made a seizure, and the colonists laughed in their bucolic way, and said that it was like burning a barn to roast an egg. Asterisk. It had been the practice in America ever since 1670 to try all smuggling and revenue cases in the Admiralty Courts, which acted without a jury because it was found that no American jury would convict a smuggler. The acts which were now passed to improve administration in the colonies, and even the Stamp Act, provided that their provisions should be enforced in Admiralty. Vice Admiralty courts were established and various regulations were made to increase their efficiency and encourage the judges. This seemed entirely justifiable to the ministry because penalties under the revenue laws had long been recoverable in admiralty, and in England stamp duties were recoverable before two justices of the peace without a jury. Asterisk. To many of the colonists it seemed as if these courts without juries would soon extend their power from their proper sphere of the seaports into the body of the country, as it was called. They raised the alarm that Britain was depriving her colonies of the right of trial by jury that she intended to cut off trial by jury more and more, 
and in the Declaration of Independence this is enumerated as one of the reasons for breaking up the empire. It is interesting to remember in this connection that by Act of Parliament the British government can at any time withdraw trial by jury from Ireland, and in the year 1902 withdrew it by proclamation in nine Irish counties. Great Britain began the conquest and pacification of Ireland 700 years ago, but the Irish are not yet submissive and British sovereignty is not yet established. The colonists also complained because the officers of the Admiralty Courts were paid out of the proceeds of fines, of which the informers got half. In some instances the governors of provinces were rewarded out of the fines and forfeitures, for the sake of encouraging them to greater diligence in executing the laws. To Englishmen who reflected on the smuggling and piracy, the thousands of convicts transported to the colonies, the thousands of fierce Red Indians by whom the colonists must be influenced, and the million black slaves driven with whips, the withholding from such people of the right of trial by jury, or even of the right of self-government, seemed a small matter. At the close of that famous year 1764 the Ministry and Parliament were inclined to congratulate themselves on having done a good deal towards remedying the disorders in America. At the opening of the next session of Parliament, in 1765, the King reminded them that the colonial question was simply obedience to the laws and respect for the legislative authority of the Kingdom, and Parliament, in reply, declared that they intended to proceed with that temper and firmness which will best conciliate and ensure due submission to the laws and reverence for the legislative authority of Great Britain. We find the pamphleteers in England recommending stronger measures. These rascals, they said, will forever smuggle and complain, complain and smuggle, and call every restraint a badge of slavery. Their long stretch of 1500 miles of sea coast need be no protection to them. The 2000 miles of sea coast of Great Britain and Ireland does not prevent unlawful traders from meeting with the punishment they deserve. Therefore double the number of custom houses and of sloops of war and pursue every vigorous measure to compel these lawless Americans to learn that while they live in society they must submit to law. The new Board of Commissioners of Customs had made its headquarters in Boston, a significant event, followed by a long train of the most important historical circumstances. Boston seemed to be the worst place in America. It had always been so. It needed curbing. Massachusetts was the only colony which had persistently, from her foundation, shown a disloyal spirit to the English government and the English church. Her people seemed to be naturally riotous. When the sloop Liberty was seized for violating the laws of trade the Patriot Party of Boston rescued her smuggled cargo and smashed the windows of the houses in which lived the collector, controller, and inspector of customs and these unfortunate gentlemen narrowly escaped with their lives. The mob dragged the collector's boat through the town and burnt it on the common. The customs officials had to take refuge on the British men of war Omni. The proceedings to stop smuggling were carried on from 1764 for a period of eight or ten years, and were contemporaneous with other events relating to the Stamp Act and other taxing laws which are more conspicuous in our histories. It is somewhat difficult to tell how far the repression of smuggling was successful, because the colonists laughed at the revenue cutters and men of war as failures, and at the same time complained that they were being ruined by the stoppage of their old free trade. It seems to be true that the naval and customs officers made very few seizures, but at the same time the fear of seizure and the presence of the men of war may at first have stopped a great deal of the smuggling. The island of Jamaica complained of much loss. Exactly what were the losses among ourselves cannot now be known. It seems that the smuggling soon got underway again, and was as bad as ever. Our people also formed associations pledging the members to cease importing manufactured goods from England, to cease wearing English clothing, and to violate the act against manufacturing by at once starting manufacturing of all kinds among themselves. Everyone appeared in homespun. The promptness with which all this was done is striking. One might suppose that England was already a foreign country. 
Before that year 1764 was closed the consumption of British merchandise had diminished by thousands of pounds. When the year 1774 was reached the mobs and tar and feather parties had driven so many British officials from office that all attempts to check smuggling and enforce the trade laws were necessarily abandoned until the army could restore authority. Those old laws can still be read in their places in the English statutes at large, and, in truth, those clauses of them which the colonists disliked were from the beginning almost as dead as they are now. 3. Parliament passes a stamp tax and repeals IT. At the same time that the British government started to put down smuggling in 1764 it also prepared a new system of taxation for the colonies as part of the remodeling which seemed to be necessary. In fact, the Sugar Act, passed on March 10 of that year, was a taxing act, and declared in its preamble that it was intended to raise a revenue from the colonies to defray the expenses of protecting and governing them. This taxation of the colonies was not a new idea. They had always been taxed, especially during the wars with France. There was a regular system by which the British Secretary of State made a requisition on the colonies through the colonial governors, stating the quota of money or supplies required from each. Each colonial assembly thereupon began a long wrangle with its governor, and usually ended by voting the supply or part of it, which was collected from the people by taxation. It was a voluntary system, for sometimes a colony would grant no supply at all. It was, in short, the old feudal aid system, the system in which all taxation in England had originated. Taxation was originally not a self-acting system of compulsion. Taxes were gifts, grants, or aids, which the people, or their feudal lords, or parliament as representing the people, granted to the king at irregular intervals to assist the government in wars or other undertakings, or, as Mr. Stubbs puts it, the taxpayers made a voluntary offering to relieve the wants of the ruler asterisk. Constitutional History of England, edition of 1875, volume I. p. 577. This voluntary system had long since ceased in England, and the modern, annual, self-acting system prevailed both there and also in the local taxation of the colonies. The taxation proposed in 1764 was taxation by the modern system. It was not a new or sudden thought. It had been suggested in 1713 when Harley was at the head of the treasury, and again at the opening of the Seven Years' War. It had also been advocated in the early part of the century by Governor Keith, of Pennsylvania, who was also one of those who foresaw the leaning of some of the colonists towards independence, and thought that such a spirit should be nipped in the bud. Colonial taxation had for a long time been an obvious measure, and might have been tried much sooner if France had not been in Canada. Looked at in the light of all the circumstances it was not necessarily an evil or tyrannical measure. If we once admit that the colonial status is not an improper one, and that it is no infringement of natural or political rights for a nation to have dependencies or subject peoples, taxing them in a moderate and fair way seems to follow as a matter of course. England still levies indirect taxes on India and the Crown colonies, and occasionally a charge similar to a direct tax, as in the case of colonial lighthouses, asterisk. England was generally believed to be bankrupt groaning under the vast debt of over £148 million, which had been heaped up by the war she had just waged to save the colonies from the clutches of France. It was a heavy debt for a country of barely 8 million people. The colonies had no taxes, except the very light ones which they levied on themselves by their own legislative assemblies. But the people in England suffered under very heavy and burdensome taxes on all sorts of articles including the wheels on their wagons, the panes of glass in their houses, and other things which involved prying and irritating investigations. All this was to help pay for that great war, and why should not the colonies be called upon for their share? While the war was being carried on they had been taxed in the old way, and, on requisition from the home government, had voted in their legislative assemblies supplies of money, men, and provisions. Now that peace was declared, why should they not help to pay the war debt, by the modern, 
more orderly, and regular system. The colonists were very much attached to the old voluntary system. They took the greatest delight in it, for whenever a governor announced that he had been instructed to obtain a certain quota, the legislature had a chance to worry him and strike a bargain for his consent to some of their favorite measures. But the delays caused by this wrangling were very exasperating to generals in the field during the French War, and also to the home government. Besides this uncertainty and delay, it seemed to Englishmen that the voluntary system was very unequal and unfair. Some colonies, like Pennsylvania and Massachusetts, gave large supplies, and others, like New Jersey, Maryland, or Georgia, gave little or none at all, and this raised jealousies, bickerings, and quarrels. But the colonists, knowing that in the long run they always got the better of the governors, would not admit the validity of any such objections. When modern taxation was suggested, they would blandly inquire what could be better than the old voluntary system. They would dilate on their loyalty and affection for the crown, and the ideal beauty of those gifts to dear mother England which they voluntarily and without even the suggestion of force had always out of the abundance of their overflowing devotion supplied. Did you not yourselves, they would say, think that in the last war we had been too complying and too generous in our devotion to the king, and did you not hand us back 133,333 pounds sixes? 8d, which you said we had paid over and above our share of the expense? Let the king frankly tell us his necessities, and we will in the future, as in the past, of our own volition, assist him. That refunding of the £133,000 proved to be somewhat like the repealing of the stamp tax, a generosity of which the government afterwards repented. But it is easy to see how public men of both parties in England, accustomed to methodical methods in regular, orderly taxation, would naturally conclude that there should be a surer and more orderly way of raising money or supplies from the colonies. The refunding of the £133,000 was in their eyes an argument against the old method, because the greater part of that sum had been returned only to Massachusetts and one or two other provinces which had given supplies in an absurd excess over all the others. It was ridiculous for a great nation to have to conduct its finances by this sort of refunding. It would be better to have a simple self-acting method like the stamp tax that would bear equally on all. Accordingly, on the 10th day of March, 1764, that famous year of colonial reorganization and reform, and the same day on which the Sugar Act and the law for the further restraint of paper money in the colonies were passed, Mr. Grenville, Chancellor of the Exchequer, announced in Parliament the plan of a stamp tax for the colonies. He introduced and secured the passage of some resolutions on the right, equity and policy of colonial taxation which were intended to raise the whole question and have it discussed for a year before any particular measure was offered. The ministry went about this measure with that display of considerate care and tenderness which England has so often shown to dependencies, a tenderness very much admired by some, but very exasperating to a people who are fond of freedom. Mr. Grenville not only wanted the subject discussed for a year in England before final action was taken, but he wanted the colonists to discuss it and offer suggestions, or propose some better plan of taxation, or one that would be more agreeable to them. He was lavishly candid in saying that the Sugar Act just passed levied an external tax, the validity of which the colonists admitted, but the stamp tax might be an internal tax the validity of which might be denied in America, and he wished that question fully discussed. He was also excessively liberal in hinting to the colonial agents in London that now was the opportunity for the colonies, by voluntarily agreeing to the stamp tax, or an equivalent, to establish a precedent for being consulted before any tax was imposed upon them by Parliament. He afterwards made a great point of selecting as stamp officials in America only such persons as were natives of the country. The Patriotic Party in America was far too shrewd to accept the Stamp Act or offer an equivalent. They sent back some petitions and remonstrances against it, but for the most part were quite sullen. A year went by. 
the proposed tax was drafted into the form of a law, passed with scarcely any debate, and approved by the king, March 22, 1765. It provided a stamp tax on newspapers and all legal and business documents, and was full of tiresome, wordy details. It was the sort of tax which we levied on ourselves during the Civil War and again at the time of the war with Spain. It is unquestionably the fairest, most equally distributed, and easiest to collect of all forms of taxes. Scarcely anyone in England seems to have had any doubt as to the right of Parliament to levy such a tax, an internal one, so called, on the colonies. But the colonists who had defied navigation laws and ruled themselves almost independently for over a hundred years, could not accept such a tax. News of the passage of the Act seems to have reached this country in May. Virginia immediately led the way in passing resolutions of protest, and it was in speaking on these resolutions that Patrick Henry made his famous treasonable speech, Caesar had his Brutus, Charles I, his Cromwell, and George III, may profit by their example. The assemblies of the other colonies quickly followed with similar resolutions. These resolutions, taken as a whole, protest against the extension of the power of the Admiralty Courts as well as against the Stamp Act. They all argue the question somewhat, and base themselves on the position that Parliament had never before taxed the colonies in internal matters, and that internal taxation was therefore the exclusive province of the colonial legislatures. They admit that Parliament can tax them externally, or, as they put it, regulate their commerce by levying duties on it, and regulate them, as in fact it always had done, in all internal matters, except this one of internal taxes. This position was very weak, because it admitted the right to regulate all their internal affairs except one, and the distinction it raised between external and internal taxes was altogether absurd. There was no real or substantial difference between external and internal taxes, between taxes levied at a seaport and taxes levied throughout the country. The colonists afterwards saw this weakness and changed their ground. But this supposed distinction between external and internal taxes was good enough to begin with, and the revolution, during the seventeen years of its active progress, was largely a question of the evolution of opinion. During that summer of 1765, while the assemblies of the different colonies were passing resolutions of protest, the mobs of the Patriot Party were protesting in another way. It certainly amazed Englishmen to read that the mob in Boston, not content with hanging in effigy the proposed stamp distributors, leveled the office of one of them to the ground and smashed the windows and furniture of his private house, that they destroyed the papers and records of the Court of Admiralty, sacked the house of the Controller of Customs, and drank themselves drunk with his wines, and, finally, actually proceeded to the house of Lieutenant Governor Hutchinson, who was compelled to flee to save his life. They completely gutted his house, stamped upon the chairs and mahogany tables until they were wrecked, smashed the large, gilt-framed pictures, and tore up all the fruit trees in his garden. Governor Hutchinson was a native of the province, was its historian, and with his library perished many invaluable historical manuscripts which he had been thirty years collecting. The mob cut open the beds and let the feathers out, which they scattered with his clothes, linen, smashed furniture, and pictures in the street. 4. That this outrage had been incited the day before by the preaching of the Reverend Dr. Mayhew, a Puritan divine, did not lessen its atrocity in the eyes of Englishmen. He had held forth on the text, I would they were even cut off which trouble you and the mob came very near obeying his instructions literally. A great many respectable citizens were shocked, or appeared to be shocked, at this violence and excess. They held town meetings of abhorrence, a guard was organized to prevent such outrages in the future, and rewards were offered for rioters. But it is quite significant that, although the rioters were well known, as the historians assure us, no one was punished. Two or three were arrested, but were rescued by their friends, and it was found impossible to proceed against them. It is not necessary to describe in detail the action of mobs in the other colonies. 
they were somewhat less violent than in Massachusetts, and their proceedings were usually directed to compelling the stamp distributors to resign their office. Such successful, widespread, and thorough rioting we have scarcely ever seen in our time. It strengthened the very natural feeling in England that British sovereignty and order must at all hazards be established in America. On the side of the colonists it may be observed that this widespread rioting and its violence disclose a strong party already far separated from England. In the autumn a respectable body of colonists met in New York to deal with the Stamp Act question. This meeting, which has ever since been known as the Stamp Act Congress, had been suggested by the Massachusetts Assembly. Neither Virginia, South Carolina, nor Georgia were represented in it, which may be incidentally noticed as tending to show that the rebel or patriot movement was not very strong in those communities, or their governors would not have been able to prevent delegates going to New York. The Stamp Act Congress passed resolutions of protest and sent a petition to the King and another to Parliament. The arguments in these documents are very much the same as those used in the previous remonstrances. They, of course, took the precaution of expressing great loyalty to Great Britain and admiration for the mighty British Empire, to which, they said, it was a great happiness to belong. They protested against the extension of the power of admiralty courts, and declared that they had the same rights as Englishmen born within the realm. But the groundwork of their position was that Parliament could not tax them internally unless they were represented in that body, from the nature of things, they could never be represented, and therefore Parliament could never tax them. It is to be observed that they did not ask for representation in Parliament. They declared it to be impossible, and Englishmen were quick to notice and comment on this. Grenville, in his speech against the repeal of the Stamp Act, called forcible attention to it, and reminded his hearers of its significance. It was the beginning of the rejection of all authority of Parliament. The colonists never changed their ground on this point. They always insisted that the distance across the ocean rendered representation impossible. It is quite obvious that the distance did not render representation impossible, it merely made it somewhat inconvenient. Each colony maintained one or more agents in London to look after its affairs and represented at the executive departments of the government, and these agents sometimes appeared before Parliament as witnesses. Each colony could in a similar way have maintained representatives in Parliament. Governor Bernard, of Massachusetts, tells us, in his select letters, that at first the colonists were willing to be represented in Parliament and made their argument in the alternative that if they were to be taxed internally they must be represented, but fearing that representation might be allowed them, and that they would be irretrievably bound by any measure passed by Parliament, they quickly shifted to the position that representation was impossible, and therefore internal taxation constitutionally impossible. The documents of the colonists do not express a willingness to be represented, although there are expressions used from which such a willingness might possibly be inferred. They may, however, have expressed such willingness in conversation, but after the time of the Stamp Act Congress all their published statements cling tightly to the impossibility of representation. This was regarded by many as a sure sign of the determination of the rebel party to break from England in the end, and an evidence of the insincerity of their professions of loyalty. Raynal, the French writer, in his philosophical and political history of the European settlements in America, advised them never to yield on this impossibility of representation, for if once they were represented, the rest of Parliament could easily outvote them, their liberties would be gone, and their fetters permanently forged upon them. 5. The Stamp Act Congress admitted that the colonists owed allegiance to the British Crown, and they also said that they owed all due subordination to that august body, the Parliament of Great Britain. Parliament, therefore, had full authority over them, could tax their commerce by duties at the seaports, and levy this duty on exports as well as on imports, comma, do everything, in short, except tax them internally. But if the principle no taxation without representation were sound English constitutional law, why did the colonists admit that they could be taxed at their seaports without representation? A tax levied by Parliament on sugar, molasses, 
or other articles coming into the colonial seaports was paid by all the people of the province in the enhanced price of the goods. The duties on French and Spanish products, which had to be paid in specie, and drained specie out of the country, were a so-called external tax, but they drained specie out of the interior of the country as well as from the seaports. It was, as Lord Mansfield said, like a pebble thrown into a pond, comma, the circles from the splash would extend over the whole pond. In fact, in the very nature of things there could be no tax that could properly be called an external one. Every tax was an internal tax, because any tax that could be conceived of had to be levied on people or properly within the boundaries of the country. When once the tax gatherer had entered the boundary, or taken private property for taxes just inside the boundary, at a seaport, it was as much internal taxation as though he were in the central town of the community. What a pother, said an Irish member of parliament, whether money is to be taken out of their coat pocket or out of their waistcoat pocket. The colonists tried to keep up the distinction by saying that the duties on imports and exports were merely to regulate the commerce of the empire, the regulation of the commerce was the main object, and the duties were merely incidental. The sea is yours said Franklin, in his examination before Parliament, you maintain by your fleets the safety of navigation in it, and keep it clear of pirates, you may have, therefore, a natural and equitable right to some toll or duty on merchandise carried through that part of your dominions, towards defraying the expense you are at in ships to maintain the safety of that carriage. Franklin, however, had not much faith in the distinction for when closely questioned he foretold that the colonists would change their ground, and deny all authority of parliament, external as well as internal. When his cross-examiners pressed him with the absurdity of the distinction, and asked why the colonists should not also deny the right of external taxes, he replied. They never have hitherto. Many arguments have been lately used here to show them that there is no difference and that if you have no right to tax them internally, you have no right to tax them externally or make any other law to bind them. At present they do not reason so, but in time they may possibly be convinced by these arguments. The principle of no taxation without representation, which the Stamp Act Congress declined to use against taxes levied at seaports, but cited against other taxes, had always been familiar to the colonists. It had been appealed to on several occasions in the past hundred and fifty years, notably in Virginia and Massachusetts, against acts of the British government. Its fairness was obvious to all who believed in representative government and republicanism, but not at all obvious to those who rejected those methods. It was the outgrowth of the Reformation doctrines of the natural rights of man, of which we shall have much to say hereafter. It was an application of the principle set forth in so many modern American documents, that no government can be just which does not rest on the consent of the governed. The consent of the governed doctrine was often expressed by the phrase, no laws can be made or abrogated without the consent of the people or their representatives. Therefore taxing laws, like all other laws, must be by consent. The colonists said that no taxation without representation was part of the British constitution, one of the inalienable rights of Englishmen or Anglo-Saxons, as we would now put it. But so many things that particular persons want, or admire, are described in this way that we must be careful how we accept such statements. The British constitution is a very fluid, fluctuating body, made up of customs, decisions of courts, acts of parliament, tacit understandings, or whatever the omnipotent parliament shall decide. There have always been two parties in England, at times diametrically opposed to each other, so far apart in opinions that they might be separate nationalities or races, and yet each one insisting that its particular views are the true constitution. The English who came out to America were largely of one of these parties, which has been successively called Roundhead, Whig, or liberal. They have at times claimed as part of the British constitution doctrines which were advocated by liberals in England, and which Americans also thought ought to be part of the British constitution, but which were never fully accepted or adopted. The Quakers, Baptists, 
and others at one time declared that religious liberty was part of the British constitution, meaning that it ought to be a part, and that they would make it a part of the constitution if they could. But it was not a part, because the very reverse had been practiced for several hundred years, and had driven thousands of these people to America, and it never became a part of the constitution until made so by act of parliament when William of Orange ascended the throne after the revolution of 1688. No taxation without representation was never a part of the British constitution, and is not a part of it even now. It could not be adopted without at the same time accepting the doctrine of government by consent, and that doctrine no nation with colonies could adopt, because it is a flat denial of the lawfulness of the colonial relation. Asterisk. No taxation without representation had often been advocated in England by liberals of different sorts, Puritans, Roundheads, and Whigs, who felt that they stood in need of it. The colonists thought that they had found two or three instances in which Parliament had partially recognized this doctrine. There were several old divisions of England, like the County Palatine of Chester, or the Principality of Wales, which in feudal times had been semi-independent. They were for a long time not taxed by Parliament, and when at last Parliament determined to tax them they were, the colonists said, given representation. The colonists clung to these instances and kept repeating them in all their pamphlets, but the instances were denied by some writers, and were certainly without avail in convincing Parliament and the vast majority of Englishmen. Asterisk. Englishmen easily replied that these one or two instances, even supposing them to be as the colonists stated, were accidental and amounted to nothing in the face of the long continued practice and custom to the contrary. In the year 1765 scarcely any of the great towns in England had representatives in Parliament and yet they were taxed. London, Birmingham, Manchester, Liverpool, Leeds, and Halifax paid their taxes every year, and sent not a single member to Parliament. In fact, out of the 8 million people in England there were not above 300,000 represented. 6. Parliament was made up largely of rotten boroughs or pocket boroughs in the control of individuals or noblemen. Old Sarum had not a single inhabitant, and yet sent two members to Parliament. Representative government as the colonists understood and practiced it in their local assemblies, or as we now understand it, had at that time no existence in England. All this was wrong and a bad system, as we would say in America, but that is not the question. Parliament had slowly grown into that state from the old feudal customs, and that growth or that condition was the British constitution of that day. There were a few, a very few, men in England who wanted it changed and the principle of no taxation without representation adopted. Lord Camden argued to this effect during the Stamp Act debates in a most interesting speech in the House of Lords. Lord Mansfield, a still greater legal luminary, argued on the opposite side. These two speeches are well worth reading by anyone who is interested in the details of the subject. Mansfield's side was, of course, successful. When the British Parliament announced, by the Declaratory Act of 1766, that they had the constitutional right to tax the colonies as they pleased, externally or internally, up or down, or in any other way, they were undoubtedly acting in accordance with the long settled constitutional custom, and that decision has never been reversed. Asterisk. The sum of the matter in regard to no taxation without representation is, that America, having been settled by the liberal, radical, and in most instances minority element of English politics, accepted, and England, being usually under the influence of the Tory element, rejected this much discussed doctrine. We went our separate ways. Although we were of the same race as the people of England, the differences between us were as far reaching and radical as though we were a totally different people, and the gulf was being steadily widened. In arguing with the colonists, an Englishman would sometimes leave the firm ground of pure constitutional right, and say, You are already represented in Parliament more amply and fully represented than you could be in one of your own and better protected than if you sent your own people to the parliament that sits in London.
There are always members there who take a special interest in you and protect all the rights to which you are entitled. William Pitt and Lord Camden, as well as Fox, Barr, Conway, Pownall, Dowd Swill, and Edmund Burke, fight your battles for you with an eloquence far beyond any your ablest men possess, and it was by their defense of you that the Stamp Act and the Painty Paper, and Glass Act were repealed. There was a certain amount of force in this argument, especially to a mind that was inclined to loyalism. But the Patriotic Party replied that they wanted the protection of ascertained and fixed rights, so that they would not need the condescending protection of these so-called great men in Parliament who would not live forever or who might change their opinions. The Englishman would then argue that the colonists were virtually represented in Parliament just as the vast majority of people in England were virtually represented. All the members of Parliament, although elected by an insignificant fraction of the people, were charged with the duty of legislating for those unrepresented, and caring for their interests, and had always done so. The seven million people who had no direct representation were nevertheless virtually represented by all the members of Parliament, and in the same way the colonists were virtually represented. This was the only sort of representation which the majority of Englishmen recognized or understood, and they maintained it down into our own time. The American systematic representation by small districts, giving an approximately equal and thorough representation, was not only unrecognized but regarded as a mere radical and dangerous stream of philosophers and visionaries. The House of Lords represented all the nobility, the House of Commons represented all the commoners, and the colonists as commoners were therefore fully represented. To this virtual representation the colonists had a very strong reply, because, as they pointed out, the unrepresented people in England were more or less intimately associated with the represented people, and the laws had to be the same for all. Those members of Parliament who laid taxes on unrepresented Leeds and Manchester taxed themselves and their constituents at the same time. But when they taxed America they could and did lay a tax entirely different from those they put on themselves and their constituents. Yes, the Englishman would reply, and the difference has been that they put far lighter taxes on you than they place on themselves. England is overwhelmed with taxes on wagons, furniture, and every article a man can have, even to the panes of glass in his house. They propose nothing of that sort for you. They want from you only the lightest and most trifling taxes. The people of England pay 25 shillings per head in taxes. They ask from you only sixpence per head, although they have spent in support of your government and protection since 1690, without counting the cost of the war with France. 43,697,142 pounds, of which over 1,500,000 pounds was paid in bounties on your products. Richard Bland, of Virginia, published an interesting argument. It is true, he said, that nearly nine tenths of the people in England are not represented. But how has that happened? By despotism and the alternation of the original laws of England. Among the old Anglo-Saxons, before the Normans came in, everything was equal and all the people were represented. If nine-tenths are now deprived of their rights, it is by a departure from the original Saxon purity, and that purity should be restored. Let us restore it in America, or rather keep it restored, for we have already restored it here, instead of imitating the oppression which has destroyed it in England. The loyalists wanted the colonies to be directly represented in Parliament, and some of them argued that the only fair and proper way by which they could be represented would be by giving them representatives in proportion to their population, revenue, and growing power. As these were increasing every year, the representation would continually have to be enlarged, and, as America was greater in its size and resources than England, the colonies would before long have more representatives in Parliament than the British Isles, and the seat of power of the British Empire would of necessity be removed to America. 7. The object of this argument was to try to settle all disputes by a closer union with the mother country instead of drawing away from her. They tried to show the patriots that in the end America would reap the principal advantage of a closer union. 
This was one of the points where they differed decidedly from the Tory party in England. While believing in the empire, and rejecting all attempts to break it by independence, they professed to believe enough in America to wish it equal rights with England, and a final merger that would bring the King and London society to live in Philadelphia, leaving England to become a dependency. When the numbers, power, and revenues of America exceed those of Britain a revolution of the seat of empire will surely take place. Should the Georges in regular succession wear the British diadem to a number ranking with the Louises of France, many a goodly prince of that royal line will have mingled his ashes with American dust, and not many generations may pass away before one of the first monarchs of the world on ascending his throne shall declare, with exulting joy, born and educated amongst you. I glory in the name of American, a few political reflections submitted to the consideration of the British colonies, p. 49, Philadelphia, 1774. But it was all academic and aside from the practical question. The old Anglo-Saxon institutions had been extinguished in England for 700 years, and the loyalists saw visions. The vital question was as to the British constitution as it stood in the year 1765. Could the patriot colonists persuade the British majority to change it and go the radical colonial way? When Englishmen and loyalists reflected that Parliament could enact the death penalty in the colonies, and take away a colonist's life by a law to which he had not consented, it seemed strange that it could not take from a colonist without his consent a shilling a year in taxes. They began collecting and publishing the numerous instances in which Parliament had long regulated colonial internal affairs, so as to show that it was hardly possible that there could be an exception in the one item of taxation inside of the seaports. A notable instance of internal regulation was the colonial post office system, which was begun by an Act of Parliament in 1692, and enlarged and extended by another Act in 1710 and this same act fixed and regulated the rates of postage in all the colonies and exempted letter carriers from paying ferriage over rivers. It was unquestionably an internal regulation, and seemed very much like a tax on the colonists for carrying their letters. It was an internal tax and a very heavy one, because the postage rates were high. In 1765, the same year as the Stamp Act, the postage rates in the colonies were again regulated by Parliament. But although the colonists complained of the Stamp Act they never complained of the postage regulations. Loyalists could be very annoying on this point, for it was difficult to deny that there was a strong resemblance between demanding postage on letters and exacting a stamp duty on the legal or business document inside the wrapper. The real difference was that by paying the postage the colonists received in return an immediate and undeniable benefit in having their letters carried at the mother country's expense by a general system which was uniform throughout the colonies, while in the case of the stamp tax England seemed to be getting all the benefit. The general benefit of the post office had been so great and obvious that in 1692, 1710, and 1765, when parliamentary post office acts were passed, it never occurred to anyone to think of them as dangerous precedents of internal regulation. 8. If the Stamp Act is unconstitutional, Englishmen would say, so also is the Post Office Act, but your arch-rebel Franklin still remains postmaster of the colonies, and enjoys the salary, although the act under which he holds office should, according to his own argument, be declared void. If you want other instances, said the loyalists, of Parliament regulating the internal affairs of the colonies for the last century and more, they are innumerable. As far back as 1650, under the protectorate of Oliver Cromwell, that huge son of liberty, Parliament passed an act blocking up the ports of Barbados, Virginia, Bermuda, and Antigua and in that old act of Cromwell's time it is expressly declared that the colonies are subject to Parliament. Going farther back than 1650, they found another instance in 1643, when Parliament passed an ordinance putting the whole government of the colonies in the hands of a governor-general and seventeen commissioners, with unlimited powers to provide for, order, and dispose of all things which they shall think most fit and advantageous for the well-governing, 
securing, strengthening, and preserving of the said plantations. Was not Parliament then exercising power, and omnipotent power, in the colonies? And Oliver Cromwell himself was one of the commissioners. Then, also, there was the act in the second year of George II, levying duties out of the wages of all American seamen for the purpose of building up Greenwich Hospital. By the Parliament also were passed from time to time those acts restraining the colonies from manufacturing certain articles, notably hats, articles of iron and of steel, slitting mills were prohibited, and also the cutting of pine trees, lands were made liable to the payment of debts, the statute of wills extended to the colonies, paper currency was restrained, indentured servants empowered to enlist, troops raised in the colonies made subject to the articles of war, and so on. In fact, Parliament had over and over again walked about in the colonial internal organs, without arousing much, if any complaint, and without doing any harm. 9. Sometimes, it is true, said the loyalists, you have protested against some particular part of this regulation by Parliament when you happened not to like it. When Cromwell was handling Virginia rather roughly her people announced the doctrine that there must be no taxation without representation. Doubtless also you could find some other protests. But you never protested on principle against the post office, or the statute of wills, or the countless other regulations. You never protested on principle against any internal regulation that was a convenience or a benefit to you. And what do the few isolated protests you may have made amount to against the fact of long continued action by Parliament for over a hundred years? As Parliament had done so much in colonial internal affairs without consent and without representation, and could impose a tax at the seaports, it certainly seemed extraordinary that it could not tax generally or internally, when we consider that the power of general taxation is the most important part, and, indeed, the foundation, of legislative power, if legislative power is to exist at all. It was at first claimed by the colonists that Parliament, in spite of all its internal regulating, had never actually assumed control of private property in America, and therefore could not take away private property by a tax law to which the colonists had not consented, or, as the Stamp Act Congress put it, Parliament could not grant to His Majesty the property of the colonists. But Parliament had taken away private property by so called external taxes at the seaports, which the colonists admitted to be constitutional, and an Act of Parliament was very soon found by which private property had been controlled by Parliament all over the colonies. This was the famous Act of 1732, which made all lands, slaves, and personal property in the colonies liable for the debts of British merchants. The English merchants had petitioned to have this act passed as a protection. They were obliged to give the colonists in America long credit for the goods they sold them. As this debtor class increased the English merchants feared that the colonial legislatures would be persuaded to pass stay laws to prevent the seizure of colonial property in payment of such debts. Jamaica had already passed an act of this sort. Accordingly, the Act of Parliament of 1732 provided that all lands, goods, and Negro slaves in America should at all times be liable to seizure and sale for debt just as if they were in England. Asterisk. An enormous trade and commerce sprang up, it was said, under the protection of this Act. Without the Act the English merchants would have refused to give the colonists long credit, and the colonists, having no specie and little money of any kind in circulation except depreciated paper, would have been unable to pay cash or pay on short time, would, in short, have been unable to trade. But under the protection of the Act they reaped a greater harvest than the English merchants. Their wonderful prosperity in recent years, said the English, flowed from that Act of Parliament and accordingly they never protested or objected to it as exercising jurisdiction over private property. They never asked that they should first be represented in Parliament, and never complained of want of representation. If, therefore, said the Englishman, Parliament can, without your consent, enact a law taking away your life by capital punishment, 
and in the same way without your consent take away your private property by means of taxes levied on goods coming into your seaports, and in the same way enact a law taking away your private property for debt, what do you mean by saying that parliament cannot take away your private property by means of taxes levied in all your towns? Where is there any authority for such a distinction as that? There was no authority. The colonists were compelled to change their ground and deny all the authority of Parliament. The truth of the matter was that Parliament had the right to rule, and had always ruled, the colonies without their consent. If a community is a colony in the English sense, it necessarily is ruled without its consent. The American patriot argument meant in reality the extinguishment of the colonial relation. But let us leave the arguments and see what the colonists actually did in November. 1765, when the Stamp Act was to go into effect. It never went into effect. It never was executed. The colonists by a most remarkable unanimity of action killed it more effectually than they had killed the clauses of the Navigation and Trade Acts which did not suit them. They simply did not use the stamps. Legal proceedings went on as usual without them, vessels entered and departed without stamped papers, Businessmen by common consent paid no attention to the stamp law, newspapers were published without a stamp, on with a death's head where the stamp should have been. In fact, there were no stamps or stamped papers to use, for the distributors had all been compelled to resign, and the supplies of stamps or stamped paper which had arrived from England had been sent hack, stored away in warehouses, or destroyed by mobs. It would be difficult to find in all history another instance of such complete and thorough disobedience of a well-considered law which one of the most powerful nations of the world had made elaborate preparations to enforce. But the colonists went farther and prepared to punish England by what we would now call boycotting. They had already largely abstained from buying English goods, because of the Sugar Act and the attempt to prevent smuggling. They now carried the plan still farther. Associations were formed for the purpose, and so thorough was the understanding that between November and January trade with England almost ceased. Thousands of working people, manufacturers, labourers, and seamen in England were said to be thrown out of employment, and believed themselves threatened with starvation. Petitions began to pour into Parliament from London, Bristol, Lancaster, Liverpool, Hull, Glasgow, and, indeed, as the annual register of that date informs us, from most of the trading and manufacturing towns and boroughs of the kingdom. The trade with the colonies was between £2 million and £3 million per year. It was no light matter to cut down such an enormous sum. Worse still, the colonists were indebted to British merchants in some £2 million or £3 million on past sales, and when pressed for payment expressed great willingness, but declared that the recent acts of Parliament had so interrupted and disturbed their commerce, and thrown them into such confusion that the means of remittances and payments were utterly lost and taken from them. Asterisk. John Bull was apparently struck in his pocket, the most tender spot on his person. Meantime, during the previous summer the Grenville Ministry, which had secured the passage of the Stamp Act, quarrelled with the king and went out of power. A new ministry was formed by Lord Rockingham out of a faction of the Whig party. This ministry was very short-lived, and has usually been described as weak, although it secured some legislation which has been admired. It had to settle first of all the great question raised by the supposed starving workmen, and the merchants and manufacturers with their petitions crowding the lobbies of Parliament. They asked to have the Stamp Act repealed. But general public opinion, both in Parliament and throughout the country, was exasperated at the resistance in America and was in favour of further oppressive measures. Asterisk. The whole question of the taxation of the colonies was raised again, witnesses, experts on trade, all sorts of persons familiar with the colonies, including Franklin, were called to the bar of the House, examined, and cross-examined. The agents of the different colonies were constantly in attendance in the lobbies. No source of information was left unexplored. The ablest men of the country were pitted against each other in continual debates, 
and colonial taxation was the leading topic of conversation among all classes. There were two main questions, was the Stamp Act constitutional? And, if constitutional, was it expedient? It was the innings of a radical section of the Whigs, and, being favorable to liberalism and the colonies, they decided that the Stamp Act was not expedient. They accordingly repealed it within a year after its passage. But they felt quite sure, as did also the vast majority of Englishmen, that Parliament had a constitutional right to tax the colonies as it pleased, and so they passed what became known as the Declaratory Act, asserting the constitutional right of Parliament to bind the colonies in all cases whatsoever and this is still the law of England. The rejoicing over the repeal of the Stamp Act was displayed, we are told, in a most extraordinary manner, even in England. The ships in the Thames hoisted their colours and houses were illuminated. The colonists had apparently been able to hit a hard blow by the stoppage of trade. The rejoicing, however, as subsequent events showed, was not universal. It was the rejoicing of Whigs or of the particular ship owners, merchants, and workingmen who expected relief from the restoration of the American trade. It was noisy and conspicuous. There must have been some exaggeration in the account of the sufferings from a loss of trade. It is not improbable that Parliament had been stampeded by a worked up excitement in its lobbies, for very soon it appeared that the great mass of Englishmen were unchanged in their opinion of proper colonial policy, and, as was discovered in later years, the stoppage of the American trade did not seriously injure the business or commercial interests of England. Asterisk. But in America the rejoicing was, of course, universal. There were letters and addresses, thanksgivings in churches, the boycotting associations were instantly dissolved, trade resumed, homes spun given to the poor, and the people felt proud of themselves and more independent than ever because they could compel England to repeal laws. The colonists were certainly lucky in having chanced upon a Whig administration for their great appeal against taxation. It has often been said that both the Declaratory Act and the repeal of the Stamp Act were a combination of sound constitutional law and sound policy, and that if this same Whig line of conduct had been afterwards consistently followed, England would not have lost her American colonies. No doubt if such a Whig policy had been continued the colonies would have been retained in nominal dependence a few years longer. But such a policy would have left the colonies in their semi-independent condition without further remodeling or reform, with British sovereignty unestablished in them, and with a powerful party of the colonists elated by their victory over England. They would have gone on demanding more independence until they snapped the last string. In fact, the Whig repeal of the Stamp Act advanced the colonies far on their road to independence. They had learned their power learned what they could do by united action, and had beaten the British government in its chosen game. It was an impressive lesson. Consciously or unconsciously the rebel party among them was moved a step forward in that feeling for a distinct nationality which a naturally separated people can scarcely avoid. Such a repeal, such a going backward and yielding to the rioting, threats, and compulsion of the colonists was certainly not that firm and consistent policy which both then and now has been recommended as the true course in dealing with dependencies. The Tories condemned the repeal on this account, and in the course of the next ten or fifteen years ascribed to it the increasing coil of colonial entanglement. 1. In one sense it made little difference whether the policy was easy or severe. Whig conciliation encouraged and Tory halfway severity irritated the Patriot Party into independence. Independence could have been prevented only by making the severity so crushing and terrible as to reduce the country to the condition of Ireland. 4. Parliament taxes paint, paper, and glass and then abandons taxation. During the year after the repeal of the Stamp Act politics were comparatively quiet in the colonies. The Assembly of Virginia voted a statue to the King and an obelisk to Pitt, and New York voted statues to both the King and Pitt. Several of the colonies passed acts indemnifying those who had suffered in the Stamp Act riots. There was, however, one cloud in the sky. A clause of the Mutiny Act, passed at the same time as the Stamp Act, 
had required the colonial legislatures to provide the British soldiers quartered in America with barracks, fires, beds, candles, and other necessaries. This provision was now enforced as part of the remodeling of the colonies. The officers in command demanded their supplies. The assembly in New York voted part of the supplies, but failed to furnish vinegar, salt, and pepper. This disobedience on the part of a dependency was extremely irritating, even to a Whig ministry, and an act of parliament was promptly passed prohibiting the New York assembly from enacting any law until it complied with the requisition for the soldiers. This was internal regulation with a vengeance that Parliament and a Whig ministry should actually suspend the power of a colonial legislature. Yet the act was unquestionably constitutional, because the colonists themselves had admitted that Parliament had full control over them, except in the matter of internal taxation. They now began to realize the absurdity of the ground they had taken, and to see that the colonial relation necessarily implied full power of Parliament over New York or any other colony. New York, however, submitted, obeyed orders, and everything remained comparatively quiet. A few months after the repeal of the Stamp Act the King and the Rockingham Ministry disagreed, and on July 7, 1766, that ministry went out of office. William Pitt formed a new one, made up of politicians from the various cliques and factions of the Whigs, a most impossible and impracticable ministry and as short-lived as its predecessor. Pitt was no longer the powerful statesman who had carried England through the Great War with France and secured for her Canada and what seemed to be a worldwide empire. His health was broken and his nervous system shattered. He was afflicted with paroxysms of anger, could not bear the slightest noise, or even the presence of his children in the same house with him. He spent enormous sums of money in planting his country seat. Hayes, and secluding himself within it. He sold the country seat, but was so unhappy at parting with it that his wife bought it back for him. He required a constant succession of chickens to be kept cooking in his kitchens all day to satisfy his uncertain, but at times ravenous, appetite. Asterisk. Informing the new ministry, he compelled the king to give him a title, and henceforth he is known as Lord Chatham. Within a few weeks after forming the ministry his health failed so rapidly that he had to be taken to the continent. He never afterwards exercised any control in the ministry of which he was supposed to be the head, and within a little more than a year he retired from it altogether. But up to his death, in 1778, he would occasionally appear in the House of Lords to make those eloquent and pathetic appeals, from which our schoolboys used to recite passages denouncing the government because it would not withdraw all the troops from America, and by peaceful discussion persuade the colonies to stay within the empire. As for the ministry he had formed, it was not his in any sense. On every question it pursued a course opposed to his policy and after extraordinary confusion and divisions it soon ceased to bear even the semblance of a Whig ministry comma asterisk for by successive resignations Tories were admitted until it became all Tory. Lord Hillsborough and Lord North were admitted to it, and finally that extreme and thoroughgoing Tory Lord George Germain. The Whigs went entirely out of power, and for the remainder of the time we have a Tory government dealing with the colonies. The constant changing of ministries at this time had not a little to do with the development of the revolutionary spirit in America. A ministry seldom lasted over a year. While there were the two great parties, Whig and Tory, they were strangely confused and split up into factions. Party lines were not distinctly drawn, asterisk there could be no consistent and steady colonial policy. Whig ministries used Tory methods and Tory ministries used Whig methods. The uncertainty, the shifting back and forth from severity to liberality, passing taxing acts and repealing them, was a vast encouragement to the colonial rebels. As our revolution advanced we find party lines and policies in England becoming clearer, until towards the end they are quite distinct, and in 1778 the ministry carried out a distinctly Tory policy. As one reads in this period of English history how weak, divided, and headless every ministry was, how bankrupt and disturbed business had become, 
how violent the excitement and rioting over Wilkes, how incapable the government was to keep ordinary civil order even in London, one cannot help smiling to think of the opportunities our ancestors had in this confusion. There has been no period since then when we could have broken away so easily. Luck was an important factor in the revolution, and attended us from the beginning to the end. In the autumn of 1766 Parliament went to the country, and, as was naturally to be expected, the new election returned a body more determined than ever to remodel the colonies. It is difficult for any nation to endure a dependency where its sovereignty is not recognized. The colonists had compelled England to repeal an important law, and had brought about this repeal by violence, by withholding trade, by starving English merchants and workingmen. Could this be endured? Could it be possible that a set of inferior people in a dependency had such power as that? Observing the temper the house was in, Charles Townsend, Chancellor of the Exchequer, a Whig, and a most brilliant but uncertain member of the patchwork Chatham Ministry, announced, on January 26, 1767, that the administration was prepared to solve the American problem. This solution would render the colonies self-sustaining, and relieve Great Britain of the expense of securing, defending, and protecting them. He knew, he said, a mode by which revenue could be drawn from America for this purpose without causing the heat and turmoil of the Stamp Act, and for this hopeful announcement he was vigorously applauded on all sides. His plan was nothing more than taking the colonists at their word on the distinction between external and internal taxes. They had said that they were willing to pay external taxes, so a bill was introduced laying a duty on paint, paper, glass, and tea imported into the colonies, and to be paid at their seaports in the exact manner which they had said was lawful and constitutional. It was also at this time that other bills were introduced creating commissioners of customs to reside in Boston, strengthening the jurisdiction of the Admiralty Courts, and taking other vigorous measures to suppress American smuggling, as already described in a previous chapter. This patchwork Whig ministry felt as strongly as the Tories the necessity for remodeling and reforming the colonies. The Paint, Paper, and Glass Act was a great landmark in the Revolution and route a great change of opinion. The colonists were fairly caught in their own argument. These new taxes were external, and, therefore, constitutional. At the same time they were laid on articles of such universal use, imported in such large quantities from England, that they would be paid in the enhanced price of the articles by all the people all over the country just like the stamp tax, and so were as much in internal taxation as the stamp tax. The colonists could only weakly argue against them that they were purely for raising revenue, and not for the regulation of the commerce of the empire. But although they were as internal in their effect as the stamp tax, they could not be resisted, as the stamp tax had been resisted, by simply not using the stamps. These taxes were collected at the seaports by the authority and force of the British Navy and Army and a host of new revenue officers. If the articles were imported, the taxes would usually be paid, and the articles were of such universal use that it was difficult not to import them. Petitions, resolves, and remonstrances were again sent to England, and the associations for suspending importations were renewed, but it is noticeable that there was no rioting. In fact, the colonists were acting in a rather subdued manner. They hardly knew what to think. The next step was a serious one. They must adopt new political principles. Their leaders were holding them in check. A town meeting was held in Boston to discountenance rioting, and Otis urged caution and advised that no opposition should be made to the new duties. On the 20th of November, 1767, when the taxes went into effect, the people were remarkably quiet. Their petitions, letters, and public documents are full of the most elaborate expressions of loyalty and devotion. The famous petition which Massachusetts sent to the King in January, 1768, is apparently the perfection of simple-hearted unquestioning loyalty. Knowing what was in their hearts, it is most amusing to read the long-drawn-out humble submissiveness of their words. 
there is no bold arguing against the right to tax. They merely beg and beseech to be relieved from these new taxes. If they cannot be relieved from them, then they can only regret their unhappy fate. They repeat the old unfortunate admission of the Stamp Act Congress that Parliament has superintending authority over them, but instead of adding the exception of internal taxation, they have a new exception, which they state by saying that this supreme authority extends to all cases that can consist with the fundamental rights of nature and the Constitution. Those words, fundamental rights of nature, were a new way of limiting the authority of Parliament and significant of what was soon to happen. Glancing at the documents sent out by the other colonies, we find another idea obtruding itself. They ask for a return of the conditions and privileges they had enjoyed before the French war closed in 1763, the old days when the French in Canada prevented any remodeling or reform by England. This request for a return to that happy golden age became a watchword in the Patriot Party. In the next month, February, 1768, the Massachusetts Assembly sent to all the other colonial assemblies a circular letter, very cautiously worded, and arguing the subject in a quiet way. There is nothing about external and internal taxes, but the recent duties on paint, paper, and glass are said to be infringements of their natural and constitutional rights, because such duties take away their property without their consent which is simply a roundabout way of saying that no taxation without representation, and the doctrine of consent, must now be applied to external as well as internal taxes. It is to be observed that they say that the duties are infringements of their natural and constitutional rights. A year or two before it was only their constitutional rights, now it is also their natural rights. They are broadening their position to meet the new conditions. Massachusetts also said in the circular letter that the doctrine of consent was an unalterable right in nature engrafted into the British Constitution. This was altogether a new way of looking at the British Constitution, to engraft upon it a right of nature against the will of Parliament and the English people, and these rights of nature will soon have to be considered in a separate chapter. The Massachusetts circular letter, of course, insists strongly that it is impossible that the colonies should ever be represented in Parliament, and it declares in all seriousness that the colonists are not seeking to make themselves independent of the mother country. In short, they are just dear, good children, who are so devoted to Mother England that they will show her how to remodel her constitution. The British government, however, was not in the least deceived. They very naturally regarded this letter as of a most dangerous and factious tendency, calculated to inflame the minds of good subjects in the colonies. The chief object of the letter had been to promote union among the colonies, unite them in opposition, and encourage a reciprocal expression of feeling. The government quickly saw this, and there was an unsuccessful attempt to have Massachusetts rescind the letter. Asterisk this caused an irritating controversy which has been most voluminously described in many histories, but into the details of which we have not space to enter. It has been commonly said that the attempt of the government to have the letter rescinded was unwise because it was practically a denial of the right to petition, and made the colonies more rebellious than ever. But the ministry were in an awkward predicament. They saw that the colonies were evidently moving off. There was a powerful rebel party at work among them. Should the government stand still and let them go? A song of the revolution at the time of the Massachusetts circular letter. The most serious provision of the paint, paper, and glass act remains yet to be mentioned. The colonists had objected to the Stamp Act because it was understood that the revenue from it was to be devoted to keeping an army among them. They were also unalterably opposed to any system by which revenue raised from them was to be turned generally into the English exchequer. The paint, paper, and glass act was intended to obviate both of these objections. The revenue raised from it was to be spent entirely on the colonies themselves in maintaining among them civil government and the administration of justice. There was to be a colonial civil list, as it was called, and hereafter all governors judges, 
and other colonial executive officials were to receive fixed salaries paid by the crown out of the revenue raised by the duties on paint, paper, glass, and tea. The old system of the assemblies securing the passage of their favorite laws by withholding the governor's salary, and of controlling the judges in the same way, was to cease. There was to be no more bargain and sale legislation, but in place of it orderly, methodical, regular government. This, as previously shown, struck at the root of what the colonists considered their system of freedom. If they could no longer control governors and executive officials through their salaries, they could no longer have their favorite laws. They would become mere colonies, compelled to take what was given to them and to do as they were told. The first man to come forward with a popular and encouraging statement of the colonist side of the controversy was John Dickinson, a young man of 35, a Quaker, and a lawyer of considerable practice in Philadelphia. He had been for some years more or less concerned in politics, had been a member of the Stamp Act Congress, and had drafted several of its documents. He seems to have understood that the arguments thus far published were too brief and in general. There was not enough of detail in them. The aggressive or patriot party among the colonists needed more light and were not sufficiently aroused. He accordingly wrote for one of the newspapers a series of letters from a farmer which accomplished his purpose most admirably. They awoke the colonists with a bound. The title was also fortunate, for the farmers were by far the largest and most important class in the community. His opening sentence was captivating. I am a farmer he said, settled after a variety of fortunes near the banks of the Delaware in the province of Pennsylvania. His farm was small, his servants few and good, he had a little money at interest, he asked for no more. There were twelve of these letters by Dickinson published in the Pennsylvania Chronicle between December 2, 1767, and February 15, 1768. They were quickly copied in most of the other colonial newspapers, reprinted in pamphlet form in numerous editions in America and England, and translated in France. They caused the greatest excitement among our people. Town meetings, societies, and grand juries sent votes of thanks to the author. They toasted him at public dinners, and wrote poems and eulogies in his honor. At the same time we must remember that these letters were also attacked as going entirely too far and calculated to excite the passions of the unthinking. Asterisk. They enlarged in detail on the danger of losing control of the salaries of the governors. They showed the full meaning of Parliament's suspension of the legislative power of New York. They showed that if Parliament could suspend the functions of a colonial legislature, it was omnipotent in its control of the colonies. Dickinson was bold enough to answer the argument that England was too powerful to be resisted. It is also significant that he describes as a warning to the colonists how Ireland had lost her liberties. He took the new ground of rejecting all authority of Parliament, and at the same time tried to make it appear that there was no change from the old line of argument. He kept all the old arguments going, so as to conceal the new movement. He clung to the old absurdity of allowing Parliament to regulate the commerce of the colonies by duties which should not be forever new. This effort to conceal the change of ground renders a great deal of his reasoning very obscure to a modern reader. Too but the Patriot Party understood him. Englishmen also understood his purpose and saw what was coming. 3. In this same year, 1768, more strenuous efforts than ever were made to suppress smuggling. On June 10 there was the riot over the seizure of the Sloop Liberty. In September men of war and transports loaded with troops arrived in Boston to keep order. The British officials in the colony had asked for these troops. For by September 30th Boston Common was covered with dent, and about 14 men of war lay in the harbor, with springs on their cables, and their broadsides covering the town. The position was serious and very peculiar. For, as Franklin said in his criticism on Dickinson's letters, the Boston people were in their resolutions and documents acknowledging subordination to Parliament and at the same time denying its power to make laws for them. 
The year 1769 opened with Parliament declaring in both speeches and resolutions that the colonies were in a state of disobedience to law and government, adopting measures subversive of the constitution and disclosing an inclination to throw off all obedience to the mother country. This was unquestionably a true description of the situation, and I cannot see that any good purpose is served by obscuring or denying it by means of those passages in the documents of the colonists in which they declare their heartfelt loyalty to Great Britain, disclaim all intention of independence, and acknowledge the supreme authority of Parliament. Those fulsome expressions deceived no one at that time, and why should they be used to deceive the guileless modern reader? The Patriot Party made many such prudent statements, which were merely the nets and mattresses stretched below the acrobat in case he should fall. We find Parliament in this year directing that the Governor of Massachusetts obtain the fullest information touching all treason or misprision of treason within his government since the 30th day of December, 1767, in order, as the instruction went on to say, that His Majesty might have such offences tried within the realm of England, according to the statute passed in the 35th year of the reign of Henry VIII. The meaning of this, in plain English, was that a colonist suspected or accused of treason must not be tried in the colonies where any jury that could be called would probably acquit him as a matter of course. It seemed better to take him to England and try him there in the calm and impartial light of regular British administration. This measure filled the patriotic party in the colonies with the most violent indignation. They denounced it in every form of language, and although no one was ever taken to England to be tried, it was enumerated in the Declaration of Independence as one of the causes of separation. It was natural that our people, who, under the restraining power of France, had enjoyed so much liberty that they scarcely understood what a colony was, should be indignant at this suggestion of transporting them for trial. On the other hand, the ministry wished to establish British authority in the so-called colonies, the law of Henry VIII. Was on the statute book, it had been used several times, the Scotch rebels had been tried out of the country in which their crimes were committed, so, also, the Sussex smugglers and the murderers of Mr. Park, the governor of the Windward Islands. It afterwards also seemed necessary to prevent the colonists from trying in their courts British officials who might be accused by them of murder, when in their official capacity they were suppressing riots. They would be convicted as a matter of course. Provision was therefore made for taking such officials to England, or to another and more peaceable colony, for trial. This measure, like the other, was never enforced, but vigorously denounced by our people. There were no trials for treason in the revolution, although England was on the verge of it several times. Meantime, the non-importing associations were revived, in the hope that they would be as successful as they had been with the Stamp Act, and we notice now for the first time that force and intimidation were used to compel merchants and others to join these associations and refrain from importing. Thus the year 1769 wore away until November, when, before the non-importation agreements had had any great effect, the extraordinary and unexpected news was received that the Tory ministry had of their own accord decided to repeal the duties on paint, paper, and glass and leave only the duty on tea. 5. In the spring they had been denouncing the colonial rebellion and preparing to punish traitors. In the autumn they had eaten their own words, and in effect complied with the request of the rebels. The small duty on tea was left standing merely to show that the right to tax remained, just as the Declaratory Act had been passed when the Stamp Act was repealed. This duty on tea would also, it was believed, be a test of the real sentiments of the colonists, and show whether or not they were bent on rebellion and independence under any pretext. During the following winter this promise of repeal was promptly fulfilled. The duties on paint, paper, and glass were repealed, and the ministry even went farther and abandoned all attempt to compel the colonists to pay for their defence or to maintain the troops stationed among them. What could have been more gracious, more friendly, or more conciliatory than this? I cannot agree with those writers, both American and English, who hold that a conciliatory policy would have saved the colonies to England. 
we must remember that on this occasion Lord Hillsborough officially informed all the colonial governors that the ministry entertained no design to propose to Parliament to lay any further taxes on America for the purpose of raising a revenue. This was in strict compliance with the colonial argument and with Dickinson's letters from a farmer that what America objected to was taxation for the purpose of raising a revenue. The ministry had abandoned the revenue and abandoned the compulsory maintenance of the army. They could hardly have done more unless they had declared England the colony and America the mother country. The colonies were put back very nearly into the old condition that prevailed before 1763. Lord Hillsborough's promise that no more taxes should be laid on the colonies was faithfully kept. The British Parliament never passed another taxing act, and, when five years later actual warfare began, no one could say that the promise had been broken, for there had not been even an attempt to pass such an act. When we seek to discover why the Tory ministry made this sudden change, which was in effect an adoption of the Whig policy and Whig methods, we find that they had discovered that the new duties would not produce £16,000 per year, and that the military expenses in the colonies had increased to more than ten times that sum. The paint, paper, and glass duties being therefore a failure and an expense, causing great irritation, and England being already oppressed with debt. The ministry wished to compromise with the colonists and settle the dispute in a friendly way. They had been divided on the question, and, after long discussion of their differences, settled them in favor of the colonists. If we seek still farther to explain this change of front, we may account for it, as a great deal of subsequent conciliation or vacillation may be accounted for, by the fear of France. Her shadow was appearing. She was again coming on the scene. The colonists were threatening to appeal to her, and the Boston Gazette of September 20, 1768, had openly made the threat. Asterisk even without the threat, it was obviously France's policy to take advantage of any open rupture or difficulty that England might have with the colonies. France wished to revenge her humiliation in 1763 and cripple England's power as an empire. This fear paralyzed all of England's action. It was an underlying influence of debates in Parliament and consultations of ministers. England must avoid if possible the forcing of the dispute to that extremity. But whatever may be the reasons, the important fact remains that in this year 1770 Great Britain withdrew the two great colonial grievances, comma, taxation for revenue, and compulsory support of a standing army and this event should not be obscured or placed in the background of historical narratives merely because it does not show sufficient tyranny or oppression on the part of England. The first and most important consequence of this conciliation was that among the Patriot or Rebel Party England's prestige was gone forever. She had lost much of her prestige and vastly encouraged that party when she repealed the Stamp Act at its dictation and now she had given the finishing stroke. Asterisk. England, of course, lost no prestige among the people afterwards called loyalists, people un-Americanized, inclining strongly towards England by taste and associations, and not inspired with the passion for ownership of the country in which they lived. These people accepted the repealing act in the spirit in which it was offered, as redressing grievances and tending to secure colonies within the empire. So very conciliatory was the repealing act and the promise of the ministry, that it had a quieting effect on all parties and put an end to excitement and turmoil for three or four years. The moderates and the Patriot Party were willing to let well enough alone, and the small duty on the one item of tea did not bother them any more than the old declaratory act. In truth, the extreme radicals of the Samuel Adams type had nothing with which to arouse the moderates. The agitation business was at a lurb. Within a few months, however, an accident occurred which could be used, and was used for a time, for purposes of excitement. It was one of those accidents which, in strained relations between independent nations, often precipitate a war. The ministry had not thought it a necessary part of conciliation to withdraw the troops from Boston, and it is difficult to see how they could properly have withdrawn them. The lives of the customs officials in that town had been threatened by the mobs, and were not safe, 
and the troops and war vessels had been asked for, and sent, for the purpose of protecting those officials as well as to assist them in enforcing the navigation laws. The ministry could not very well abandon the enforcement of those laws. They had decided to stop smuggling, and had started to stop it. They could hardly draw back from that undertaking without surrendering completely to the colonists and abandoning the little that remained of British authority in America. Moreover, the colonists had admitted that such laws regulating trade were constitutional. The contest and the strained relations were now confined to Boston. The rest of the colonies were quiet and had no particular grievance, and the contest itself had now returned to the old subject of smuggling. The soldiers in Boston were extremely irritating, not only because they were swaggering and offensive after the British manner, but because Massachusetts was entirely unaccustomed to anything of that sort. If she had always been a real colony, accustomed to supervision, her people might have treated the military occupation as a small matter. British colonies often have considerable bodies of troops stationed in them. In our own time in Canada we have often seen the people quietly acquiescing in the presence of the red-coated regiments which caused such frenzy in Massachusetts. But Massachusetts had at one time enjoyed semi-independence, and the presence of troops to enforce laws which she had disobeyed for a hundred years, and grown rich through disobeying, was almost unbearable. Her people felt towards those troops very much as they would feel today if Boston were occupied by a foreign soldiery. It was naturally to be expected that anything like ill conduct by the soldiery would be exaggerated by the people and used by the patriot leaders to stimulate their resentment. There is no question that some of the more radical and fiery spirits were constantly exciting the townspeople to quarrel with the soldiers. Both men and boys made a constant practice to insult the bloody backs, or scoundrels in red, as they called them, and they would shout at them, lobsters for sale. The soldiers in their turn had their insults for the Mohairs, or Dunghill tribe, as they called the colonists. The soldiers were often arrested by the local magistrates, whom we may be sure were not lenient with them and the colonists complained that the officers screened their men from punishment. On the 2d of March, 1770, a soldier asking for employment at Gray's Rope Walk was refused in coarse language. He insisted on having a boxing match with one of the workmen, and was beaten. He returned with some companions and was driven off, and a larger number coming to fight with clubs and cutlasses were also driven off. On the night of the 5th there was much disturbance in the streets, the soldiers were swaggering and threatening, and the citizens and boys replying to them in language equally abusive. The mob, armed with clubs, balls of ice, and stones inside of snowballs, finally pressed upon a picket guard of eight men, daring them to fire. The soldiers restrained themselves for some time, until one, receiving a blow, fired his musket, and immediately six of the others fired. Three citizens were killed and eight wounded. Six. There was at once great excitement in the town. The bells were rung, the cry was spread, the soldiers are rising, and many believed that a general attack by the citizens on the soldiery was narrowly averted. The next day a town meeting was called. A committee, of which Samuel Adams was chairman, urged Governor Hutchinson to remove all the soldiers from the town to preserve the peace and prevent an attack by the people, who would soon be swarming in from the country. After some hesitation Hutchinson agreed that the soldiers should be sent down the harbour to the castle. This was, from one point of view, a wise and creditable expedient to prevent violence. But we must also remember that it was a yielding on the part of England to the demands of the colonists, with the redoubtable rebel Sam Adams at their head. The captain of the guard and the eight men had been immediately arrested. They were turned over to the civil authorities of the colony regularly tried, defended by John Adams and Josiah Quincy, and the captain and six of the men acquitted. The remaining two were brought in guilty of manslaughter, and slightly punished. This trial reflected the greatest credit not only on the jury, but on Adams and Quincy, who were patriot leaders, and the verdict of the jury showed that the soldiers had not been seriously to blame. But most of the patriot party seized upon the occurrence for their own purposes. 
they called it the Boston Massacre, and Paul Ekvia prepared a colored engraving of the scene, calling it the Bloody Massacre. They exaggerated it into a ferocious and unprovoked assault by brutal soldiers upon a defenseless people, and the eagerness with which this exaggeration was encouraged showed where their events were tending. The evidence taken at the trial has been published, 7 and contains all we really know about the event. It is worth reading as an astonishing revelation of the times, the anger and resentment of a large J art of the people, the torrents of abuse and slang that were exchanged, the hatred of England and English control, and the readiness to destroy any symbol of that control. After reading the description by the witnesses of that night in Boston, one sees that the American communities could never be turned into modern colonies by the conciliatory policy or any policy except some sort of extermination. The government had been most lenient in surrendering the guard to be tried by a jury of colonists and in removing the troops from Boston, so that the massacre could not at that time be worked up into rebellion. The government had certainly not acted harshly. On the contrary, there had been so much yielding that the two regiments that had been sent out of Boston were ever afterwards ridiculed in England as the Sam Adams regiments. The colonists quieted down. John Adams retired from politics and devoted himself to his profession. Except for the partially successful attempts to repress their smuggling, the people were very much in the same semi independent condition as before the French War. The slight tax on tea, which had been left partly to show that Parliament was the supreme power and partly as a test to see how rebellious the colonists were, worked well enough because the colonists did not mind it, and continued to smuggle tea from Holland. There were strong indications that possibly the American problem had been settled, and that the colonies would remain colonies of the old smuggling kind, disregarding such laws as failed to please them. Violent efforts were made by the more radical to keep up the non-importation associations, but without success. One by one the southern colonies and then Pennsylvania and the New England colonies and New York began importing all English commodities except tea. The protest which the extreme patriots made against this is instructive as showing the condition of parties. They declared that the spirit of liberty was dead. The students at Princeton, among whom was James Madison, put on black gowns, and Lynch, of South Carolina, is said to have shed tears over what he deemed the lost cause. This state of quietude lasted three years, to the great annoyance of men like Samuel Adams, who were bent on absolute independence. But most of the patriots were content that they could repeal acts of parliament and order British troops out of a town. V. The Tea Episode Before the Passage of the Paint, Paper and glass act tea had been taxed on its arrival in England at the high rate of a shilling per pound. When any of the tea was shipped from England to the colonies, the colonists, of course, paid this tax in the enhanced price of the tea. Hutchinson, the governor of Massachusetts, suggested that all colonial taxation be made in that way, comma, the tax levied and collected before the goods left England, which would be as external as it was possible to make a tax and the colonists might be persuaded not to call it taxation. This expensive tea, which paid a shilling per pound duty in England, did not trouble the colonists, because they smuggled all the tea they wanted from Holland. It was in the hope of breaking up this smuggling and encouraging the sale of English tea that Parliament, in the Paint, Paper, and Glass Act, struck off the shilling duty and on all tea sent to the colonies placed a duty of only threepence per pound to be paid in the colonial ports. Thus the colonists would pay nine cents per pound less tax, the sale of tea from English provinces in the Far East, and especially the tea of the Great East India Company, would be promoted, the immoral smuggling of the Americans checked, and everybody made happy. Some of this threepence per pound tea seems to have been imported and the duty paid but because the duty was a direct tax, associations or clubs were formed whose members agreed not to drink it. Merchants were applauded for net importing it, and encouraged to smuggle the Holland tea, and the smuggling, being very profitable, was regularly and extensively practiced. Asterisk. 
there was, therefore, every reason why the Patriots should be content for the present, for they were successfully defeating England and the Tiakt by their old methods, and their merchants were growing rich by smuggling. The loyalists afterwards said that the trifling tea tax would soon have become obsolete, and some liberally inclined ministry would have repealed it. Colonial taxation had been abandoned, was dying a natural death, comma, asterisk and harmony was returning, they said, if both England and the Americans would only be careful and forbearing. But the harmony that was returning could only be continued by letting the colonies alone, and, as they increased in population and wealth, letting them pass more and more into absolute independence. The colonists were now quiet, because British authority was unestablished among them, it had been defied and beaten, the remodeling begun some seven years before had failed and even smuggling could not be suppressed. Could England endure a state of affairs and allow it to drift into absolute separation? Wedderburn is reported to have said in Parliament at this time that the colonies were already lost to the Crown. The government could not refrain from discussing the disorders in America, and attempting some slight remedies, especially in that hotbed of sedition, Massachusetts. It was decided, as a first step, that the Crown should pay the salaries of the Governor and judges. It seemed also well for the present to ignore or suspend that provision in the Massachusetts Charter which provided that all troops, even the regulars, should be under the control of the governor. It seemed better to place such troops under a military officer, who could more properly decide whether they should be moved here or there as Sam Adams or a rebel committee might direct. A great deal has been written on this violation of the Charter of Massachusetts. It is useless to debate the question. If you are an Englishman, and believe independence a crime, and that the colonies should have been saved from independence, you will see in this violation merely a military or British necessity. If you are a patriot, and believe independence and self-government to be natural rights, you will see in the violation an atrocious crime. The practical question was how far this sort of thing might go before it would produce an outbreak. The Patriot Party was quiet, but very inflammable. Its radical leaders were hard at work. Samuel Adams began to carry out his idea of organizing the rebellion by means of committees of correspondence, at first among the Massachusetts towns, afterwards throughout the country. We find the Boston Gazette of November 2, 1772, threatening that, unless their liberties are immediately restored, they will form an independent commonwealth. By the system of correspondence among the Patriots town committees and various bodies were drawing up lists of the laws England must repeal and the positions from which she must recede. She must withdraw even the right to tax, and they went on enumerating every objection, great and small, until their lists were in effect a conflicted denial of British sovereignty. They were ordering the British government off the continent. In June, 1772, the revenue cutter Garspec was seized in Narragansett Bay by the people of Rhode Island and burned. The lieutenant of this cutter had been trying to enforce the revenue laws. Like other officers on the coast, he found it very difficult to catch anyone in the act of smuggling. He seized the property of people who were suddenly found to be innocent, and he acted altogether very indiscreetly in the opinion of the people of Rhode Island. But the method adopted of repressing him, by seizing and burning one of the king's ships, did not strike the British government as the sort of conduct to be expected of a dependency. A commission was sent to Providence to inquire into the matter, and there was talk of sending colonists to England to be tried, but nothing was done, no severe measures taken. It is difficult to see how the government could have been more conciliatory and forbearing. They professed to believe that such outrages were brought about by the artifices of a few. England might have refrained still longer from forcing an outbreak, if that great corporation, the East India Company, had not brought a pressure on the government which could not be resisted. The company was at that time in a bad condition, and was generally supposed to be bankrupt. Its stock was rapidly depreciating and the fall of such a vast concern would precipitate a financial panic. In fact, the great company had already sunk so low that the panic was thought to have begun. Firms were going bankrupt, 
and merchants, manufacturers, and traders suffering. It seemed quite absurd to Englishmen that the company could not sell its tea in colonies that belonged to England, while Holland sold in those colonies thousands of pounds of tea every year. There was, in fact, laid up in warehouses in England 17 million pounds of the East India Company's tea for which there was no demand, because of the smuggling practices of those dreadful American colonists. The East India Company and the government were closely allied. The company, besides paying into the Exchequer £400,000 per year, was really a branch of the government for the control of India, and it afterwards became merged in a department of the government. Accordingly the ministry made an arrangement with the company which to them seemed quite reasonable. The East India Company T had to pay duty on its arrival in England, but three-fifths of this duty was remitted or drawn back, as the expression was when the tea was exported to the colonies. It was now proposed that all of this duty should be remitted on exportation to America, so that the East India Company could undersell the tea which the colonists smuggled from the Dutch. Accordingly an Act of Parliament was passed, May 10, 1773, remitting the duty, and the East India Company freighted ships with tea to Boston, New York, Philadelphia, and Charleston. Looked at in cold blood, it was a rather amusing and very English device for helping out the bankrupt company, coaxing the colonists to accept English taxed tea, and, if possible, stopping by ingenuity the smuggling that could not be stopped by revenue cutters, boards of commissioners, troops, and men of war. It was so far from being tyrannous and cruel that it was pitiable, pitiable for a proud nation to be reduced to such straits. The colonists had the whole summer and most of the autumn of 1773 to think over the matter, for the tea ships did not begin to arrive until November. The patriots in all the colonies were determined that the tea should not be sold. They wished also to prevent it being landed, for, if landed, the duty of threepence per pound might be paid and the plan of the king and the ministry would be partially successful. There was now an opportunity for agitation and the radical leaders bestirred themselves. The committees of correspondence worked upon the people all over the country. Some of the newspapers openly advocated independence. The attacks upon the East India Company as a soulless corporation and an inhuman monopoly remind us of the language of our own times. If such a company, it was said, once got a foothold in America, it would trade in other articles besides tea and drive American merchants out of business. A printed handbill one was circulated in Pennsylvania describing the company's shocking deeds of plunder and cruelty in India, and arguing that it would overwhelm America with the same rapacity and slaughter that had been inflicted on the unfortunate East Indians. Franklin's old friend, the Bishop of Street Asaph, prepared a speech for the House of Lords denouncing the government for turning loose upon the Americans a corporation with such a record of bloodshed and tyranny. It was at this time that Samuel Adams and the more ardent patriots took the next step in their plan, and suggested a union of all the colonies in a congress. The Boston Gazette had been openly suggesting independence for over a year. It now demanded a congress of American states to frame a bill of rights or to form an independent state, an American commonwealth if all this was to reason, under English law, and in a modern English colony would be severely punished and repressed. The boldness and impunity with, which it was done show the effect of the conciliatory policy and the weakness of England. Some of the patriots of the type of Cushing, of Massachusetts, or Reed and Dickinson, of Pennsylvania, advocated caution. We were not yet strong enough not sufficiently united or sufficiently numerous, for a dash for independence. But Samuel Adams would have no delay. He was for forcing a conflict, striking at once, for, said he, when our liberty is gone, history and experience will teach us that an increase of inhabitants will be but an increase of slaves. The majority of the patriots were apparently for moderation, and had they had their way this episode would have been tided over. Their plan was quietly to prevent the landing and payment of duty on the tea, send it all back to England, and thus show that the Tea Act, the last remnant of the taxation system begun eight years before, 
was a failure. The act would then soon be repealed and taxation never again be attempted. It must be confessed that there were plausible reasons for supposing that this plan might have accomplished peaceful independence. Our natural increase in wealth and population, said Cushing, will in a course of years settle this dispute in our favor. On the other hand, Samuel Adams and the radicals had strong grounds for believing that the course of years would not necessarily bring independence without a war to settle it. England would not finally recognize the absolute independence of the colonies without fighting. No nation had ever done so. The inherent right of a naturally separated people to be independent according to the rights of man, might be just and sound, but no nation has as yet recognized its justice. As there must be a fight, it was better, the radicals thought, to have it now at once while our people were hot and England was so weak. To England might settle the taxation question satisfactorily, and in the future settle the smuggling question, and be so conciliatory that the mass of people, no matter how numerous they became, would forget the past and be content to live along under an easy yoke or with a sort of semi-independence. The extravagant and even bombastic rhetoric that was used in speeches and resolutions to stir the people out of this easy frame of mind was commented on by English writers like Dean Tucker as showing not only the bad taste and vulgarity of the Americans, but the insincerity of the independence movement. The tea ships which came to Charleston, Philadelphia, and New York were handled by the moderate patriots. The Charleston ship arrived December 2nd. The consignees were induced to resign, but nothing more was done. The twenty days expired. The tea was seized by the customs officers and offered for sale to pay the duty, but no one would buy it, it could not be sold, and was stored in damp cellars until useless. From the point of view of the moderate patriots this was a proper way of solving the difficulty. It was perfectly lawful, there was no violence. The British government could make no complaint. And yet the Tea Act, the duty, and the plan of the East India Company were killed as dead as Caesar. At Philadelphia, printed circulars, some of which are still preserved, were sent to all the Delaware River pilots, reminding them in rather significant language not to bring any tea ships up to the town. Nevertheless, a tea ship got up the river as far as Chester. A town meeting was held and a committee went down to Chester to talk to the captain and the consignee. They used such well-chosen words that the next day the ship sailed down the river and returned to England. In a similar way the consignees at New York resigned and sent the tea back, and some tea that arrived at Portsmouth, New Hampshire, was sent away to Halifax. But the three tea ships which came into Boston Harbor fell into the hands of Samuel Adams and his followers, and then the trouble began. The consignees in this case were five in number, including the two sons of Hutchinson, the governor, who, like their father, were devoted loyalists, believing in the supremacy of the British Empire, and regarding American independence as a delusion and a crime. They would not resign. Town meetings were held upon them committees visited them, violence was threatened, but they were firm. They did not, however, attempt to land the cargoes. The patriots placed a guard over the ships, and six horsemen held themselves ready to alarm the country towns. The radicals were determined to begin the act of revolution at this point. The owners and the captains of the ships were willing to take the tea back to England, but the custom house officers would not give the ships a clearance until they had discharged their tea. Governor Hutchinson gave instructions that no ship should be allowed to pass the castle outward bound unless it had a permit, and he would not issue a permit unless the vessel first showed a clearance. Meanwhile, during these disputes the twenty days were passing. Some patriots advised moderation, and there was a strong loyalist minority. But the party of violence was in the ascendant. The town was placarded with liberty posters, riders were posting back and forth from the neighboring towns, and the country people were beginning to flock into Boston. The common statements in some of our histories that Governor Hutchinson was the vacillating and cowardly agent of tyranny are utterly without foundation. If he had been cowardly, he would have given the ships a permit, let them return to England, 
and thus have postponed the revolution for another three or four years. He acted consistently with his own opinions and the conciliatory policy of the government. He abstained from any use of the men of war in the harbour or of the two Sam Adams regiments that were still down at the castle, where Sam had put them. He allowed the patriots themselves to guard the tea ships. The warships or the soldiers could have taken possession of the tea ships and prevented all that happened. But British sovereignty was on this occasion a mere spectator and visitor in its own dominions. The difficulty might have been settled as in Charleston, by allowing the customs officials to seize the tea at the end of the twenty days. No one would have had the temerity to buy it, and it would then have been stored till it rotted. In fact, the consignees offered to have it stored until they should receive instructions from the East India Company what to do with it. But Adams and his people were too hot to take such chances. They were planning an outbreak, a truly Boston and Massachusetts outbreak which would be self-restrained, and yet sufficiently violent to force both England and America to an open contest on the one great question which lay beneath all the past eight years of wrangling. They prepared everything for action on the night of the 16th of December, because two days after that the twenty days limit would expire on the Dartmouth slash which had been the first ship to arrive. Seven thousand people filled the old South Meeting House on that afternoon, while Roch, the Quaker owner of the Dartmouth, drove out to Milton to Governor Hutchinson's country place, to ask him for a permit to pass the castle. Everyone knew or felt confident that the permit would be refused, so that this meeting cannot be called a deliberative one. Darkness came on, and still the meeting waited. At last Roch returned, and made the formal announcement that the permit had been refused. Samuel Adams arose and gave the signal that had evidently been agreed upon, this meeting can do nothing more to save the country. Immediately, as has been so often related, the war whoop was heard, or resounded, I believe, is the usual expression, outside the door. Some forty or fifty men, painted and disguised as Indians, and with hatchets in their hands, suddenly appeared from some place where they had been waiting, and rushed down to the tea ships, directly encouraged by Adams, Hancock, and the other patriots. The crowd formed around them as a protection, and posted guards about the wharf to prevent interference while the Indians worked with their hatchets. It is said that the vast crowd was perfectly silent, a most respectful Boston silence, and not a sound could be heard for three hours save the cracking of the hatchets on the chests of tea in all three ships. 3. At the end of that time every pound of tea was in the water, and the proceedings, so like a great deal of our lynch law, were ended. It was a serious business for the people concerned, but now that we are too far away to feel the seriousness it seems really comical. The most comical part of it was that the Indians claimed particular credit for not having injured any other property on the ships, and declared that all things were conducted with great order, decency, and perfect submission to government. Our ancestors had a fine sense of humor. From the point of view of Samuel Adams, I suppose there never was a piece of liberty or revolutionary rioting that was so sagaciously and accurately calculated to effect its purpose, and not go too far. If it had been very violent disorder, or brutality, it might have alienated moderate or doubtful patriots whom it was important to win over. But it was so neat, gentle, pretty, and comical that to this day it can be described in school books without much danger of the children at once seeing that it was a riotous breach of the peace, a lawless violation of the rights of private property, and an open defiance of governmental authority. In England, however, the violence of it was sufficiently apparent to break up for a time the conciliatory policy and to bring upon the Massachusetts colonists such punishment as the radical patriots hoped would arouse the fighting spirit. 4. It is possible that it was intended as an example which would be followed in one or two other colonies, and thus bring on a general punishment that would arouse them all, but that did not happen. It had no effect on their Philadelphians, who, more than a week afterwards, quietly and without any violence, sent their tea ship back to England. 
the time on the Charleston ship expired December 22, and they also, as we have shown, acted moderately. The British government could have nothing to say against the action of those colonies, and the whole punishment was directed against Massachusetts. It was a great event for Samuel Adams, and who was this Samuel Adams, who is so conspicuous in this part of the revolution, and later on almost disappears from view. The portrait we have of him, which has often been reproduced, represents what would seem to be a stout, handsomely dressed, prosperous merchant, with a very firm chin and jaw, proud of his wealth and success, and proud of his long-tested ability in business. Unfortunately, the only part of this portrait which is true to life is that I unlike jaw. Samuel Adams was not a merchant, was seldom well dressed, was not at all proud, and never rich. He was always poor. He failed in his malting business, was unthrifty and careless with money, and had, in fact, no liking for, or ability in, any business except politics. He lived with his family in a dilapidated house on Purchase Street, and when in 1774 he was elected a delegate to the Continental Congress at Philadelphia, his admirers had to furnish the money to make him look respectable. However some may despise him, he has certainly very many friends. For not long since, some persons, their names unknown, sent and asked his permission to build him a new barn, the old one being decayed, which was executed in a few days. A second sent to ask leave to repair his house, which was thoroughly effected soon. A third sent to beg the favor of him to call at a tailor's shop, and be measured for a suit of clothes, and choose his cloth, which were finished and sent home for his acceptance. A fourth presented him with a new wig, a fifth with a new hat, a sixth with six pairs of the best silk hose, a seventh, with six pairs of fine thread ditto an eighth with six pairs of shoes, and a ninth modestly inquired of him whether his finances were not rather low than otherwise. He replied it was true that was the case, but he was very indifferent about these matters, so that his poor abilities were of any service to the public jay upon which the gentleman obliged him to accept a purse containing about fifteen or twenty Johannes. Hosmer, Life of Samuel Adams, p. 308. All this assistance Adams was not too proud to accept. He had long been engaged in small local politics, and when tax collector had been short in his accounts and threatened with ruin. Asterisk the patriots, of course, forgave him this slaps, which was not repeated, but Englishmen and loyalists never forgot it. When coupled with his shiftlessness and shabbiness and the gifts of money and clothes to make him presentable in the Congress, it is easy to understand the indignation, contempt, and disgust which were entertained for him by those who were opposed to the rebellion. Such a disloyal and dishonest movement, they would say, naturally had a shabby rascal for its leader. On the other hand, Adams was a man of good education, and the public documents he prepared show considerable ability. His speeches, though at times somewhat turgid and violent, seem to have been well suited to their purpose. He was a most competent politician and a good organizer of agitation. He understood the temper of the people from the bottom up, and was so skillful in drawing the ship caucus into the revolution movement that some trace to this source the origin of our word caucus. An account of his language and advice to such people, to fight England, to destroy every soldier that dare put his foot on shore and that we shall have it in our power to give laws to England, has been preserved, and by the English law it was pure treason, asterisk. Adams had also a constitutional tremulousness of his head and hands, which did not improve loyalist opinion of him. He was one of those men whom we call a devoted and enlightened patriot, or slippery scoundrel, conspirator, and fanatic, according as we are on the side of the government or of the rebellion. His best ability was shown in agitation in the early stages of the revolution, in attending to the small details of organization, while men of larger capacity were still partially absorbed in their business or professions. That charmingly ingenuous statement that all the hatchet work on the tea ships had been done in perfect submission to government had no mitigating effect in England. 
the destruction by a mob of over 15,000 pounds worth of tea, the private property of the East India Company, awoke Parliament from its dream of conciliation. That the mob had been guided by respectable and wealthy men like Hancock, Malinax, Warren, and Young, who prevented uproar and noise and enforced decency and order, made it all the worse in English eyes. Parliament and the Ministry resolved at all hazards and at any cost to establish British sovereignty in America. Leniency and conciliation had been carried too far. January and February passed, and during March, 1774, Parliament debated the punishment that should be inflicted on Boston for this unpardonable outrage, obviously leading the way to the destruction of the freedom of commerce in all parts of America. If such an insult, it was said, had been offered to British properly in a foreign port, the nation would have been called upon to demand satisfaction for it. Two principal measures and two subsidiary or minor measures were decided upon. The first was that the town of Boston must be fined and pay damages for allowing private property to be destroyed by a mob within her limits. This was based on a legal principle recognized to this day in both England and America, that a county or town which fails to keep the peace is liable in damages to private individuals if their property is destroyed. In several instances in England towns had been fined for allowing individuals or their property to be injured. London had been fined in the time of Charles II, when Dr. Lamb was killed, Edinburgh in a similar instance, and part of the revenue of Glasgow had been sequestrated until satisfaction was made for the pulling down of Mr. Campbell's house. The question was, how could such a rebellious town as Boston be compelled to pay damages, how could she be fined? There was no use in beginning civil or penal suits in her courts, because no verdict against her could be obtained. More important still, how could security be obtained for the future that trade may be safely carried on, property protected, laws obeyed, and duties regularly paid? All this, it was said, could be accomplished by closing Boston Harbor by Act of Parliament and the blockade of a fleet. No trading vessels and no commerce should pass in or out. The Custom House officials, who were now not safe in Boston or safe no longer than while they neglected their duty, should be moved to Salem. This closing of the port of Boston should continue until Boston, by her own official act, paid for the £15,000 worth of tea she had allowed to be destroyed and reimbursed the customs officials for damage done by the mobs in 1773 and January, 1774. When the governor should certify that this had been done and that the colony was peaceable and orderly, the blockade should be removed and the port opened. Asterisk. This measure was carried out by an act of parliament known in history as the Boston Port Bill. Under this law the fleet and armed power of England for the first time in this long controversy did their work. The port was actually closed, and this was the first strong measure taken to establish British sovereignty. The Patriot Party refused to allow the town to pay any damages. They said that the town had no legal power to pay them. Asterisk they also refused to punish any of the disguised persons who had destroyed the tea. The names of these persons were known to many, and have been published, comma, asterisk, asterisk, but in 1774 they were well protected by their fellow colonists. In order to keep our heads clear in considering these great events, we must remember that many of the Whigs and some of the best friends of the colonies in England, especially Colonel Barr, their eloquent defender in Parliament, were in favour of the Boston Port Bill as a just and proper punishment in the interests of good order, for the unpardonable mob violence in destroying the cargoes of peaceful British merchant vessels. I like it, said Barr, adopt and embrace it for its moderation. Franklin also, it will be remembered, was always in favor of paying for the tea as a conciliatory step to bring about a peaceable settlement. Asterisk. Englishmen argued that if such acts as destroying the tea were allowed to go unpunished, British commerce would not be safe. The Boston people, they said, can easily escape from any hardships they suffer from the closing of their port by simply paying for the tea. The punishment is not tyranny, because it is not intended to be perpetual. It will not last an hour after they make reparation. It all rests with themselves. 
it will last only until those who committed the outrage have the honor and honesty to repair it. The patriots argued that the punishment included the innocent with the guilty, and punished the whole town for the acts of a few. It was absurd, they said, to ask Boston to pay for the tea, because by closing her port the town within a few weeks lost far more than the value of the tea. Instead of such wholesale punishment, the government should proceed in the regular way in the courts of law and obtain damages, if any were due. It would certainly have been rare sport for the patriots to see the government trying to obtain verdicts from Boston juries. The closing of the port was intended to be severe, and it was severe. Within a few weeks thousands of people were out of work and threatened with starvation. Would Boston be able to hold out indefinitely? or must she at last pay for the tea and the other damage in order to have her port and livelihood restored. The people of the country districts rallied to her assistance and began sending in supplies of food. Soon this system spread to the other colonies, provisions and subscriptions in money began streaming along all the colonial roads, even from far down in the southern colonies. If this could be kept up England was beaten again for the Patriot Party in Boston would hold out against paying for the tea as long as it was possible. The supplies were continued for over a year. Five but such a contest could not be kept up indefinitely. A break would have to come, and what that break should be depended on how much rebellion and independence Massachusetts could arouse in the other colonies. The second measure of punishment was an act of Parliament accomplishing the long-threatened change in the Massachusetts Charter so that the colony could be held under control and prevented from rushing at its will to rebellion and independence. The change provided that the Governor's Council, heretofore elected by the Legislative Assembly, should be appointed by the Crown, that the Governor should appoint and remove at pleasure judges, sheriffs, and all executive officers, that the judges' salaries should be paid by the Crown instead of by the Legislature, that town meetings should be prohibited, except by permit from the Governor, that juries, instead of being elected by the inhabitants, should be selected by the sheriffs. This alteration of the charter was as fiercely denounced as the Port Bill, and the echoes of that denunciation are still repeating themselves in our history. But it did not go anything like so far as we ourselves have gone in governing dependencies. It merely made Massachusetts more of a crown colony than she had been before a sort of colony which still exists under the British system. There are today dependencies of Great Britain which have no better government than that which the alteration in the Massachusetts Charter provided, and many that have less self-government than was left to Massachusetts. But compared with the semi-independence Massachusetts had once known, and the absolute independence she was seeking, this alteration was a punishment which set her Patriot Party furious with indignation. This alteration, this withdrawal of a part of self-government, said the supporters of the ministry, is only temporary until reparation is made and peace established. William III, that great founder of liberty, once withdrew all self-government from both Maryland and Pennsylvania without even an act of parliament and George I. took the government of South Carolina into his own hands. Asterisk. Two minor measures of punishment were adopted, comma, a law providing that persons indicted by the colonists for murder in suppressing riots might be taken for trial to another county or to England, and a law legalizing the quartering of troops on the inhabitants in the town of Boston. All these measures of punishment became laws before the 1st of April, and were put in force in June, 1774. Thoroughly aroused at last to the necessity of the most strenuous endeavors, Parliament at this same time passed the famous Quebec Act. There was supposed to be danger that the French colonists in Canada might join the union that was forming to the south of them. Massachusetts and the Patriot Party had as yet done nothing to secure Canadians. It would be well, therefore, to cut off all chance of such action and accordingly the Quebec Act gave to those French people their Roman Catholic religion established by law, and the French Code of Laws. That England should establish Romanism by law in any of her possessions was certainly an extraordinary occurrence. The strong Protestant feeling in New England was outraged. The whole Patriot Party were indignant also, 
because this Quebec Act extended the boundaries of Canada down into the Ohio Valley and established what was then considered an extremely arbitrary crown colony government of a governor and council appointed by the king, without any legislature or representation of the people, and without trial by jury. Asterisk the Quebec Act was given in the Declaration of 1776 as another reason for seeking independence. The Quebec Act has sometimes been described as a bold, sagacious piece of statesmanship which saved Canada to England. But it was unnecessary, for, as we shall see, there was little or no chance of the Canadians joining the rebellious colonies, and the Act, which is still part of the Canadian Constitution, built up the power of an alien race, gave to their religion the control of the school fund and other privileges which have caused endless discord, and may in the end make Canada more French than English. Governor Hutchinson, of Massachusetts immediately after the tea episode, obtained leave of absence to visit England, and never returned. General Gage, who had just returned from New York, was made civil governor of Massachusetts and commander-in-chief of the British forces. He went out to Boston in June with four regiments, took possession of the town, and enforced the new laws. The calculation of the British ministry was that these punishments would compel Massachusetts to submit or, if she openly rebelled, she would be isolated from the rest of the country, which would not care to countenance her violence and extreme proceedings. If, on the other hand, alone and unaided, she should persist in rebellion, that would give the opportunity to teach a lesson and crush her completely by force. It was a shrewd and wise calculation, and in nine cases out of ten would have been justified by events. Great Britain has broken the independent, national spirit of not a few people by dividing them. It was a nice question, how far homogeneousness, the secret longing for independence and nationality, which was causing all this violence and law-breaking, had proceeded in the American colonies? Was it enough to bring them all, including the French in Canada, to the side of wounded, struggling Massachusetts? That daring audacious colony cried aloud for aid. She did not submit, she did not wait for the other colonies to repudiate her. She called on them for assistance. She demanded a congress of delegates from all of the colonies to consider her plight as a national question concerning them all. But the word national could not be used, for divers good reasons, so continental was used instead, and the congress is still known as the Continental Congress. It assembled in Philadelphia, September 5, 1774, for there were people in all the colonies who sympathized with Massachusetts. In some way or other the rebellious ones in all the colonies except Canada, Georgia, and Florida managed to send representatives of their feelings and opinions. The mere fact of such a body assembling was a distinct menace to British sovereignty, and brought the inevitable conflict one step nearer. The loyalists complained that this congress was created in an irregular, one-sided manner, and could not be called representative. They ridiculed and denounced most unsparingly the methods that were used. It was certainly not representative in the sense in which the word is usually understood. It was not chosen by a vote of the people at large. The delegates sent by Connecticut, by the New York counties, by New Jersey and by Maryland were chosen by the committees of correspondence without any vote of the people at large. These delegates were, therefore, merely the representatives of the Patriot movement in those colonies. The Loyalists, who were now beginning to increase in numbers, had no voice whatever. In Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Pennsylvania the delegates were chosen by the legislative assemblies, which in those provinces happened to be more or less in control of the Patriot Party. Six in Massachusetts, with the British Army now strongly in control, loyalism was gaining ground, and it is not improbable that a reactionary delegation, if not a loyalist one, would have been sent had it not been for the shrewd tactics and rather violent proceedings of Samuel Adams. The description of his cautious manipulation and final locking of the door and putting the key in his pocket, is most amusing, as well as a striking illustration of the way in which the delegates were chosen.
Asterisk the delegation sent by the Pennsylvania Assembly was in many respects a moderate one, which afterwards had to be changed for one more in sympathy with radical patriotism. It contained one member, Joseph Galloway, who was a loyalist. Apparently it was not altogether safe to let an assembly send the delegates. The surer way was for the committees of correspondence to send them. The patriots of each colony, however, decided the question for themselves according to their circumstances, and seemed to have known what they were about, for they were successful enough in every instance. South Carolina appears to have sent her delegates by a general convention of the white people of the province. These delegates were as staunch for patriotism as any that appeared. Either the loyalists were very few, or they were absent or passive. A few years afterwards they were very numerous, and seemed to have constituted fully half the population of the province. In the town of New York a vote appears to have been taken by wards, but whether only among the Patriot Party, or generally, is not determined. In New Hampshire the towns appear to have appointed deputies who met together July 2nd and chose the delegates to the Congress. The only instance where there seems to have been a chance for a perfectly free vote of all the people was in South Carolina, although there may have been a chance in New Hampshire and in the town of New York. Asterisk. Vi. The final argument. While the Congress is debating, it may be well to consider the point of development to which patriot opinion had now attained. They had abandoned their old distinction between external and internal taxes, but they kept the empty form of it in their pamphlets, even when in the same pamphlet they were arguing that Parliament had no authority at all over the colonies. In abandoning the old distinction, there was no place where they could stop short of denying all authority of Parliament. That was a serious undertaking, because they had to deny the validity not only of their own previous submissions, but also the validity of Acts of Parliament under which they had been living for many generations. At the same time they must prove that in spite of all this they were still loyal, and this clinging to the old and the new makes a great deal of the reasoning in their pamphlets obscure and confused until we have the key. We must pardon them for this obscurity, because, if England chose to enforce her laws against treason, the course they were on might prove to be a hanging business. Nevertheless, in the year 1774 they were prepared for this supreme effort to get rid of Parliament entirely. Study and reflection culminated in that year. Both sides got down to bedrock, and in this period we find the best and strongest pamphlets. They went so far that there was nothing more to be said. The argument by which the patriots professed to dispose entirely of all parliamentary authority, sweep out of existence their own damaging admissions, and also appear in the light of dutiful and loving children, was most ingenuous. Even if Parliament, they said, had taxed and regulated the colonies internally, and the colonists themselves had solemnly admitted the right, yet, in reason and on principle, Parliament had no such right. Parliament's long course of conduct regulating colonial internal affairs was a usurpation. The colonies had not resisted that usurpation, had, perhaps, not even protested much against it, because there was not a great deal of it, and as the Continental Congress put it, they were too sensible of their weakness to be fully sensible of their rights. The colonial charters were now the great subject of discussion, and the pamphleteers of both sides tore and worried at them like hungry dogs. These charters, the patriots said, contained words which cut off Parliament entirely from any control of those much discussed internal affairs, or vital organs of the colonies. Some of the charters, they said, might at first appear non-committal, or seem to say nothing directly about the authority of Parliament. But these non-committal ones often contained general expressions giving a great deal of vague authority to the colony or to its legislature, and an attempt was made to show that authority so vague and general must be exclusive and imply an extinguishment of any rights of Parliament. Queen Elizabeth's charter to Sir Walter Raleigh gave him such vast prerogatives and privileges in America, was so sweeping and general, that it must have been intended to exclude the authority of Parliament. The first Virginia Charter provided that the colony was to be ruled by such laws as the king should make, which necessarily excluded, it was said, 
the making of laws by Parliament. There was a clause which said that the colonists should have the same liberties in other British dominions as if they had been abiding and born within our realm of England which showed that the colony was a territory outside of the realm, and therefore, inferentially, outside of all authority of Parliament. The second Virginia Charter declared that all the colony's privileges were to be held of the King, which again excluded all authority of Parliament. Indeed, such charters as those of Connecticut and Rhode Island, which gave such large privileges to the colonists, and spoke only of the colonists and the king without any mention of parliament, seemed to exclude the authority of parliament. Diligent students also found instances where the action of British officials, and even of parliament itself, looked in the same direction. In April, 1621, a bill was introduced in Parliament for indulging British subjects with the privilege of fishing on the coast of America, but the House was informed through the Secretary of State, by order of His Majesty, King James, that America was not annexed to the realm, and that it was not fitting that Parliament should make laws for these countries. This was certainly strong evidence, and supported all that had been said. The evidence became stronger still when they found that some years afterwards, in the reign of Charles I, the same bill was again proposed in Parliament, and the same answer made that it was unnecessary, that the colonies were without the realm and the jurisdiction of Parliament. Asterisk. These charters and the action of high officials seemed to show that in the early days Parliament had no authority whatever over the colonies, could not tax them and could not regulate their internal affairs in any way whatsoever. The colonies were, in short, outside the realm and to be controlled only by the king. There was one charter, however, that of Pennsylvania, granted in 1681, which looked the other way. It provided in unmistakable language that the king would never levy any custom or tax on the inhabitants of the province except with the consent of the proprietors, or chief governor or assembly or by act of parliament in England that was a flat contradiction of the doctrine drawn from the other charters, and what could be done with it. Pennsylvania could surely be taxed by parliament as much as parliament pleased, and her people had no possible excuse for their rebellion except to call it by its name and fight it out. Their pamphlets defending their conduct on the ground of legal right were palpably absurd, so far as themselves were concerned. The loyalist writers used this Pennsylvania clause with great effect. The patriot writers either ignored it altogether or, like young Hamilton, boldly declared that it was a mistake, and, being inconsistent with the other documents, must be rejected. That was the only way to dispose of it, and, having done that, one might go on with the argument. The king had originally granted the charters to the colonies because in the early times Parliament had no power to charter corporations. He had also given the colonists the title to the land they were to occupy in America, for Parliament had not then the right to grant away the public domain. He had also given the colonists permission to leave the realm, a permission which at that time could be granted only by the king. These facts showed, it was said, that the colonies were exclusively the king's property, and that Parliament had nothing to do with them. They were completely outside of its jurisdiction, and were to be ruled by the king alone. This meant no rule at all, because the king had now lost nearly all his old powers, which had been absorbed by Parliament. But this thread of attachment to the king was important to save the argument from being reason. It was, of course, much ridiculed by the loyalists as well as by people in England. Asterisk. Asterisk the loyalist versifier, Bob Jingle, had some rhymes on the subject in his poem called The Association. And first and foremost we do vow affection for old England folk. As it is politic, whom we do brethren call. Allegiance to his majesty, we do profess, hut here's the joke. Whom we intend to trick. For faith, we'll starve them all. Here we have a full view of the plan of the delegates of North America, which, when examined, appears to he that of absolute independence on the mother state. But conscious that a scheme which has so great a tendency to the forfeiture of her rights, and so destructive to her safety and happiness, 
could not meet with the approbation and support of the colonists in general, unless in some measure disguised, they have endeavored to throw a veil over it, by graciously conceding to the mother state a whimsical authority, useless and impractical, in the nature. A candid examination of the mutual claims of Great Britain and the colonies, p. 27, New York, 1775. The argument was, in effect, that the colonies were independent in government and merely under the protecting influence of the king, who would keep foreign nations from interfering with them, a condition which in international law is called a protectorate. They could not be brought into subjection to parliament, because the king, as Edward Bancroft put it, had a right to constitute distinct states in America, and had so constituted the colonies. No power could unite them to the realm or to the authority of Parliament without the consent of the King and their own consent, given as formally and as solemnly as Scotland gave her consent to the union with England. Such consent, so far as the colonies were concerned, had never been given. Asterisk. This patriot argument, however, had no effect. The English and the Loyalists had an answer which swept all this learned and ingenious reasoning into the sea. All these instances of the exclusion of the authority of Parliament from the colonies occurred previous to the year 1700, not a single instance could be found after that date. In fact, a totally reverse condition could be found, for it was since that time that Parliament had been habitually regulating the internal affairs of the colonies and until quite recently the colonists had submitted to it. Those charters containing clauses impliedly excluding Parliament from the government of the colonies, and those admissions by British officials to the same effect, were previous to the Revolution of 1688, by which any power there might have been in the Crown to dispense with or abrogate laws or rights of Parliament was abolished. If the King, in granting those early charters, intended to abrogate or dispense with the taxing power or any other legislative power of parliament in the colonies, those charters were to that extent now void, because the dispensing power of the English kings had been abolished by the revolution of 1688, which put William III on the throne. In other words, the dispensing power had been abolished for nearly a hundred years, and the colonists, as good Whigs and lovers of liberty, would surely not uphold the wicked dispensing power of the Stuart kings against whom their Puritan ancestors had fought. 1. Moreover, said Englishman, the present King George III, whom the colonists pretend to be so anxious to have governed them, to the exclusion of Parliament, is King by the Act of Parliament which placed the House of Hanover on the throne. The colonists are, therefore, compelled to acknowledge that Parliament can give them a king, which is, of all other things, the highest act of sovereignty and legislative power. If Parliament has the right to give them a king, it surely has the right to tax them or rule them in every other way. Since the revolution of 1688 Parliament has become omnipotent. One hundred years ago it may have been the law that Parliament had no authority in the colonies, but within the last hundred years the law has evidently changed for Parliament has been exercising in them a great deal of authority, which the colonists cannot deny. The colonists were, therefore, asking for independence of Parliament under an ancient form of the British Constitution comma a form which had been abolished in the previous century by their friends the Whigs and William III. In the time of those old Virginia charters Parliament was of little importance and small authority. Sometimes many years passed without a parliament being held. The king was then necessarily the important power in the government. He both created and governed the colonies. Too but parliament had now become vastly more powerful. It was in session part of every year. The revolution of 1688, the steady development of ideas, the needs of a nation that was rapidly increasing its trade and commerce and adding new conquests and territories to its domain, compelled a very different, a more powerful, far-reaching parliament than that of the time of Charles I, who hated parliaments and tried to rule without them. Parliament had abolished the former powers of the king and extended itself to every part of the empire, just as today the power of parliament is sovereign and unlimited over all the British colonies. 
to suppose that there was any part of the empire to which the whole power of parliament did not extend was as absurd in 1774 as it is today. It had the same authority over the people in America that it had over the people in London. It is a contradiction, in the nature of things said one of the ablest loyalists, and as absurd as that a part should be greater than the whole, to suppose that the supreme legislative power of any kingdom does not extend to the utmost bounds of that kingdom. If these colonies, which originally belonged to England, are not now to be regulated and governed by authority of Great Britain, then the consequences are plain. They are not dependent upon Great Britain, they are not included within its territories, they are not part of its dominion. The inhabitants are not English, they can have no claim to the privileges of Englishmen, they are, with regard to England, foreigners and aliens, nay, worse as they have never been legally discharged from the duty they owe it, they are rebels and apostates. A friendly address to all reasonable Americans, p. 3, 1774. 7. The Rights of Man. The Patriot Party's definition of a colony as an independent state with its independence guaranteed and protected by the British Crown was not then, and never has been, accepted by Great Britain. A protectorate is quite distinct from a colony. To the Romans the word colony meant a conquered province, garrisoned and controlled by military authority, governed by officials sent out from Rome, and held as the property of the empire for the benefit and profit of the Roman people, very much as crown colonies are held by England. To the Greeks it meant a separate community, planted by the mother country, to become almost immediately self-sustaining and independent, and to be assisted at times in its wars by the mother country. In England the term has usually meant an outlying community of people, completely under the authority of Parliament, with no self-government at all, or with a certain amount of representative or self-government, according to circumstances, but with no view to ultimate independence. The American idea was altogether Greek. They had approximated towards it, especially in Connecticut, Rhode Island, and in early times in Massachusetts, before the French were driven from Canada. The moderate patriots were now for independence, but wishing to avoid, if possible, the question of treason and a civil war, and many of them being uncertain as to their ability to stand alone against France and Spain, or their own disunion and sectionalism, they expressed a willingness to have a protectorate from the British crown, in return for which they would assist the king in his wars by voluntarily voting him supplies in their legislative assemblies. Asterisk. While in their documents they professed to believe that England was so good and great that she would in the end take their view of the situation, most of them were well aware that there was every probability that she would reject both their definition of a colony and their definition of loyalty. They knew the weakness of their argument for entire freedom from Parliament and they sought for stronger, broader ground, an argument which would in the nature of things justify a revolution, or, if you please, rebellion, under certain circumstances. I have already intimated that they were much influenced by certain doctrines known as the rights of man. In their pamphlets we find frequent reference to those ideas and also to certain writers who were the exponents of them comma Grotius, Puffendorf, Locke, Berlamaqui, Beccaria, Montesquieu, and others. The patriots relied on these doctrines for the right which they now claimed of governing themselves independently of Parliament, with a mere protectorate from the British Crown. Two years later they relied on the same doctrines for breaking off all relations with Great Britain and establishing absolute independence. Those books and doctrines were very remarkable literature. Two of them alone. Locke's and Berlamaqui's small volumes, wrought as much harm to the cause of the British Empire as the efforts of some of the Patriot leaders. Beginning with Grotius, who was born in 1583, and ending with Montesquieu, who died in 1755, the writers mentioned covered a period of about 200 years of political investigation, thought, and experience. In fact, they covered the period since the Reformation. They represented the effect of the Reformation on political thought. They represented also all those nations whose opinions on such subjects were worth anything. Grotius was a Dutchman, Puffendorf a German, 
Locke an Englishman, Berlamaqui an Italian Swiss, and Montesquieu Frenchman. Hooker, who lived from 1553 to 1600, and whom Locke cites so freely, might be included in the number, and that would make the period quite 200 years. Hooker, in his ecclesiastical polity, declared very emphatically that governments could not be legitimate unless they rested on the consent of the governed. Locke enlarged and drew out this thought so liberally that the prevailing party in England before the revolution of 1688 thought it necessary to exile him. There were, of course, other minor writers, and the colonists relied upon them all, but seldom troubled themselves to read the works of the earlier ones, or to read Hutchinson, Clark, and other followers of that school, because Locke, Burlamaqui, and B. Carrier had summarized them all and brought them down to date. Burlamaqui's book was particularly remarkable. To this day anyone going to the Philadelphia Library, and asking for number 77, can take in his hands the identical, well-worn volume which delegates to the Congress and many an unsettled Philadelphian read with earnest, anxious minds. It was among the first books that the library had obtained, and perhaps the most important and effective book it has ever owned. Asterisk. The rebellious colonists also read Locke's two treatises on government with much profit and satisfaction to themselves. Locke was an extreme Whig, an English revolutionist of the school of 1688. Before that great event, he had been unendurable to the royalists, who were in power and had been obliged to spend a large part of his time on the continent. In the preface to his two treatises, he says that they will show how entirely legitimate is the title of William III, to the throne, because it is established on the consent of the people. That is the burden of his whole argument, comma, the consent of the people as the only true foundation of government. That principle sank so deep into the minds of the patriot colonists that it was the foundation of all their political thought, and became an essentially American idea. Beccaria, who, like Berlamaqui, was an Italian, also exercised great influence on the colonists. His famous book, Crimes and Punishments, was also a short, concise, but very eloquent volume. It caused a great stir in the world. The translation circulated in America had added to it a characteristic commentary by Voltaire. Beccaria, though not writing directly on the subject of liberty, necessarily included that subject, because he dealt with the administration of the criminal law. His plea for more humane and just punishments, and for punishments more in proportion to the offense, found a ready sympathy among the Americans who had already revolted in disgust from the brutality and extravagant cruelty of the English criminal code. But Beccaria also stated most beautifully and clearly the essential principles of liberty. His foundation doctrine, that every act of authority of one man over another for which there is not absolute necessity is tyrannical, made a most profound impression in America. He laid down also the principle that in every human society there is an effort continually tending to confer on one part the highest power and happiness, and to reduce the other to the extreme of weakness and misery. That sentence became the lifelong guide of many Americans. It became a constituent part of the minds of Jefferson and Hamilton. It can be seen as the foundation, the connecting strand, running all through the essays of the Federalist. It was the inspiration of the checks and balances in the national constitution. It can be traced in American thought and legislation down to the present time. Burlamaqui's book, devoted exclusively to the subject of liberty and independence, is still one of the best expositions of the true doctrines of natural law, or the rights of man. He belonged to a Protestant family that had once lived at Lucca, Italy, but had been compelled, like the family of Tarantini and many others, to take refuge in Switzerland. He became a professor at Geneva, which gave him the reputation of a learned man. He also became a counselor of state and was noted for his practical sagacity. He had intended to write a great work in many volumes on the subject to which he had devoted so much of his life, the principles of natural law, as it was then called. Ill health preventing such a huge task, 
he prepared a single volume, which he said was only for beginners and students, because it dealt with the bare elements of the science in the simplest and plainest language. This little book was translated into English in 1748, and contained only 300 pages, but in that small space of large, clear type, Burlamaqui compressed everything that the Patriot colonists wanted to know. He was remarkably clear and concise, and gave the Americans the qualities of the Italian mind at its best. He aroused them by his modern glowing thought and his enthusiasm for progress and liberty. His handy little volume was vastly more effective and far-reaching than would have been the blunderbuss he had intended to load to the muzzle. If we examine the volumes of Berlamaqui's predecessors, Grotius, Puffendorf, and the others, we find their statements about natural law and the rights of man rather brief, vague and general, as is usual with the old writers on any science. Berlamaqui brought them down to date, developed their principles, and swept in the results of all the thought and criticism since their day. The term natural law, which all these writers used, has long since gone out of fashion. They used it because, inspired by the Reformation, they were struggling to get away from the arbitrary system, the artificial scholasticism, the despotism of the Middle Ages. They were seeking to obtain for law and government a foundation which should grow out of the nature of things the common facts of life that everybody understood. They sought a system that, being natural, would become established and eternal like nature, a system that would displace that thing of the Middle Ages which they detested, and called arbitrary institution. Let us, they said, contemplate for a time man as he is in himself, the natural man, his wants and requirements. The only way, said Bill Lamaqui, to attain to the knowledge of that natural law is to consider attentively the nature and constitution of man, the relations he has to the beings that surround him, and the states from thence resulting. In fact, the very term of natural law and the notion we have given of it, show that the principles of this science must be taken from the very nature and constitution of man, principles of natural law, p. 156. Men naturally, he said, draw together to form societies for mutual protection and advantage. Their natural state is a state of union and society, and these societies are merely for the common advantage of all of the members. This was certainly a very simple proposition, but it had required centuries to bring men's minds back to it, and it was not altogether safe to put forth because it implied that each community existed for the benefit of itself, for the benefit of its members and not for the benefit of a prince or another nation, or for the church, or for an empire. It was a principle quickly seized upon by the Americans as soon as their difficulties began in 1765. In their early debates and discussions we hear a great deal about a state of nature, which at first seems rather meaningless to us. But it was merely their attempt to apply to themselves the fundamental principles of the Reformation. Were the colonies by the exactions and remodeling of the mother country thrown into the state of nature, where they could reorganize society afresh, on the basis of their own advantage? How much severity or how much oppression or dissatisfaction would bring about this state of nature? Was there any positive rule by which you could decide? Patrick Henry, who was always very eloquent on the subject, declared that the boundary had been passed, that the colonies were in a state of nature. Anyone who is at all familiar with the trend of thought for the last hundred years can readily see how closely this idea of going back to natural causes and first conceptions for the discovery of political principles is allied to every kind of modern progress, to the modern study of natural history, the study of the plants and animals in their natural environment, instead of by preconceived scholastic theories, the study of the human body by dissection instead of by supposition, the study of heat, light, electricity, the soil, the rocks, the ocean, the stars by actual observation, without regard to what the scriptures and learned commentators had to say. A large part of the American colonists were very far advanced in all the ideas of the Reformation. Burlamaqui's book, applying in clear everyday language these free and wonderful principles to politics and government, 
came to a large section of them as the most soul-stirring and mind-rousing message they had ever heard. It has all become trite enough to us, but to them it was fresh and marvelous. Their imaginations seized on it with the indomitable energy and passion which the climate inspired, and some who breathed the air of Virginia and Massachusetts were on fire with enthusiasm. This state of nature, argued Bill Lamarquee, is not the work of man, but established by divine institution. Natural society is a state of equality and liberty, a state in which all men enjoyed the same prerogatives, and an entire independence on any other power hut God. Poor every man is naturally master of himself, and equal to his fellow creatures so long as he does not subject himself to another person's authority by a particular convention. Principles of Natural Law, p. 38. Here we find coupled with liberty that word equality which played such a tremendous part in history for the succeeding hundred years. And we must bear in mind that what the people of that time meant by it was political equality, equality of rights, equality before the law and the government, and not equality of ability, talents, fortune, or gifts, as some have fancied. Berlamaqui not only found liberty, independence, and equality growing out of nature herself, but he argued that all this was part of the divine plan, the great order of nature and the universe. Indeed, that was what he and his Reformation predecessors had set out to discover, to unravel the system of humanity, to see if there really was a system that could be gathered from the actual plain facts, and to see also if there was a unity and completeness in this system. The human understanding, he says, is naturally right, and has within itself a strength sufficient to arrive at the knowledge of truth, and to distinguish it from error. That he announces as the fundamental principle of his book, the hinge whereon the whole system of humanity turns, and it was simply his way of restating the great doctrine of the Reformation, the right of private judgment. But he goes on to enlarge on it in a way particularly pleasing to the patriot colonists, for he says we have this power to decide for ourselves, especially in things wherein our respective duties are concerned. Yes, said the colonists, we have often thought that we were the best judges of all our own affairs. Those who feel, said Franklin, in his examination before Parliament, can best judge. The daring Berlamaqui went on to show that liberty instead of being, as some supposed, a privilege to be graciously accorded, was in reality a universal right, inherent in the nature of things. Let us consider the system of humanity, either in general or particular, we shall find that the whole is built upon this principle, reflections, deliberations, researches, actions, judgments, all suppose the use of liberty. Principles of Natural Law, p. 25. Then appears that idea common to the great leaders of thought in that age, that man's true purpose in the world is the pursuit of happiness. To this pursuit, they said, every human being has a complete right. It was part of liberty, a necessary consequence of liberty. This principle of the right to pursue happiness, which is merely another way of stating the right of self-development has played as great a part in subsequent history as equality. It is one of the foundation principles of the Declaration of Independence. It is given there as the groundwork of the right of revolution, the right of a people to throw off or destroy a power which interferes with this great pursuit, and to institute a new government, laying its foundation on such principles, and organizing its power in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. It has been interpreted in all sorts of ways comma as the right to improve your condition, to develop your talents, to grow rich, or to rise into the class of society above you. It is now in its broadest meaning so axiomatic in this country that Americans can hardly realize that it was ever disputed. But it was, and still is, disputed in England and on the continent. Even so liberal a man as Kingsley resented with indignation the charge that he favored the aspiration of the lower classes to change their condition. Once a coupler, remain a coupler, and be content to be a good coupler. In other words, the righteousness which he so loudly professed was intended to exalt certain fortunate individuals, and not to advance society. 
this desire and pursuit of happiness being part of nature, or part of the system of providence, and as essential to every man and as inseparable from him as his reason, it should be freely allowed him, and not repressed. This, Berlamaqui declares, is a great principle, the key of the human system opening to vast consequences for the world. The consequences have certainly been vast, comma, vaster far than he dreamed of. Millions of people now live their daily life under the shadow of this doctrine. Millions have fled to us from Europe to seek its protection. Not only the whole American system of laws, but whole philosophies and codes of conduct have grown up under it. The abolitionists appealed to it, and freed six millions of slaves. The transcendental philosophy of New England, that extreme and beautiful attempt to develop conscience, nobility, and character from within, that call of the great writers like Lowell to every humble individual to stand by his own personality, fear it not, advance it by its own lines, even our education, the elective system of our colleges, comma, all these things have followed under that pursuit of happiness which the rebel colonists seized upon so gladly in 1765 and enshrined in their Declaration of Independence in 1776. They found in the principles of natural law how government, civil society, or sovereignty as those writers were apt to call it, was to be built up and regulated. Civil government did not destroy natural rights and the pursuit of happiness. On the contrary, it was intended to give these rights greater security and a fresh force and efficiency. That was the purpose men had in coming together to form a civil society for the benefit of all. That was the reason, as Berlamaqui put it, that the sovereign became the depository, as it were, of the will and strength of each individual. This seemed very satisfactory to some of the colonists. You choose your sovereign, your government, for yourself, and make it your mere depository or agent. Then as to the nature of government, the right to govern, they were very much pleased to find that the only right there was of this sort was the right of each community to govern itself. Government by outside power was absolutely indefensible because the notion that there was a divine right in one set of people to rule over others was exploded nonsense, and the assertion that mere might or superior power necessarily gave such right was equally indefensible. There remained only one plausible reason, and that was that superior excellence, wisdom, or ability might possibly give such right. As to this superior excellence theory, if you admitted it you denied man's inherent right to liberty equality, and the pursuit of happiness, you denied his moral accountability and responsibility, you crippled his independent development, his self-development, his individual action, in a word, you destroyed the whole natural system. Because a man is inferior to another is no reason why he should surrender his liberty, his accountability, his chance for self-development, to the superior. We do not surrender our property to the next man who is an able business manager. Our inferiority does not give him a right over us. On the contrary, the inferiority of the inferior man is an additional reason why he should cling to all those rights of nature which have been given to him, that he may have wherewithal to raise himself, and be alone accountable for himself. Or, as Berlamaqui briefly summarized it, the knowledge I have of the excellency of a superior does not alone afford me a motive sufficient to subject myself to, and to induce me to abandon my own will in order to take his for my rule, and without any reproach of conscience I may sincerely judge that the intelligent principle within me is sufficient to direct my conduct. Principles of Natural Law, p. 86. Moral Obligation, Moral Responsibility, Codes, Conduct, Life happiness, development, and progress, he again shows, grow out of this right of private judgment, this right of individualism, the great Protestant principle, which within the last 150 years has brought such vast advancement and comfort to all nations that have adopted it. No one has a natural inherent right to command or to exercise dominion. It is merely a privilege which may be granted by the people. They alone have inherent and alienable rights, and they alone can confer the privilege of commanding. It had been supposed that the sovereign alone had rights, and the people only privileges. 
but here were Berlamaqui, Pufiendorf, Montesquieu, Locke, and fully half the American colonists, undertaking to reverse this order and announcing that the people alone had rights, and the sovereign merely privileges. True sovereignty was then, in a word, a superior and wise power accepted as such by reason, or, as the Americans afterwards translated it in their documents, a just government exists only by consent of the governed. All men being born politically equal, the colonies, as Dickinson and Hamilton explained, are equally with Great Britain entitled to happiness, equally entitled to govern themselves, equally entitled to freedom and independence. 3. It is curious to see the cautious, careful way in which some of the colonists applied these doctrines by mixing them up with their loyalty arguments. This is very noticeable in the pamphlets written by Alexander Hamilton. He gives the stock arguments for redress of grievances, freedom from internal taxation, government by the king alone, and will not admit that he is anything but a loyal subject. At the same time there runs through all he says an undercurrent of strong rebellion which leads to his ultimate object. The power, he says, which one society bestows upon any man or body of men can never extend beyond its own limits. This he lays down as a universal truth, independently of charters and the wonderful British constitution. It applied to the whole world. Parliament was elected by the people of England, therefore it had no authority outside of the British Isle. That British Isle and America were separate societies. Nature, said Hamilton, has distributed an equality of rights to every man. How then, he asked, can the English people have any rights over life, liberty, or property in America? They can have authority only among themselves in England. We are separated from Great Britain. Hamilton argued, not only by the ocean, by geography, but because we have no part or share in governing her. Therefore, as we have no share in governing her, she, by the law of nature, can have no share in governing us, she is a separate society. The British, he said, were attempting to involve in the idea of a colony the idea of political slavery, and against that a man must fight with his life. To be controlled by the superior wisdom of another nation was ridiculous, unworthy of the consideration of manhood, and at this point he used that sentence which has so often been quoted, deplorable is the condition of that people who have nothing else than the wisdom and justice of another to depend upon. 4. Charters and documents, he declared, must yield to natural law and the rights of man. The sacred rights of men are not to be rummaged for among old parchments or musty records. They are written as with a sunbeam in the whole volume of human nature by the hand of divinity itself and can never be erased by mortal power. The Declaration of Independence was an epitome of these doctrines of natural law applied to the colonies. The Declaration of Independence originated in those doctrines, and not in the mind of Jefferson, as so many people have absurdly supposed. In order to see how directly the Declaration was an outcome of these teachings, we have only to read its opening paragraphs. When, in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume, among the powers of the earth, the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That, to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that, Whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it, and to institute a new government, laying its foundation on such principles, and organizing its powers in such form, as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Prudence, indeed, will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes, and, accordingly, all experience hath shown, that mankind are more disposed to suffer, while evils are sufferable.
than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. By understanding the writings of Burlamaqui, Locke, and Vicaria, which the colonists were studying so intently, we know the origin of the declaration, and need not flounder in the dark, as so many writers have done, wondering where it came from, or how it was that Jefferson could have invented it. Being unwilling to take the trouble of examining carefully the influences which preceded the declaration, historical students are sometimes surprised to find a document like the Virginia Bill of Rights or the supposed Mecklenburg Resolutions, five issued before the declaration and yet containing the same principles. They instantly jump to the conclusion that here is the real origin and author of the declaration, and from this Jefferson stole his ideas. Jefferson drafted the Declaration, but neither he, John Adams, Franklin, Sherman, nor Livingston, who composed the committee which was responsible for it, ever claimed any originality for its principles. They were merely stating principles which were already familiar to the people, so familiar that they stated them somewhat carelessly and took too much for granted. It would have been better, instead of saying, all men are created equal that they had said all men are created politically equal, which was what they meant, and what everyone at that time understood. By leaving out the word politically they gave an opportunity to a generation unfamiliar with the doctrines of natural law to suppose that they meant that all men are created, or should be made, equal in conditions, opportunities, or talents. British writers, and some Americans, anxious to secure the favorable regard of Englishmen, have in recent years been fond of asserting that the Patriot colonists took their ideas of liberty and the principles of the Declaration of Independence from the writings of Rousseau. But after reading hundreds of pamphlets and arguments of the revolutionary period, I cannot find Rousseau or any French writer of his sort cited with approval by any of the colonists. They confine themselves entirely to the school of writers already mentioned. In the pamphlets written by loyalists there is no charge that the colonists were influenced by Rousseau. Peter Van Schack, the loyalist whose memoirs and letters have come down to us, followed the arguments of the patriot portion of the colonists very closely. He notes the books which they were reading and which influenced them. He would have been very quick to notice and comment on Rousseau, if the colonists had been reading him. But he nowhere mentions such influence. 6. Writers who are out of sympathy with American ideas very naturally want to fasten the influence of Rousseau upon us, and connect our principles in some way with the horrors of the French Revolution. Rousseau was an immoral, eccentric, and violent man, and his view of liberty colonists seem to have been totally uninfluenced by these Frenchmen, who were carrying liberty to a ridiculous extreme in their attack on the corrupt and loathsome social system of France. The Americans, on the other hand, had no such problem to deal with. They had nothing against their own social system. On the contrary, they liked it so well that they were fighting for the independence of it. 8. A reign of terror for the loyalists. It was not merely in final arguments that the year 1774 was a crisis. The patriots were in an extreme and passionate state of mind. Their violence to the loyalists increased and showed the typical symptoms of a revolution. The loyalists were becoming more decided and outspoken, and events seemed to be increasing their numbers. The rough element in the Patriot Party looked upon them as enemies to be broken up and disorganized as quickly as possible. Disarming parties visited loyalist houses and took away all the weapons, and it was a method well calculated to check union and organization and prevent the loyalists from taking advantage of their numbers. Such a method would not perhaps be so effective in modern times when firearms are so cheap and easy to procure. If the loyalists had formed some sort of organization among themselves, appointed their committees of safety, as the patriots did, kept their weapons, instead of giving them up at the patriot demand, resisted, or taken the offensive, instead of waiting passively for the action of the British army, or, if the British army had been more prompt and active in assisting them, they might have altered the course of history. If they had been as full of the American atmosphere of energy and organization as were the patriots, they might have got the start with the disarming, 
and worked it to the suppression of the rebellion. But the patriots were inspired and wrought to the highest pitch of energy by the rights of man. They not only seized the loyalist arms, but took possession of most of the colony governments. The loyalists had no inspiring ideas. They could talk only of the British Empire and the regular army. There were, it is true, numerous scattering attempts at loyalist organization in the interior of the Carolinas, in the peninsula between the Delaware and the Chesapeake, in Monmouth County, New Jersey, and near Albany and in Westchester County, New York. In some of these places they resisted disarming, held their own, and took their turn at violent methods, cutting the manes and tails of patriot horses and throwing down patriot fences. In the south they were more successful and more murderous in their dealings with the patriots. But their plans were not generally adopted by their fellow loyalists throughout the country. They lacked the indomitable energy of the patriots. In their scattered, individualized condition they became more and more the prey of the rough element among their opponents. Everywhere they were seized unexpectedly, at the humor of the mob, tarred and feathered, paraded through the towns, or left tied to trees in the woods. Any accidental circumstance would cause these visitations, and often the victim was not as politically guilty as some of his neighbors who, by prudence or accident, remained unharmed to the end of the war. Those patriots of the upper classes who for many years had been rousing the masses of the people to resist the principle of taxation and all authority of parliament were now somewhat aghast at the success of their work. The patriot colonists, when aroused, were lawless, and, while clamoring for independence, violated in a most shocking manner the rights of personal liberty and property. In the South, as soon as the rebellion party got a little control, a loyalist might be locked up in the jail for the mere expression of his opinion, and in the North, too, when the rebellion party got control in a county they were apt to use the jail to punish loyalists. Out with him! Out with him! shouted the mob, as they rushed after Francis Green into the inn at Norwich, Connecticut, where he was taking refuge. He had already been driven out of Wyndham. They tumbled him into his own carriage, lashed his horses, and, shouting and yelling, chased him out of Norwich. What was his crime? He had signed the farewell address to Governor Hutchinson, of Massachusetts. In Berkshire, Massachusetts, in that same summer of 1774, the mob forced the judges from their seats and shut up the courthouse, drove David Ingersoll from his house, and laid his lands and fences waste, they riddled the house of Daniel Leonard with bullets and drove him to Boston, they attacked Colonel Gilbert, of Freetown, in the night, but he fought them off. That same night Brigadier Buggies fought off a mob, but they painted his horse and cut off its mane and tail. Afterwards they robbed his house of all the weapons in it and poisoned his other horse. They stopped the judges in the highway, insulted them, hissed them as they entered court. The house of Sewell, Attorney General of Massachusetts, was wrecked, Oliver, President of the Council, was mobbed and compelled to resign, an armed mob of 5,000 at Worcester compelled the judges, sheriffs, and gentlemen of the bar to march up and down before them, cap in hand, and read thirty times their disavowal of holding court under Parliament. In a similar way the court at Taunton was handled by the mob, also at Springfield and Plymouth and Great Barrington. Loyalists everywhere were driven from their houses and families, some being obliged to take to the woods, where they nearly lost their lives. One Dunbar, who had bought fat cattle from a loyalist was, for that offence, put into the belly of one of the oxen that had been dressed, carted four miles, and deprived of four head of cattle and a horse. Men were ridden and tossed on fence rails, were gagged and bound for days at a time, pelted with stones fastened in rooms where there was a fire with the chimney stopped on top, advertised as public enemies, so that they would be cut off from all dealing with their neighbors. They had bullets shot into their bedrooms, money or valuable plate extorted to save them from violence and on pretense of taking security for their good behavior. Their houses and ships were burned, they were compelled to pay the guards who watched them in their houses 
and when carted about for the mob to stare at and abuse they were compelled to pay something at every town. In the cases of rich loyalists the expenses put upon them were very heavy. Mr. James Christie, a merchant of Baltimore, after narrowly escaping with his life, had to pay nine shillings per day to each of the men who guarded his house, and was ordered to pay five hundred pounds to the Revolutionary Convention to be expended occasionally towards his proportion of all charges and expenses, incurred or to be incurred, for the defense of America during the present contest. Some of us perhaps have read of the treatment of the Reverend Samuel Seabury, afterwards the first bishop of the Protestant Episcopal Church in the United States. His house was invaded by the mob, his daughters insulted, their lives threatened, bayonets thrust through their caps, and all the money and silverware in the house taken. Seabury himself was paraded through New Haven and imprisoned for a month. Afterwards he and some other loyalists fled for their lives, and lived in a secret room, behind the chimney, in a private house, where they were fed by their friends through a trap door. In South Carolina the mob, in one instance, after applying the tar and feathers, display their southern generosity and politeness by scraping their victim clean, instead of turning him adrift, as was usually done, to go home to his wife and family in his horrible condition or seek a pitiable refuge at the house of a friend, if he could find one. Of the few who objected, to the Charleston Association, there were only two who were hardy enough to ridicule or treat it with contempt, comma, viz, Lachlan, Martin and John Dealey, comma, on which account. Yesterday they were carted through the principal streets of the town in complete suits of tar and feathers. The very indecent and daring behaviors of the two culprits in several instances occasioned their being made public spectacles of. After having been exhibited for about half an hour, and having made many acknowledgments of their crime, they were conducted home, cleaned, and quietly put on board of Captain Lasley's ship. American Archives, 4th Series, 2. P. 922. It would be a comparatively easy task to collect from the records instances of this sort, entirely omitted from regulation histories, but which, if given in their full details, would fill a good sized volume, for the three months, July, August, and September, of the year 1774, one can find in the American archives alone over 30 descriptions of outrages of this sort. Asterisk. If we went on collecting instances and used besides the volumes of the American archives the numerous other sources of information, and carried the search through all the years when these things were done, there would be an enormous mass of instances. But we would not then have them all for there must have been countless instances of violence to loyalists which were not recorded in print. Like the other instances, they played their part, were well known by common report, contributed towards forming opinion and action in the great problem, and now, being unpleasant or inconvenient to remember, have passed out of human recollection as though they had never happened. Many saved themselves by yielding, by resigning the offices they held under British authority or by writing out a humiliating apology and reading it aloud, or letting it be published in the newspapers. When this system of terrorism was once well underway, there was a crop of these recantations everywhere. But we do not always know from the records the severity by which these recantations were forced. Loyalists would often resist for a time before subjecting themselves to the ignominy of a recantation. In one instance 29 loyalists were carried about by a party of militia for several days from town to town. They were told that they were to be put in the Sunbury mines, which were damp, underground passages for mining copper in Connecticut, not far from Hartford. These mines were often used for terrorizing loyalists. The 29 were exhibited, hectored, and tormented until before they reached the mines the last one had humbled himself by a public confession and apology. As time went on there were comparatively few who, when visited by the mob, did not finally make a public apology, because, although that was bad enough, they knew that in the end there was the far worse infamy and torture of the tar and feathers. There were few men of any position or respectability, and it was men of this sort who were usually attacked, 
who could bear the thought or survive the infliction of that process, unless they afterwards left the country altogether. To be stripped naked, smeared all over with disgusting black pitch, the contents of two or three pillows rubbed into it, and in that condition to be paraded through the streets of the town for neighbors and acquaintances to stare at, was enough to break down very daring spirits. One could never tell when an angry mob might rush to this last resource. On August 24, 1774, a mob at New London were carrying off Colonel Willard, when he agreed to apologize and resign his office. But the account goes on to say. One Captain Davis, of Brimfield, was present, who showing resentment, and treating the people with had language, was stripped, and honored with the new fashioned dress of tar and feathers, a proof this that the act for tarring and feathering is not repealed. American Archives, 4th Series, I. 731. When we consider that this mob rule was steadily practiced for a period of more than ten years, it is not surprising that it left an almost indelible mark on our people. They seem to have acquired from it that fixed habit now called lynch law, which is still practiced among us in many parts of the country in a most regular and systematic manner, and participated in by respectable people. The term lynch law originated in the method of handling the loyalists in the revolution, and was named from the brother of the man who founded Lynchburg in Virginia. By the year 1775 the patriot portion of the people had grown so accustomed to dealing with the loyalists by means of the mob, that they regarded it as a sort of established and legalized procedure. In New Jersey we find an account of the tar and feathers inflicted on a loyalist closing with the words, the whole was conducted with that regularity and decorum that ought to be observed in all public punishments. Asterisk. Looking back at it with the long perspective the present gives, we can say that these things were the passion for independence, the instinct of nationality seizing for itself a country of its own, without violence if it could but with the worst violence if it must. England, however, was not inclined to take that view. The greater the number of such occurrences, the more numerous became the Englishmen who were convinced that the colonies needed not more liberty, but more systematic government and control. The loyalists in America believed that such outrages increased their own numbers and made it more and more certain that they were, as they claimed to be, a majority of the people. The vast number of written and spoken apologies were nearly all insincere, even the oaths that were taken were nearly all considered as not binding by the victims, because obtained by threats or violence. They were often forced to take the oaths to save their children from beggary and ruin, and openly gave this as an excuse. As for the liberty of the press, it was at the close of the year 1775 completely extinguished and this increased and encouraged the enemies of the colonies in England. James Rivington, of New York, who printed and published many of the Loyalist pamphlets, was boycotted and assailed by town and village committees until, though he apologized and humbled himself, he narrowly escaped with his life, and finally took refuge on a British man of war. Prominent men among the rebel party regretted these things and worried over them, but all to no effect. The loyalists were so numerous, possibly a majority, and might effect so much if they organized themselves, that it was a great temptation to let the rough and wild element among the patriots go on with its work and keep the loyalists broken up and terrorized. John Adams had the enormity and cruelty of such conduct brought home to him very closely, for he was counsel in a famous case in which one of the victims, Richard King, attempted to have legal redress against the mob. A party of people disguised as Indians broke into King's store and house as early in the difficulties with England as March 16, 1766. They destroyed all the books and papers relating to his business, laid waste his property, and threatened his life if he should seek redress. Seven or eight years afterwards, in 1774, the mob assailed him again because one of his cargoes of lumber, without any fault of his, had been purchased by the British Army in Boston. Forty men visited him on this occasion, and, by threatening his life, compelled him to disavow his loyalist opinions. 
he shortly afterwards went insane and died. The terror and distress, the distraction and horror of his family, writes John Adams to his wife, cannot be described in words or meant, sacrificed every penny of their property, and from positions of importance and prominence in the colonies they retired to England to be submerged into insignificance and poverty, or they retired to Canada where their descendants can still be found working with their hands, or struggling back into the position their ancestors occupied more than a hundred years ago. The disastrous effects of the rise of the lower orders of the people into power appeared everywhere, leaving its varied and peculiar characteristics in each community, but New England suffered least of all. In Virginia its work was destructive and complete, for all that made Virginia great, and produced her remarkable men, was her aristocracy of tobacco planters. This aristocracy forced on the revolution with heroic enthusiasm against the will of the lower classes, little dreaming that they were forcing it on to their own destruction. But in 1780 the result was already so obvious that Chase de Lux, the French traveller, saw it with the utmost clearness, and in his book he prophesies Virginia's gradual sinking into the insignificance which we have seen in our time. Even in Massachusetts, where the dreaded class accomplished less evil than anywhere else, the prospect of their rule seemed so terrible that the strongest of the patriots were often shaken in their purpose. How it fretted and unnerved John Adams we know full well, for he has confessed it in his diary. A man in Massachusetts one day congratulated him on the anarchy, the mob violence, the insults to judges, the closing of the courts, and the tar and feathers which the patriots and their congress were producing. Oh, Mr. Adams, what great things have you and your colleagues done for us? We can never be grateful enough to you. There are no courts of justice now in this province, and I hope there never will be another. Adams for once in his life could not reply. Is this the object for which I have been contending, said I to myself, for I rode along without any answer to this wretch, are these the sentiments of such people, and how many of them are there in the country? Half the nation, for what I know J for half the nation are debtors, if not more, and these have been in all countries the sentiments of debtors. If the power of the country should get into such hands, and there is a great danger that it will, to what purpose have we sacrificed our time, health, and everything else? Works of John Adams, Volume 2. p. 420. If the loyalists could come back from the grave, they would probably say that their fears and prophecies had been fulfilled in the most extraordinary manner, sometimes literally, in most cases substantially. There is no question that the revolution was followed by a great deal of bad government, political corruption, sectional strife, coarseness in manners, hostility to the arts and refinements of life, assassination, lynch law and other things which horrified Englishmen and afforded the stock material for the ridicule of such writers as Dickens and Mrs. Montague. The descendants of the Loyalists, whom our passion for independence scattered in Canada and the British Empire, find plenty of material for their purpose, and they have often said that we reaped the evil fruit of our self-will and blindness, that we would have been better governed, life and property would have been safer, living more comfortable and all the arts of life more flourishing, if we had remained colonies of the British Empire instead of becoming an independent nation. If you had remained under Great Britain, you would be free from the scourge of lynch law with its two hundred victims every year, you would be free from the burning of negroes at the stake, and from the wholesale murder and assassinations which have prevailed in parts of your country. Such conditions are unknown under British rule. By remaining under Great Britain you would have avoided the Civil War of 1861, with all its train of evils, the long years of misgovernment which preceded it when the slaves were escaping to the free states, and the frightful misgovernment of the carpetbag and reconstruction period, because all your slaves would have been set free and their owners paid their value in 1833, when slavery was abolished by England in all her colonies. In a similar way you would have escaped your vast political corruption and the disgraceful misgovernment of your large cities. You made a mistake when you broke up the British Empire in 1776. 
the Patriots of 1776, however, believed that they had ideas to contribute, and a mission to accomplish in spite of bad government, or through bad government, as every other nation and individual has done. They were seized with the spirit of independence, and believed that as a separate people they had an inalienable right to rule themselves, and, if they chose, rule themselves badly. Liberty without independence to decide what their liberty or what their development should be was of little value in their eyes. 9. The real intention as to independence. I have described the Patriot Party as moving towards independence, and had given many instances to show that that was their intention. Sometimes the intention, though partially veiled, was notorious, as in the case of such men as Samuel Adams. Sometimes it was openly expressed, as in such newspapers as the Boston Gazette, and very often it was nourished in secret, or the individuals who entertained it were scarcely conscious of how far they were going, or were timid and hesitating about the risks to be run. If we assume that the Patriots really thought that England would frankly approve of all they were doing, repeal to order her Acts of Parliament, and give the colonists what they wanted, we must suppose them to have been very childlike. Such sublime confidence that England would see the great question exactly as they saw it would have been very beautiful and touching. There may have been some who attained this romantic state of mind. As the loyalists idealized the strength and power of England, believed it irresistible, and believed it also beneficial, and lovable even as a conqueror, and were willing to accept it as a conqueror without any guarantees or securities for their own liberties, so these childlike rebels on their side may have idealized it as too strong, too magnanimous and just to be other than as liberal and freedom-loving as themselves. Many of them perhaps had hardly yet become aware that in living by themselves for nearly two hundred years they had grown into a totally different moral fiber, and that although they used the same language and laws, and the same furniture and linen as the English, swore the same oaths and drank the same toasts as England, they were in character and principle as far removed from the majority of her people as though they belonged to another race. Unconsciously they had been wrought by climate, association, and environment into a distinct and different people, a people of keener, broader intelligence, and more determined energy and courage. They were already a separate people without fully knowing it. The inward struggles of some of the loyalists who had become partially Americanized without knowing it were very pathetic. Kerwin and Vanshack, both of whom sought refuge in England, reveal this all through their diaries and letters. In America their imaginations had been fed with pleasing tales of the charms of English life and the honor and liberal intentions of British statesmen. They were both bitterly disappointed. Van Schack completely changed his opinions of the political intentions of the British government towards the colonies. Kerwin, dealing more in details of everyday life, laments its discomfort and unhappiness. The fires here, he says, are not to be compared to our large American ones of oak and walnut, nor near so comfortable. Would that I was away. He had thought he was going home, as some of the colonists with strange simplicity called England but he says he finds himself in a country of aliens. He was treated with arrogance and contempt. He was told to his face that Americans were a sort of serfs. He was expected to be servile and subservient. London he calls a sad lick penny and he is heartily tired of it. Asterisk. Both he and Vanshack, and their fathers before them, had lived so long in the colonies that in heart and habit they were Americanized beyond recall but by study at a distance they had so convinced their minds, or imaginations, of the splendor of the British Empire that when their fellow colonists doubted the immaculateness of British rule, and, above all, when they thought they could govern themselves without it, the ludicrousness of the suggestion was overwhelming. In describing the different ways in which the growing sense or instinct of a separate nationality was affecting the people, it is due to my readers to say that some Americans have denied that there was any feeling of this sort. They have denied most positively that there was any desire for independence, and have adopted the modern English opinion that independence was forced upon us suddenly against our will. 
For my part one find it difficult to understand how a million or more colonists could suddenly decide on a dash for independence, maintain the struggle for seven years, refusing every proposal for peace that offered less than absolute independence, unless they had been passionately nourishing that idea for a long period of time. But, if we are to believe certain statesmen and historians, they not only did not entertain such an idea for any long period, but detested the thoughts of it until the summer of 1776, and then shed tears over it. Of course, it is true that all the Patriot documents are ml of profuse expressions of the most devoted loyalty, and the leaders were constantly putting forth these profuse expressions. If such assertions are proof, it is easy enough to accumulate great numbers of them. In feet, judged by their documents, the nearer the Patriots approached to the year 1776, the more devoted, loving, and loyal they became. If we can accept their own account of themselves, they were more loyal than the Tories in England. Washington, while attending the Congress at Philadelphia, wrote to a loyalist, October 9, 1774. Give me leave to add, and I think I can announce it as a fact, that it is not the wish or interest of that government, Massachusetts, or any other upon this continent, separately or collectively, to set up for independence. Works, Ford edition of 1889, Volume 2. p. 443. That was a safe statement, because it spoke of the governments of the colonies, not of a party or individuals. The government of Massachusetts was at that time under the military control of General Gage and the Loyalists, and certainly had not the slightest intention of attempting independence. None of the colony governments, as governments, had any wish at that time to make such an attempt. Some of them were in the hands of moderates or Loyalists, and it would not have been for the interest even of those in the hands of Patriots to make any move for independence. It was too dangerous and too impractical, the time had not, in the opinion of any, yet arrived. As to what the government formed by the rebel party in Massachusetts wanted to do about independence, we shall see when we come to treat of the Suffolk resolutions. Washington's statement refers only to what would be outwardly and openly done, and in that respect is entirely correct. It is entirely consistent with a determination in his heart and in the hearts of thousands of others, to make a break for independence at the first opportunity. Franklin, in England, in August, 1774, was talking with Lord Chatham about American affairs. His lordship favoured the withdrawal of troops and very liberal treatment of the Americans. But he said it had been reported that they aimed at statehood and independence, and to that he was unalterably opposed. Franklin replied with the very sweeping assertion that has been so often quoted. I assured him that having more than once travelled almost from one end of the continent to the other, and kept a great variety of company, eating, drinking, and conversing with them freely, I never had heard in any conversation from any person, drunk or sober, the least expression of a wish for a separation, or hint that such a thing would be advantageous to America. Works. Bigelow Edition, Volume V. pp. 445-446. But the word independence had several meanings. Franklin says that he had never heard the colonists wish for a separation, or hint that such a thing would be advantageous if questioned closely, he and they would have said that they did not wish to be absolutely separated, they wished merely to be separated from Parliament and retain such a connection with the Crown that it would be a protectorate for them against other nations. This was the old device to which they all tightly clung, and, under the circumstances, we cannot blame them. When Franklin made that sweeping statement to Lord Chatham in 1774, he had been away from America for ten years, and he could have said that he was speaking of his experiences before the French war closed. It was a statement of diplomacy, and Franklin was in a delicate position. Lord Chatham and a large section of the Whigs, who were straining every nerve to restore themselves to office and power by means of the disturbances in America, were obliged, of course, to base their assistance of the Americans on the understanding that those rebels were seeking merely a redress of grievances, and not absolute independence. 
Franklin's whole course of conduct in England was devoted to assisting the Whig party. He believed that if that party could get into power they would be very favorably inclined towards the Patriots. But if he once, for a moment, admitted that the Patriots were bent on independence, his usefulness to the Whigs was gone. It is difficult to believe that Franklin meant to say that there was no general movement for independence either absolute, as advocated by men like Samuel Adams and newspapers like the Boston Gazette, or modified, as advocated by the moderate patriots who seemed to be willing to accept an independence which would leave the American community's distinct states, entirely free from all control of parliament, and attached to England only by the slight thread of a protectorate against foreign invasions. If he intended to make a complete and absolute denial, he is contradicted by a great deal of evidence. I have already, in the first chapter, cited the passage from Calm, who travelled in the colonies in 1748, and described the movement for independence as so advanced that the people were prophesying a total separation within thirty or fifty years, which prophecy was literally fulfilled. Franklin himself, in 1766, two years after he went to England, had received a letter from Joseph Galloway describing the plans for independence. A certain sect of people, if I may judge from their late conduct, seem to look on this as a favorable opportunity of establishing their republican principles, and of throwing off all connection with their mother country. Many of their publications justify the thought. Besides, I have other reasons to think that they are not only forming a private union among themselves from one end of the continent to the other, but endeavoring also to bring into this union the Quakers and all other dissenters, if possible. Sparks Franklin, Volume 7. p. 803. This letter is dated January 13, 1766. John Wesley, in one of his pamphlets, says that his brother visited the colonies in 1737, and reported the most serious people and men of consequence almost continually crying out we must be independent, we shall never be well until we shake off the English yoke. One Galloway, in his examination before the House of Commons, testified that there had been a considerable number of persons who advocated independence in the principal towns of the colonies as early as 1754. Dr. Elliot writing to England, in 1767, says, we are not ripe for disunion, but our growth is so great that in a few years Great Britain will not be able to compel our submission. 2. That very plain-spoken Englishman, Dean Tucker, writing in 1774, took a common-sense view when he said, it is the nature of them all, e. colonies, to aspire after independence and to set up for themselves as soon as ever they find they are able to subsist without being beholden to the mother country, and if our Americans have expressed themselves sooner on this head than others have done, or in a more direct and daring manner, this ought not to be imputed to any greater malignity. The true interest of Great Britain set forth, p. 12. C. Also, Stedman, American War, Volume I. p. 1. London, 1794. That maker of sweeping phrases, John Adams, has often been quoted to show that there was no desire for independence, and that it was resorted to at last with regret and tears. There was not a moment during their revolution when I would not have given everything I possessed for a restoration to the state of things before the contest began, provided we could have had a sufficient security for its continuance. This statement was made in 1821, long after the revolution was over, and is one of those carefully hedged generalities which public men know how to make when they wish to appear to have always been conservative. In his helpless moments during the long contest, Adams no doubt often thought that he would give everything he possessed to go back to the old times, for if things went on as they were going, he soon might not have anything to possess, not even the head on his shoulders. He saves his statement by the proviso that there must be sufficient security for the continuance of the old times. There was the rub. England would not give that security. The only security, as Adams well knew, was independence. His statement, moreover, 
bears quite a different meaning when the whole passage in which it occurs is read. There is great ambiguity in the expression, there existed in the colonies a desire of independence. It is true there always existed in the colonies a desire of independence of parliament, in the articles of internal taxation, and internal policy, and a very general if not a universal opinion, that they were constitutionally entitled to it, and as general a determination if possible to maintain, and defend it j but there never existed a desire of independence of the crown, or of general regulations of commerce, for the equal and impartial benefit of all parts of the empire. It is true there might be times and circumstances in which an individual, or a few individuals, might entertain and express a wish that America was independent in all respects, but these were rare not in Gurdjieff Vasto. For example in 1756, 7 and 8, the conduct of the British generals Shirley, Braddock, Loudon, Webb and Abercrombie was so absurd, disastrous, and destructive, that a very general opinion prevailed that the war was conducted by a mixture of ignorance, treachery and cowardice, and some persons wished we had nothing to do with Great Britain forever. Of this number I distinctly remember, I was myself one, fully believing that we were able to defend ourselves against the French and Indians, without any assistance or embarrassment from Great Britain. In 58 and 59, when Amherst and Wolfe changed the fortune of the war, by a more able and faithful conduct of it, I again rejoiced in the name of Britain, and should have rejoiced in it. To this day, had not the King and Parliament committed high treason and rebellion against America as soon as they had conquered Canada, and made peace with France. That there existed a general desire of independence of the crown in any part of America before the revolution, is as far from the truth, as the zenith is from the Cadia. That the encroaching disposition of Great Britain was early foreseen by many wise men, in all the states, that it, would one day attempt to enslave them by an unlimited submission to Parliament, and rule them with a rod of iron, that this attempt would produce resistance on the part of America, and an awful struggle was also foreseen, but dreaded and deprecated as the greatest calamity that could befall them. For my own part, there was not a moment during the revolution, when I would not have given everything I possessed for a restoration to the state of things before the contest began, provided we could have had any sufficient security for its continuance. I always dreaded the revolution as fraught with ruin to me and my family, and indeed it has been but little better. New England Historical and Genealogical Register, 1876, Volume 30. p. 829. There we have it all, the whole story, and the old device of the king alone to which they always clung to save an ex in case of failure. It should be observed that Adams says that he and his party were for independence in 1756-58, and this should be compared with the statements made by Franklin and others. Then he says that he became loyal, and would have remained a really good boy if it had not been for something that happened common namely, that Parliament committed high treason and rebellion against America, which is a delightful way of putting it, and very characteristic of the Adams family. It should also be remembered that although Adams says that the patriots were entirely willing to remain under the king alone, yet when this very condition was offered to them by the peace commissioners in 1778, they voted against it, and Adams himself was more ardent than any of them in opposing it. His final statement that the revolution ruined him is very amusing. The revolution was the making of him, and without it, he would have remained insignificant but he never got enough of anything, and he always considered himself abused. The truth is that, like many others, he was a rebel hot for independence from the day of his birth to the day of his death. His independence party was small before the year 1760, but it steadily grew, and was most diligently and shrewdly worked up and encouraged by himself, his cousin, and the other leaders. It was impossible for a man of his stamp to belong to any other party. They used to tell an apocryphal story about him which even if not true is very characteristic. When he lay dying at the great age of ninety-one, they roused him for a moment in order to hear his last words. The old hero was taken off his guard and had no time to hedge. 
independence forever, he said, and sank back dead. We might go on quoting John Jay, and also Thomas Jefferson, who wrote the Declaration of Independence, all of them positive that they never thought of such a thing until about five or six minutes before they did it, and then it was contemplated with affliction by all. No doubt there was much affliction, for it was a dangerous business. If, however, the affliction was so great, how was it that even in their darkest hours they refused all offers of compromise, comma, even the very terms of freedom from Parliament which they had themselves proposed? Asterisk. We can perhaps understand better how independence was secretly nourished when we remember the indomitable energy our climate produces, how the desire to plan, to act, to do, to invent with surpassing ingenuity, and to be forever going, climbing, and achieving is uncontrollable. The patriot colonists who had been born in the country, and their fathers before them, were of this sort. Colonialism, with the essential political degradation entailed on even the best and most liberally governed colony, exasperated them. They may have said all sorts of things about home, king, and loyalty. They had been brought up under the British monarchy, and among such people such phrases became a habit. It was also important for them not to alarm the moderate or hesitating patriots by word or action that would be too direct. Those followers had to be educated and led by degrees. Thousands of them were in terrible uncertainty. At the thought of independence they trembled about the future which they could not see or fathom, on which was no landmark or familiar ground, and which their imaginations peopled with monsters and dragons like those with which the old geographers before Columbus filled the western ocean. We laugh at their fears because that future has now become the past. But their fears were largely justified by the history of the world up to that time. They felt that the old argument with which the loyalists continually plied them might very well be true. The colonies, if left to themselves, would fight one another about their boundaries. They had been quarrelling about boundaries for a century, with England for their final arbiter. What would they do when they had no arbiter but the might of the strongest? Would not Pennsylvania combine with the South to conquer New England? Or, more likely still, New England would combine with New York to conquer all the South, New York, for the sake of her old Dutch idea of trade, and New England, for the sake of improving the fox hunting, Sabbath breaking southerner and freeing his slaves, for the estrangement between North and South on the slavery question was already quite obvious at the time of the revolution. Then there would be rebellions and struggles to reform the map and straighten the lines and boundaries. If in the confusion France or Spain did not gobble them up, or England reduce them again to colonies, they would likely enough try to form a confederacy among themselves for protection against Europe. Then there would be one war to decide which section should have the commercial advantage of the seat of government in this confederacy, and another war to decide what should be the form of government of the confederacy comma monarchical, aristocratic, or republican, and probably a third war to establish securely the form of government finally adopted. Asterisk. We must remember that in South America there has been much confusion and misgovernment as the result of independence and out of it only two stable governments, Chile and Brazil, have as yet arisen. The monsters that the timid ones saw were unquestionably possibilities, and the loyalist prophecies of sectional war have been largely fulfilled. We have not had quite as many sectional wars as they foretold. But we have had one great war between the North and the South, very much as they prophesied, and in costliness, slaughter and fierceness of contest far exceeding their warnings. They prophesied also that even if, with the assistance of France, a sort of independence was won, it would be an independence only on the land. Great Britain would still retain sovereignty on the sea, and there would be another war or series of wars over this question. This happened exactly as they foretold, and thirty years after the revolution we fought the War of 1812 often called at the time of its occurrence the Second War for Independence. With these monsters before their eyes the rebel colonists hesitated, deceived themselves, or resorted to shrewdness. They had mental reservations and cautious politic insincerities. 
they caught at every foolish straw, and the most extraordinary one of all was that the colonies should be ruled by the king alone, that by this invisible thread they would remain a part of the British Empire, and always have the advantage of its steadying hand, with Parliament merely an object of outside historic interest. They would always pray for the king, as someone in New England suggested, and would kindly vote him from time to time little presents of money to help him in his wars, he in return to protect them from the ravages of the great powers, France and Spain, and possibly from their own disunion and anarchy. X. The Continental Congress. In spite of the disturbed and dangerous position in which they found themselves, the Patriot leaders seem to have thought that the wisest course was to place complete confidence in the Congress and declare that it would strike a compromise and settle the whole difficulty. It is not probable, however, that those who talked so profusely about this hope had any confidence in it. Certainly men of the Samuel Adams type had no intention of compromising. The Congress held its sessions in Philadelphia in a neat brick building used by a sort of guild called the Carpenter Company, and both the building and the guild are still preserved. The session lasted from September 5th until October 26th a delightful time of year to be in the metropolis of the colonies and discuss great questions of state. Forty-four delegates at first assembled, and within a few weeks the number increased to fifty-two. Most of them were capable, and some of them became very conspicuous men. Among the striking characters were Samuel Adams and his cousin, John Adams, accompanied by the lesser lights, Cushing and Payne, who made up the Massachusetts delegation. These delegates, coming from poor, crippled Boston, supported by charity under the exactions of the Port Bill, were the most violent of all the members. They were known to be so hot for extreme measures that some of the Patriot Party rode out to meet them before they reached the town, warned them to be careful, and not to utter the word independence. Asterisk. Asterisk Hosmer, Life of Samuel Adams, p. 313. From Virginia came Randolph, Washington, Henry, Bland, Harrison, and Pendleton, the best delegates of all, fully as much in earnest as the Boston men, but with a broad range of ability, and more calm and judicious. From South Carolina came Middleton, John Rutledge, Gadsden, Lynch, and Edward Rutledge, who were almost if not quite the equals of the Virginians. Pennsylvania sent a very conservative but not very strong delegation. Galloway was the only eminent man in it. A few weeks later Dickinson was added. A year or two later the addition of Robert Morris, Franklin, and Dr. Rush made a considerable change in this delegation's conservatism. The little community of Delaware sent three good men, McKean, Rodney, and Reed. From New York John Jay was the only delegate who afterwards attained much prominence. The delegates and the townsfolk seem to have enjoyed most thoroughly the excitement of that session of nearly two months. The early steps of a rebellion are easy and fascinating. The golden October days and the bracing change to the cool air of autumn were a delightful medium in which to discuss great questions of absorbing interest, see and hear the ablest and most attractive men from the colonies and dine at country places and the best inns. It was a mental enlargement and an experience which must have been long remembered by everyone. Every form of festivity and pleasure going increased. Many who afterwards were loyalists, or neutrals, could as yet be on friendly terms with patriots, there was not the avowed intention merely to accomplish redress of grievances. No one had ever seen the streets so crowded with the bright and gay colors of the time. We read in Adams's diary that one of the delegates from New Jersey was very much condemned because he wore black clothes and his own hair. Everybody saw all the delegates, and there were few who could not boast of having hid a word with some of them in the streets, shops, or marketplace. Philadelphia was at that time a pretty place on the water side. The houses, wharves, Warehouses, and inns were scattered in picturesque confusion along the riverfront from Vine Street to South Street, a distance of exactly one mile. Westward, the town reached back from the river about half a mile, to the present Fifth Street. 
the chime of bells in the steeple of Christ Church was an object of great interest. These bells played tunes on market days, as well as Sundays, for the edification of the country people, who had come in with their great wagon loads of poultry and vegetables. John Adams relates how he and some of the delegates climbed up into the steeple of Christ Church and looked over all the roofs of the town, and saw the country with its villas and woods beyond. It was their first bird's eye view of the metropolis of the colonies of which they had so often heard, and they thought it a wonderful sight. The Philadelphia Library, founded by Franklin and James Logan, bade its rooms in the Carpenter's Hall. The directors of the library passed a vote giving the Congress free use of all the books. No doubt some of them worked hard among the volumes, burying themselves in Grotius, Puffendorf, Burlamaqui, and Locke. It was their duty to understand the state of nature and the natural rights of man, those arguments which showed that rebellion was sometimes not reason. They must have read with hard, uneasy faces the recent heroic struggles, but sad fate, of Corsica, of Poland, and of Sweden. Both John and Samuel Adams and all of the Massachusetts delegates pressed hard for resolutions which would commit all the colonies to the cause of Boston as Boston had chosen to make her cause. She would not yield, would not pay for the tea, nor would she pay damages of any sort. The British troops must be withdrawn, the Boston Port Bill must be repealed, the act altering the government of Massachusetts must be repealed, and also the ten or twelve other acts which were not acceptable in America. The Congress sat with closed doors, and nothing, as a rule was known of their proceedings except the results which took the shape of certain documents, which shall be discussed in their place. There was, however, one act of the Congress known as the approval of the Suffolk Resolutions, which became known at the time of its occurrence, which committed the Congress irrevocably to the cause of Boston and marked a turning point in the Revolution. Paul Revere, deserting his silversmith shop and his engraving tools, rode to and fro from Boston to Philadelphia on horseback, carrying documents and letters in his saddlebags. He had already, it appears, on several occasions during the Massachusetts disturbances, voluntarily acted as messenger in this way. He was evidently fond of horses. He had been shut up for so many years hammering out silly little teapots and sugar bowls and wearing out his eyesight with engraving tools that he no doubt found himself delighted with this excuse for riding over the wild woodland roads of the colonies. Within a week or two after the Congress met he started from Boston with a copy of the famous Suffolk Resolutions, which had been passed that day by Suffolk County, in which Boston was situated and within a few days the Suffolk firebrands were laid before the Congress. The purpose of these resolutions, which were passed by a meeting of delegates from all the towns of Suffolk County, was to create a new government for Massachusetts, independent of the government under the Charter, as modified by Parliament and now administered by General Gage. To that end the Suffolk resolutions declared that no obedience was due from the people to either the Boston Port Bill or to the Act altering the Charter, that no regard should be paid to the present judges of the courts, and that sheriffs, deputies, constables, and jurors must refuse to carry into execution any orders of the courts. Creditors, debtors, and litigants were advised to settle their disputes amicably or by arbitration. This had the effect desired and abolished the administration of the law for a long period in Massachusetts, comma, a period extremely interesting to political students for the ease with which the people, by tacit consent, got on without the aid of those essential instrumentalities. The resolutions further recommended that collectors of taxes and other officials having public money in their hands should retain those funds and not pay them over to the government under gauge until all disputes were settled. The persons who had accepted seats on the council board under the gauge government were bluntly told that they were wicked persons and enemies of the country, which was in effect to turn the mob upon them at the first opportunity. The patriot inhabitants of each town were instructed to form a militia, to learn the art of war as speedily as possible, but for the present to act only on the defensive. If any patriots were seized or were arrested, officials of the gauge government must be seized and held as hostages. 
All this was rather vigorous rebellion, which could not be leniently regarded in England, and, finally, it was recommended that all the towns of the colony should choose delegates to a provincial congress to act in place of the assembly under the Gage government. This provincial congress was elected, and the government thus suggested by the Suffolk resolutions became the government of Massachusetts for a long period during the Revolution. It is quite obvious that the resolutions were in effect a declaration of independence by the patriots of Massachusetts, although the word independence was not used. If Congress approved of them, approved of a government set up by the patriots in hostility to the British government, it was certainly committing the rest of the colonies to an open rebellion and war unless England was willing to back down completely, as she had done in the case of the Stamp Act and the Paint, Paper, and Glass Act, and be ordered about by the colonies. Besides creating a new government for Massachusetts the Suffolk resolutions contained some strong expressions not likely to assist the cause of peace. England was described as a parasite aiming a dagger at our bosoms. The continent was described as swarming with millions who would not yield to slavery or robbery or allow the streets of Boston to be thronged with military executioners. The people were described as originally driven from England by persecution and injustice, and they would never allow the desert they had redeemed and cultivated to be transmitted to their innocent offspring, clogged with shackles and fettered with power. Violent as were the Suffolk resolutions, the Congress approved of them in a resolution justifying the Massachusetts patriots in all they had done. If it had ever been a Congress for mere address of grievances, it was now certainly changed and had become a Congress for making a new nation. The veil, as the Loyalists said, was now drawn aside and independence stood revealed. From that moment the numbers of the Loyalists rapidly increased. This new step separated them more and more from the Patriots with whom many of them had heretofore been acting. 3. There was an important and far-reaching measure of conservatism proposed in the Congress, but it utterly failed, Galloway offered a plan which would in effect have been a constitutional union between the colonies and the mother country. There was to be a parliament or congress elected by all the colonies and to hold its sessions at Philadelphia. It should be a branch of the parliament in England, and no act relating to the colonies should be valid unless it was accepted by both the Parliament in Philadelphia and the Parliament in England. This would, it was said, settle all difficulties in the future, for it would be a practical method of obtaining the consent of America which the Patriots were saying was necessary to the validity of an act of Parliament which was to be applied to the colonies. The plan represented the Loyalist opinion and would in their view have prevented all taxation or internal regulation, and have amply safeguarded all the liberties for which the Patriots professed to be contending. There was sufficient conservatism in the Congress to approve of it so far as to refer it under their rule for further consideration. But soon all proceedings connected with it were ordered to be expunged from the minutes so that they could never be read. As the meetings were secret, it may have been supposed that no news of it would get abroad. But the Loyalists took pains to spread the history of it. They charged that the Congress had expunged the proceedings because they feared that the mass of the people might hear of the plan and be willing to have a reconciliation effected on such a basis without an attempt at independence. They circulated printed copies of the plan and declared that the attempt to suppress it by expunging showed a clear intention to secretly kill all efforts at reconciliation. The Congress closed its session, and Wednesday, October 26, was the last day. Many of the members appear to have lingered for a day or two longer. But on Friday there was a general exodus. It was raining hard, John Adams tells us in his diary as he took his departure from Philadelphia, which he described as the happy, the peaceful, the elegant, the hospitable, and the polite. There was perhaps a covert sneer in the words. He had found it too peaceful, too elegant, too polite and happy to be as forward as he wished in rebellion and revolution. However, he professed to believe that he would never have to see Philadelphia again, because the British lion would surrender. And what, pray? was to be the cause of this surrender. The Suffolk resolutions? Yes, 
and several documents or state papers which the Congress had prepared and which were soon made public in newspapers and pamphlets. The first of these documents, called the Declaration of Rights, merely recited again the arguments for freedom from parliamentary control, which we have already discussed, and gave a list of a dozen or more acts of parliament which should be repealed. The next document, the Association, as it was called, was quite remarkable and curious. It was signed by all the delegates on behalf of themselves and of those whom they represented, and was intended to be the most complete non-importation, non-exportation, and non-consumption agreement that had yet been attempted. The previous measures of this sort which had been so effective had been voluntary and tacit understandings carried out in a general way. But this association of the Congress was intended to be systematic, thorough, and compulsory. The whole British trade was interdicted, and punishments were most ingeniously provided for those merchants who would not obey. Although it was in form only an agreement, yet it was worded as if it were a law passed by a legislative body. In some paragraphs we find it speaking as a mere agreement, as, for example, we will use our utmost endeavours to improve the breed of sheep or we will, in our several states, encourage frugality, economy etc. In other paragraphs it speaks in the language of a legislature. That a committee he chosen in every county, city, and town by those who are qualified to vote for representatives in the legislature, whose business it shall be attentively to observe the conduct of all persons touching this association. A large part of the document is taken up with these positive commands, directing the committees of correspondence to inspect the entries in their custom houses directing owners of vessels to give positive orders to their captains, and directing that all manufactures be sold at reasonable prices. The Congress, it must be remembered, had no law-making power. It was a mere convention, without any authority of law. Yet here it was adroitly arrogating to itself legislative functions. From our point of view, it was a most interesting beginning of the instinctive feeling of nationality and union, the determination, consciously or unconsciously, to form a nation out of a convention that had been called only for a redress of grievances. The phrase by which the rebel committees of correspondence were directed to inspect their custom houses was beautiful in its ingenuousness. But the loyalists were unable to see it in this light. They attacked it at once as a usurpation, and they called on all the legislative assemblies of the colonies to protect themselves against this monster of a congress, which would soon take away from them all of their power. From a legal point of view the loyalist position was unquestionably sound, for the assemblies in each colony were the only bodies that had any law-making power. The Congress seemed to the Loyalists to threaten an American Republic, and their premonition was certainly justified by events. Are you sure, asks a Loyalist, that while you are supporting the authority of the Congress, and exalting it over your own legislature, that you are not nourishing and bringing to maturity a grand American Republic, which shall after a while rise to power and grandeur, upon the ruins of our present Constitution? To me the danger appears more than possible. The outlines of it seem already to be drawn. We have had a Grand Continental Congress at Philadelphia. Another is to meet in May next. There has been a Provincial Congress held in Boston government. And as all the colonies seem fond of imitating Boston politics, it is very probable that the scheme will spread and increase, and in a little time the Commonwealth be completely formed. The Congress canvassed, p. 24, New York, 1774. There was a considerable body of people at that time who assumed, as a matter of course, that an American Republic would be anything but a blessing. With the tar and feathers and other persecutions of loyalists before their eyes, they took for granted that such a republic would be even worse than what we now derisively call a South American Republic, Comoe Dominica or a Haiti. They were still more shocked when they read in the association how the Congress intended to have its attempted laws and commands enforced. Those who would not obey the rules of the association against importing and exporting were to have their names published as enemies of the country, and no one was to buy from them or sell to them, they were to be cut off from intercourse with their fellows, 
to be ostracized and outlawed. In short, they were to be boycotted, as we would now say, and turned over to the mob. In this arrangement and in the committees that were to pry about and act as informers, the loyalists easily saw a most atrocious violation of personal liberty. These county committees, who were given the judicial power to publish, denounce, and ruin people merely of their own motion, without any of the usual safeguards of courts, evidence, proof, or trial, would, they said, be worse than the Inquisition. How could the patriots, they said, consistently object to admiralty courts when they were setting up these extraordinary tribunals that could condemn men unseen and unheard? They looked forward to a long reign of anarchy, and their expectations were largely fulfilled. Men like John Adams admitted the injustice and cruelty of the Patriot Committees, and dreaded the effect of them on American morals and character. 4. The tenth article of the association provided that if any goods arrived for a merchant they were to be seized, if he would not reship them, they were to be sold, his necessary charges repaid, and the profits to go to the poor of Boston. In other words, said the loyalists, a man's private property is to be taken from him, without his consent, by the recommendation of a congress that has no legal power, and the same congress is sending petitions to England arguing that parliament cannot tax us because it would be taking our property without our consent. It would be easy to multiply these inconsistencies, and the more the loyalists called attention to them the more the patriots felt compelled to violate personal liberty in suppressing the loyalists until free speech was extinguished and thousands of loyalists driven from the country. On a smaller scale, and with less wholesale atrocity, it was like the French Revolution, in which we are told that the Revolutionary Party felt themselves obliged to take stringent measures, that is, the party which asserted the rights of man felt themselves obliged to refuse to those who opposed them the exercise of those rights. 5. Every provision in the association shows a people who were uniting in a struggle for nationality, and therefore cared little for their inconsistencies or violation of rights. Struggles for independence are not apt to be tame or necessarily moral. There is nothing so elementary and natural as the nation-forming instinct, its efforts are always violent, and in such a contest the laws are thrust aside. For the milder forms of this struggle as shown in the association, we find them agreeing to kill as few lambs as possible, to start domestic manufactures, and to encourage agriculture, especially wool, so as to be independent of England in the matter of clothing. And they were trying to be economical, to discourage horse racing, gaming, cockfighting, shows, and plays, and to give up the extravagant mourning garments and funerals which were so excessive and expensive at that time. Another document put forth by the Congress was the address to the people of Great Britain. It claimed for the Americans all the privileges of British subjects, the right of disposing of their own property and of ruling themselves. Why should English subjects, who live 3,000 miles from the royal palace, enjoy less liberty than those who are 300 miles distant from it like all the other documents? It had much to say about the wickedness of the Quebec Act which had established Roman Catholicism in Canada, and it argued over again all this old ground. The only striking part of it was an argument that if the ministry were allowed to tax and rule America as they pleased, the enormous streams of wealth to be gathered from such a vast continent, together with the Roman Catholic inhabitants of Canada, would be used to inflict some terrible and vague persecution and tyranny on the masses of the people in England. This attempt to excite the English masses against Parliament and the Ministry was very much resented in England, and was not likely to bring a favourable compromise any more than was a similar attempt to arouse rebellion in Ireland, which was tried the next year. Another document, called an address to the inhabitants of Canada, was much ridiculed by both the Loyalists and the English, because it was so absurdly inconsistent with the address to the people of Great Britain. In addressing the people of England the Congress had vilified and abused the religion of the Canadians as despotism, murder, persecution, and rebellion. Yet they asked those same Canadians to join the rebellious colonies against England, and they sent to them a long document patronizing and instructing them in their rights, 
and quoting Montesquieu and other Frenchmen, to show what a mistake they were making by submitting to the tyranny of Great Britain. The Canadians would, of course, see both documents and laugh at the Congress. The last paper put forth by the Congress was the petition to the King, drawn by Dickinson and intended to show conservative loyalty and save appearances. It was merely a well-worded restatement of the old argument against control by Parliament, and of the wish to be under the King alone, to whom, according to this petition, the Patriot colonists were most extravagantly devoted. These documents having been sent forth and the Congress adjourned, the people settled down to comparative quietude for the whole of the following winter. There was nothing more to be said, because what had been done had been done, and there was no help for it. The result must be calmly awaited during four or five months while the vessels that communicated with England should beat their way over and back against the winter gales of the Atlantic. 11. The Situation in England we must go to England for a time and see the effect upon the English people of those documents which the ships carried. First of all we must make the acquaintance of William Howe, who soon had in his hands more power in the great controversy than any other person. He was a Whig member of Parliament, and had served in the House of Commons for some fifteen years, representing the town of Nottingham. His father had been Viscount Howe, of the Irish peerage. On the other side he was the first cousin once removed of the king, for his mother was the illegitimate daughter of George I. by his mistress, the Hanoverian Baroness Kilmansig. His elder living brother, Lord Richard Howe, was an admiral in the British Navy. There had been a still older brother, George Howe, who had served as an officer in the colonies during the war with France. This brother, George had been one of the few British officers whom the colonists had really liked. The Massachusetts Assembly had erected a monument to him in Westminster Abbey. Wolfe and Bouquet they had admired, but they were particularly fond of George Howe, because he understood them and adopted their mode of life. He dismissed his retinue, equipage, and display of wines and high living, ate the colonists' plain fare, and drank their homebrew, their punch, and their whiskey. He carried provisions on his back, went scouting with rangers, and slept on a bearskin and a blanket. The Howes, we must remember, were Whigs of the extreme type. George, during his lifetime, had been the family member of Parliament, and had represented Nottingham until he fell at Ticonderoga in 1758. As soon as his mother heard the news she issued an address to the electors asking them to choose her youngest son, William which they promptly did, and he seems to have thought of himself as continuing the existence and principles of his brother. He had none of the personal attractiveness of his deceased brother. He had served in the colonies in the French war, and knew the people, but they never showed any particular regard or liking for him. He was, however, always popular with his soldiers and subordinate officers. He was excessively fond of gambling and kept up this amusement wherever he was, whether in England or America. But he was strong and shrewd enough not to allow himself to be ruined by it, as Charles Fox and so many others were at that time, and he was generally believed to have increased rather than diminished his fortune by the American War. In the introduction to his orderly book, which has been published, it is said that he and others of his family were sullen, hard, and cruel. But, after having read a great deal about him, I do not think that this charge can be sustained. The only evidence that might sustain it is, that his commissaries allowed American prisoners to be starved and very severely treated. But other commanders, and the British government itself, allowed this sort of treatment. Galloway, who was by no means his friend, admits that he was a liberal man and not corrupt in money matters except that he allowed illegitimate opportunities to his subordinates. I should say, from all the evidence, that General Howe, like the Admiral and the rest of the family, was quite easy-going and generous, and, as we shall see, he refused to obey the orders which directed him to be severe and cruel. His most conspicuous characteristic was great personal courage accompanied by a certain contemptuous indifference. In his methods he was very indirect, 
and this is strikingly shown in the evasive reasoning and misleading statements in his narrative of the war. He is described as a large man, of dark complexion, like all his family, and with heavy features and very defective teeth. His brother, the admiral, was so swarthy that the sailors called him Black Dick. He was, apparently, fond of business and details, never gambled or dissipated, and his face was rather refined and scholarly. He too was of an extremely liberal and generous disposition. Although he commanded a fleet to put down the American rebellion, he is known in history chiefly for his peace negotiations. As a member of parliament and a politician of many years experience, General Howe had acted with his party in opposing the Stamp Act and other taxation measures. He thought it not only wrong to make war on the Americans, but useless and impractical. The Whigs, it must be remembered, were anxious to return to power and enjoyed the patronage of the offices. The reorganization and remodeling of the colonies and subduing them to complete obedience were very popular measures with the majority of Englishmen, and gave the Tories what seemed to be an unassailable position. The Whigs had no choice but to attack all such measures. They must show that the subjugation of the colonies was wrong in principle and incapable of accomplishment. Howe finally told his constituents that if the command against the colonies were offered to him he would not accept it. This reckless remark was characteristic of him, and he made it, although knowing full well that he would be sent against the Americans in some capacity, and probably in chief command. Both he and his brother, the Admiral, were so extremely liberal in their views that they could scarcely be called Englishmen. Had they been consistent they would have emigrated to America, for they belonged to the party that had largely peopled America. But where in America could the general have drawn such large salaries or found such gambling companions as he had in England? It is important to remember the condition of parties in England and the phases of opinion among them during the revolution. As time went on a large section of the Rockingham Whigs, and men like the Duke of Richmond and Charles Fox, Asterisk were in favor of allowing the colonies to form, if they could, an independent nation, just as, in the year 1901, a section of the Liberal Party were in favor of allowing the Boer Republics of South Africa to retain their independence. The rest of the Whigs, represented by such men as Barr, Burke, and Lord Chatham, would not declare themselves for independence. They professed to favor retaining the American communities as colonies, but they would retain them by conciliation instead of by force and conquest. Their position was an impossible one, because conciliation without military force would necessarily result in independence. They professed to think that the colonies could be persuaded to make an agreement by which they would remain colonies. But such an agreement would be like a treaty between independent nations, and imply such power in the colonies that the next day they would construe it to mean independence. The Tories could see no merit in the independence of any country except England. They believed that the colonies should remain completely subordinate dependencies, like the English colonies of the present day, and be allowed no more liberty or self-government than was for the advantage of the empire, and such as circumstances should from time to time indicate. As to the method of reducing the colonies to obedience, the Tories were somewhat uncertain. At first most of them, led by such men as Lord North, Lord Hillsborough, and Lord Dartmouth, were in favor of a rather mild method of warfare, accompanied by continual offers of conciliation and compromise. They were led to this partly by considerations of expense and the heavy debt already incurred by the previous war, by the desire to take as much wind as possible out of the sails of the Whigs by adopting a semi-Whig policy, by the desire to avoid arousing such hatred and ill-will among the colonists as would render them difficult to govern in the future, and by the fear that the Patriot Party, if pressed too hard, would appeal to France or escape beyond the Algony Mountains and establish Republican or rights of man communities which would be a perpetual menace and evil example to the seaboard colonies. Exactly how much conciliation and how much severity the ministry wished to have in their policy is difficult to determine. Within two or three years they changed it and favored a quick, sharp, relentless war with such complete destruction and devastation of the country as would collapse the Patriot Party, 
avoid all necessity of any sort of compromise and leave the colonies to be remodeled and governed in any way the ministry saw fit. It is quite obvious that, besides getting aid from France, Spain, or Holland and their own personal powers, it was very important for the Patriot Party in the colonies to have the Whigs go into power, or come so near going into power that they would influence Tory policy. Many people believed that the whole question depended on the Patriots holding out long enough to let the Whigs get into power, and that if the Whigs were successful for only a few months the whole difficulty would be settled. When, finally, peace was declared and the treaty acknowledging independence signed in 1783, it was done by a Whig ministry. Tories do not sign treaties granting independence. It is somewhat surprising to a modern American to find that a politician and a member of parliament of such long service as Howe was also at the same time an officer of the British regular army. Under our national constitution we have always avoided conferring conflicting offices and duties on the same person. But this principle of distinct separation of the departments of government, which we have carried so far, was at that time not much regarded in England. Admiral Howe was also a member of Parliament and so were Generals Burgoyne, Cornwallis, and Grant. Such a system may have worked well enough until the soldier or sailor was directed to carry out what as a politician he had opposed. That General Howe should take command if there was any serious war in America was inevitable. He was of suitable age and had at that time seen more successful service in actual warfare than any other officer of high rank in England except possibly Amherst, the conqueror of Canada, who was getting old and does not seem to have been seriously thought of for the American command. Howe had been a great deal in America and had a most brilliant record of service. He had served as a lieutenant in the regiment of Wolfe, who had spoken highly of him. At the siege of Louisbourg he had commanded a regiment as colonel. At the attack on Quebec he was again with Wolfe and led in person the forlorn hope up the entrenched path. In the expedition against Montreal the next year he commanded a brigade. He had another large command at the siege of Belle Isle on the coast of Brittany, and was adjutant general of the army at the conquest of Havana. For these services at the close of those wars he had been given the honorary position of governor of the Isle of Wight, and he was now a major general, with a high reputation for efficiency and general knowledge of his profession. He had recently added to British Army methods the improvement of lightly equipped companies, selected from the line regiments and drilled in quick movements. 6. He was, it seems, engaged in inaugurating this change in the summer of 1774, and when it was finished his troops were taken to London, and reviewed by the King in Richmond Park. Immediately after that he was busy in the great election of that autumn, for Parliament had been dissolved in September and the general election ordered to compose a new body of the Commons to meet on the 29th of November. Prominent men were everywhere bustling about electioneering, speech-making, writing pamphlets, buying and selling votes or boroughs. How appears to have had no trouble in being re-elected by Nottingham. Gibbon while settling estates and turning magnificent periods about Roman emperors and Gothic chieftains, found time to attend so well to buy his fences that he was easily seated for Lisk eared. Dr. Johnson, anxious that his friend Mr. Thrall should be elected, and that the honor of Britain should be maintained, came out in an eloquent pamphlet against the American rebels, circulated far and wide, and called the Patriot for which he received a handsome sum from the Tory ministry. His brilliant and powerful pages were well calculated to arouse the natural British animosity against anything independent. The philosophic quotation from Milton, which was the pamphlet's motto, seemed to every scholarly mind a most apt description of the Americans. They bawl for freedom in their senseless mood. Yet still revolt when truth would set them free. License they mean, when they cry liberty. For who loves that must first he wise and good? How perfectly obvious it always is to any comfortable, wealthy, or scholarly mind that a high order of wisdom and goodness, higher even, perhaps, than that of his own people, must precede the grant of liberty. The ships which had sailed in the autumn with the documents of the American Congress, when scarcely ten days out, were driven back by a gale. 
they returned to port, and several weeks were lost before they were again on their way. But at last, about the middle of December, they began arriving here and there at different ports, and the petition, the Declaration of Rights, the Articles of Association, and all the papers, with their duplicates, travelled by various means to London. Soon they were published, and everybody was reading them. But it was so near Christmas time that nothing could be done. Parliament adjourned over the holidays, and members, ministers, and officials rushed off to the country to enjoy the pleasures of the winter sports, house parties, and family gatherings. The impression produced by the documents of the Congress was at first, Franklin said, rather favorable. By this he seems to have meant that the Whigs were pleased because the rebellion party were making a good fight and not yielding in their demands, and the Tory administration was rather staggered at the uncompromising nature of the demands. Before the documents arrived some prominent Englishmen, seeing that a dangerous crisis was impending, entered into secret negotiations with Franklin to bring about a reconciliation. When the documents came the danger of a bad civil war was more evident than ever, and they increased their efforts. The persons chiefly concerned in this undertaking were David Barclay, a Quaker member of Parliament, Dr. Fothergill, the leading physician of London, who was also a Quaker, and Admiral Howe, a Whig, very favorably inclined towards the colonies on account of his deceased brother, and very ambitious to win the distinction of settling the great question. He hoped to be sent out to America at the head of a great peace commission which would settle all difficulties. The plan of these negotiations was, by means of private interviews with Franklin, to obtain from him the final terms on which the Patriot colonists would compromise, and by acting as friendly messengers of these terms to the ministry the negotiators hoped to prevent a war of conquest. Secrecy was necessary because ordinary Englishmen might look upon such negotiations as somewhat treasonable, and the charge of treason was made when afterwards the negotiations were known. Asterisk Franklin was led into the plan by being asked to play chess, of which he was very fond, with Admiral Howe's sister, and his description of her fascination and the gradual opening of the plan are written in his best vein. Asterisk Asterisk the ultimate terms of these negotiations were worked down to as mild a basis as possible, and Franklin was willing to be much easier and more complying than were the colonists. He was willing, for example, to pay for the tea. But even when reduced to their mildest form one cannot read them without seeing that they would now be regarded as most extraordinary terms for colonies to be suggesting. They show in what a weak grasp England had held her colonies. They are absolutely incompatible with any modern idea of the colonial relation. It would be utterly impossible for any British colony of our time to get itself, for the fraction of a moment, into a position where it could think of suggesting such terms, for the military and naval power of England over her colonies is overwhelming and complete. Most of the terms were, of course, concerned with the repeal of laws which the colonists disliked and certainly the amount of repealing demanded seemed very large to Englishmen. But some of the other terms may be mentioned as showing the situation. England was not to keep troops in any colony in time of peace or to build a fortification in any colony, except by that colony's consent. England was to withdraw all right to regulate colonial internal affairs by Act of Parliament. The colonies must continue to control the salaries of governors. The first two regulations would alone have destroyed the colonial relation, and the American communities would have ceased to be colonies. But Franklin knew he could not yield on these points, and he even suggested to Lord Chatham that the Congress be recognized as a permanent body. The friendly negotiators could only politely withdraw and say that they were very sorry, and the delightful games of chess came to an end. The ministry were amused and saw the situation more clearly than ever. Admiral Howe was deeply disappointed. He had expected to take Franklin out with him as one of the members of his Great Peace Commission, and, to make the terms easier and everything smooth, Franklin was offered any important reward he chose to name. As a beginning, he was to be paid the arrears of his salary which the colonies, whose agent he was, had for some years neglected to send to him. But he was, of course, 
far too shrewd to yield to any of these temptations. During the Christmas holidays, everyone in town and country discussed the American documents. Dr. Johnson began his vigorous refutation of them for his pamphlet, Taxation No Tyranny. Lord Chatham read them with delight and admiration. They gave him a strong interest and roused the mighty energies of the mind that had saved the colonies from France and won a whole empire for England. Burke and Fox admired them, and so also did all the Whigs, as a matter of course. But that was not enough, because the Whigs were already on the side of the colonies. The object of the documents, if they were to accomplish anything at all, was to win over the doubting Tories in such numbers that they would turn the Whig minority into a majority, which would compromise with the colonies. In that they utterly failed, exactly as the loyalists prophesied, and as such men as Samuel Adams hoped and prayed they might. In fact, these documents, instead of accomplishing reconciliation, made reconciliation impossible. If the members of the Congress could have passed December in Tory households, they would not have eaten their Christmas dinners with much complacency. Their statements of American rights, which are still so much admired by us and which were admired by Lord Chatham and the Whigs, were exasperating to the Tories. The documents were admirable only to those who already believed their sentiments, and they were exasperating and hateful to others in exact proportion as they were admirable to us. They aroused among the Tories outbursts of indignation and ridicule. The Tories saw independence in every line. Why, they would say, their very first resolution says that they have never ceded to any power the disposal of their life, liberty, and property. They assume, in other words, that they have a right to cede it if they wish. They believe that they are already independent of us. They deny that they are British subjects. They deny that they are subject to the British constitution, by which alone the life, liberty, and property of every Englishman is held. The inconsistency of asking in one document for a repeal of the Quebec Act, because it established in Canada the bigotry and ignorance of the Roman Catholic religion, mingled with the absurd customs of Paris, and in another document appealing to these same French Roman Catholics, in flattering phrases, to join the Congress at Philadelphia, was quickly seen, and formed one of the stock jokes at every Tory gathering. They complain of transubstantiation in Canada, said Dean Tucker, but they have no objection to their own kind of transubstantiation, by which they turn bits of paper, worth nothing at all, into legal tender for the payment of debts to British merchants. Dr. Johnson's taxation no tyranny, with its wholesale Toryism, is capital reading. No doubt he and many another Tory were expressing the same sentiments in conversation. At his Friday evening club, surrounded by Sir Joshua Reynolds, the ever-faithful Boswell, Charles Fox, Gibbon, Burke, and others, we can almost even now hear the doctor pant and roar against the Americans like an infuriated old lion. Sir, do they suppose that when this nation sent out a colony it established an independent power? They went out into those wildernesses because we protected them and they would not otherwise have ventured there. They have been incorporated by English charters, they have been governed by English laws, regulated by English councils, protected by English arms, and it seems to follow, by a consequence not easily avoided, that they are subject to English government and chargeable by English taxation. And if Samuel Adams had been there, he might have said, you are entirely right, and that is the reason I was so anxious to have the tea destroyed? But he was not there, and so the doctor roared on, while his listeners cautiously smoked their long pipes. When by our indulgence and favor the colonists have become rich, shall they not contribute to their own defense? If they accept protection, do they not stipulate obedience? Parliament may enact a law for capital punishment in America, and may it not enact a law for taxation? If it can take away a colonist's life by law, can it not take away his property by law? And again Samuel Adams would have said, why, yes, certainly, that is the cause of the whole trouble. Sir, your people are a race of convicts, the doctor would have replied, a race of cowardly convicts. 
Has not America always been our penal colony? Are they not smugglers? I am willing to love all mankind except an American. How is it, sir, that we hear the loudest yelps for liberty from these people, who are themselves the drivers of Negroes? We can easily imagine what a telling hit this must have been among the Tories, for most of the members of the Continental Congress owned slaves, and all of them could have owned them. Lord Mansfield had recently decided that a slave who set foot on the soil of England was by the tact set free while he remained in England. For Americans or colonials to talk about liberty, and drive their slaves like cattle, seemed very ridiculous and contemptible. Asterisk. The doctor made many telling hits, and it would be easy to go on summarizing or paraphrasing them. One minute he would say, the Whigs are telling us, oh, the poor Americans. Have you not oppressed them enough already? You have forbidden them to manufacture their own goods, or to carry their raw materials to any but English ports. The next minute they tell us you can never conquer them, they are too powerful. Think of their fertile land, their splendid towns, their wonderful prosperity, which enables their population to double itself every twenty years. But I say, if the rascals are so prosperous, oppression has agreed with them, or else there has been no oppression. You cannot escape one or the other of those dilemmas. An English pamphlet called Considerations on the American War, asterisk published during this period, is interesting for its prophecies. It describes America's unbounded extent of lands, such vast length of coast, such harbors, such fertility, such prospect of provisions for ages to come, such certainty of vast increase of population, that unless subdued and controlled she would before long overwhelm the mother country with her riches and power. As America rises in independence England will as gradually decay, and therefore the lawless colonists in America should be subdued. No minister of discernment and honesty, it was said, could see the increasing power and opulence of the colonies without marking them with a jealous eye. Fears were expressed that the rebel colonists, having the whole big continent to hide in, might get off into the western woods and live there as free as they pleased. Dr. Johnson ridiculed this idea most savagely. If the Americans were such fools as that, they would be leaving good houses to be enjoyed by wiser men. Others cited Ireland to show how easily the Americans could be conquered. When the Great Rebellion, it was said, began in Ireland there were nearly as many inhabitants there as there are in America, yet in nine years 500,000 Irish were destroyed by the sword and by famine, and Cromwell, with but a small body of troops, could easily have made a desert of the whole island. Asterisk that was many years ago, when England's power was weak. England had only recently hunted the French out of North America and conquered the Indians. How could the colonists escape? The Tory pamphleteers complained bitterly of the Whigs, who by their sympathy and talk about freedom encouraged the riot and rebellion of the Americans. If that faction in England would cease to support the disorderly colonists, they would soon quiet down. It was afterwards charged that the rebel party in the colonies took their tone and framed their war measures from information sent out from England by the Whigs, comma, asterisk. The author of a pamphlet already cited asterisk uses Ireland as an instance and a warning for the Americans. The sole cause of Ireland's long years of disaster, devastation, and failure, he says, has been because she would never give up her love of independence. If she would only just give up that one teasing thought, how happy and prosperous she might be! What long terrors and misery the Americans were preparing for themselves! As England had then been 600 years in crushing the independent spirit of Ireland, and is still engaged in that noble occupation, this Englishman's argument is a strange piece of pathetic British intelligence. Dean Tucker was the most interesting and remarkable of all the political writers. He was a Tory, and yet took the ground that the colonies should be given complete independence. His reasons for this were that to conquer them would be very expensive, and that as independent communities, supposing they remained independent, they would trade with Great Britain more than they had traded as colonies. But they would not remain independent, he said. 
they would either lapse into a frightful state of sectional wars and confusion, or they would petition for a reunion with England. In short, independence would be a cheap and excellent punishment for them. The Tories who were so indignant at the suggestion of allowing America independence could quote the French philosopher Canel. He had written in favor of the colonists, encouraged them in rebellion, warned them not to allow themselves to be represented in Parliament, or their chains and fetters would be worse, but he had said that it would be absurd to give them independence. They could not govern themselves. It would burst the bonds of religion, of oaths, of laws. They would become a dangerous, tumultuous military power, they would menace the peace of Europe. They would try to seize the French and Spanish possessions in the West Indies. The moment the laws of Britain were withdrawn both continents of America would tremble into such unscrupulous tyrants. 12. Triumphant Toryism. The Christmas House parties soon broke up and Parliament resumed its sessions. January and February dragged along and March came while the mighty assembly of the Anglo-Saxon race tossed and struggled with the great question, whether universal liberty was consistent with the universal empire. The Tory majority was overwhelming, and everything that occurred, all the information that arrived, even the arguments of the Whigs, convinced that majority more and more that they were in the right. Letter after letter was read from General Gage and from the provincial governors describing the situation in the colonies. Civil government in Massachusetts had ceased, the courts of justice in every county were expiring. British officials were driven out of the country by terrorism and mob violence, and the rebels had organized a government of their own independent of General Gage and the Charter. They were drilling a militia of their own, seizing arms, ammunition and artillery, casting cannonballs, and looking for blacksmiths who could forge musket barrels. They upset the carts that hauled firewood for the British army and sank the vessels that brought provisions. In New Hampshire they seized the fort at Portsmouth and carried away the powder, cannon, and muskets, and in Rhode Island they committed similar outrages. They propose getting all the women and children out of Boston and then burning it to ashes over the heads of Gage and his soldiers. They were ready to attack him, and on a false rumor that his ships were about to fire on Boston the whole rebel party in New England were in arms, and the rebels in Connecticut made a two days march to give their assistance to Massachusetts. As the Whigs admitted that Massachusetts was in rebellion, the Tories said that the rebellion must be put down. How can we endure such insubordination unless we are willing to give them independence outright? If we are to have colonies at all they must be subordinate in some slight degree. You have raised the rebellion yourselves said the Whigs, by your excessive severity and intermeddling. No said the Tories, not at all, we raised it eight years ago by repealing the Stamp Act, by yielding for a time to Whiggery and weakness. We taught the colonists to think that they could get anything they wanted if they threatened us. Then Burke would break forth in impassioned eloquence. England could not conquer the Americans without ruining herself. Remember the archer, he said, who was drawing his bow to send an arrow to his enemy's heart, when he saw his own child folded in the enemy's arms. America holds in her arms our commerce, our trade, our most valuable child. Even now the tradesmen and merchants of the whole kingdom are thronging to the doors of this house and calling on you to stay your cruel hand. During these debates General Howe rose to be recognized by the chair. His constituents at Nottingham, he said, had asked him to present a petition, and it was handed to the clerk, who read it. Nottingham would be ruined, the petitioners said, unless Parliament found some honorable means of conciliating the Americans. Already the trade of the town was ceasing, useless goods were piling up in the warehouses, laboring men would soon be out of employment. Petitions from London, Bristol, and other towns told the same story, and how must have been amused in watching the effect of them. The effect was the reverse of what the petitioners intended, for, said the Tories, can it be endured that those colonists shall have this handle over us? Shall they be able? every time they are dissatisfied, to raise a rebellion among the commercial classes here in England, and flood our tables with petitions, 
and fill our lobbies with stamping, impatient traders? So they investigated, to see if it were really true that the Americans were starving England into obedience, and making her the dependency and America the ruler, and they aroused an army of counter-petitioners, who swarmed to Parliament, declaring that British trade could not be injured by anything America could do. Thus the appeal to the commercial classes in England, which had been so successful in bringing about the repeal of the Stamp Act, utterly failed in this second attempt. The trick could not be repeated, for the Tories were prepared for it. 7. There was a speech delivered at this time in Parliament by General Grant, which would be extremely interesting if it had been preserved in full. But the debates merely give a brief summary of it. He ridiculed the Americans and their cant enthusiasm in religion, mimicking their vulgar expressions and drawl, and describing their disgusting ways of living. Grant had served in America and professed to know the country. The colonists would never fight. They had none of the qualifications of soldiers, a slight force would completely subdue them. Burgoyne, too, made his little speech. He was a Tory, and there was, therefore, no inconsistency in his announcing that he was one of those selected for service in America to carry out the decrees of Parliament. He was ready, he said, to fight for the supremacy of Parliament, and there could be no better cause for which to bleed and die. The Tory position that America was attacking the supremacy of Parliament, the sovereignty of the Empire, was a strong appeal to most Englishmen, and could not be successfully answered, when letters and documents showed that the rebellion was spreading from New England to all of the colonies. When Wilkes tried to prove at great length that the rebellion might become successful, he merely increased the determination of the Englishmen to put it down at all hazards. When Burke, in a torrent of eloquence, declared that it was not Boston alone, but all America, with which England must now deal, the Tories thanked him for having made their duty clearer. Could they allow such a rebellion to go unpunished? They would lose all their other possessions. Canada, Jamaica, Barbados, India, even Ireland, must be allowed to do as they please, rebel whenever they were dissatisfied, and get what they wanted by blustering and threatening to fight. Our schoolboys still recite extracts from the speeches of Burke and Barr. We shall always admire them. They will always seem to us incomparably and immortally eloquent for the beautiful and romantic aptness of language in which they expressed for us our rebellious thoughts and aspirations. But they never had the slightest chance of accomplishing the smallest result in England. They were mere useless protests. Burke, Barr, and their followers were not Englishmen. They were totally out of sympathy with the principles and tone of thought which had ruled England for centuries. Burke, you may say, was at this time an American, a man with American ideas accidentally living in England. He was, in fact, an Irishman. He had come to London, in 1750, as a penniless Irish adventurer, and risen to distinction by his talents and brilliant Irish mind. When he pleaded in Parliament for the utmost liberty to the Americans, was he not showing the Irish side and influence of his character, the Irishman's natural sympathy with liberty? He prophesied great things for us, and flattered us in the most glowing language. He described us as daring sailors following the whales among the tumbling mountains of Arctic ice, or crossing the equator and the tropics to pursue the same dangerous game in the Antarctic Circle under the frozen serpent of the south. No sea was unvexed by the American fisheries, no climate that was not a witness to their toils. Neither the perseverance of Holland, nor the activity of France, nor the dexterous and firm sagacity of the English was equal to the enterprise of this recent people still in the gristle and not hardened into the bone of manhood. In glowing terms this Irish Englishman went on to describe the rapid growth of our population. It was impossible to exaggerate it, he said, for while you were discussing whether they were two million, they had grown to three. Their trade with England was prodigious, and was now by itself equal to England's trade with the whole world in 1704. Should not people of such numbers, such energy, and such prosperity be handled cautiously and gently?
conscious of the weakness of this argument, conscious of the absurdity of such an appeal to the typical Englishman, he went on to say that he knew that his descriptions of the greatness of America made her seem a more noble prize to the Tories, an object well worth the fighting for, and to overcome this Tory feeling he went on arguing in a way that made it a great deal worse. He was obliged to say in effect that British valour was not equal to the conquest of the Americans. Even if you should conquer them at first, can you go on conquering them, can you keep such a people subdued through the years and centuries that are to come? Having enlarged on this point until he had drawn against himself the whole national pride of England, and lost every vote that might be wavering, he went on to ask eloquently, beautifully, but ineffectually, how are you to subdue this stubborn spirit of your colonies? You cannot stop the rapid increase of their population, you would not wish to cut off their commerce, for that would be to impoverish yourselves, you could not stop their internal prosperity which is spreading over the continent. And here again his fervid imagination pictured a wonderful scene of the colonists driven by British conquest from the seaboard to dwell in the vaster and more fertile interior plains of boundless America how they would become myriads of English Tartars, and pour down a fierce and irresistible cavalry upon the narrow strip of sea coast, sweeping before them your governors, your councillors, your collectors and comptrollers, and all the slaves that adhere to them. Asterisk. His argument was a good one for independence, and possibly in his heart he was in favour of independence, but he would not admit it. He clung to the impossible dream that the colonies could be retained as colonies without coercion and conquest. His remedy was to give the colonists what they asked, to comply with the American spirit, or, if you please, he said, submit to it as a necessary evil. A very simple and easy method, laughed the Tories. It would certainly dispose of the question completely. Bar, our other great friend in Parliament who was more dreaded than any other orator of the opposition, was descended from a French Protestant family of Rochelle and had been born and educated in Ireland. He had served with Wolfe in the French and Indian War, was a favourite of that officer, and shared his liberal opinions. With his Irish education, his French blood, and the bias towards liberty of his Huguenot religion, he was not an Englishman at all. He was an American in all but migration and we accordingly read his eloquence with great delight. As for the rank and file of that helpless minority called the Whig Party, they were largely made up of those people who, for centuries, had been maintaining doctrines of liberty not accepted by the mass of Englishmen. In the previous century the majority had persecuted them so terribly that they had fled to America by thousands as Quakers and Puritans. At intervals this minority has achieved success and made great and permanent changes in the English constitution. They had a day and an innings in Cromwell's time, a long day in Gladstone's time, accomplishing wonderful changes and reforms in England, but perhaps their greatest triumph was in the revolution of 1688, when they dethroned the Stuart line, established religious liberty destroyed the power of the crown to set aside acts of parliament, and created representative government in England. For the most of their existence, however, they would have been able to live in America more consistently with their professed principles than in England. On the present occasion, in the year 1775, after they had expended all of their eloquence and stated all of their ideas, and shown themselves in the eyes of the majority of Englishmen absolutely incompetent to settle the American question, except by giving the colonies independence, the Tory majority proceeded to its duty of preserving the integrity of the empire in the only way it could be preserved. They introduced five measures, well matured, statesmanlike propositions, which would be unpleasant for our people, but proper enough if we once admit that it is a good thing to preserve and enlarge the British Empire. They declared Massachusetts in a state of rebellion, and promised to give the ministry every assistance in subduing her. They voted 6,000 additional men to the land and naval forces. They passed an act, usually known as the Fisheries Bill, by which all the trade of the New England colonies was to be confined by force to Great Britain and the British West Indies. 
This cutting off of the New England colonies from the outside world was a serious matter, but it was not the most important part of the act. The important part was that it prohibited the New England colonies from trading with one another. They must be cut off from every source of supply except the mother country, and if this could be enforced they would be starved into submission and dependence, their self-reliance broken, and their budding unity and nationality destroyed. The surest way to break up a rebellion is to prevent the rebels from uniting, to cut off not only their outward supplies, but their internal self-reliance. Having to deal with colonists whom they knew were striking for independence, this act was a wise one for England. It is easy and cheap to criticize it now after its execution had been forcibly prevented by France, Spain, and Holland turning into the assistance of the Americans. But at the time of its passage it was well calculated to achieve its purpose. The Whigs attacked it for its cruelty. Burke rose to such heights of eloquence and denunciation that he had to be called to order. They proposed an amendment to it which would allow the colonists to carry fuel and provisions from one colony to another, but it was voted down by the three to one majority. The last part of the act was still more severe. It prohibited the New England colonies from fishing on the Newfoundland banks, and allowed that privilege only to Canada and the Middle and Southern colonies. These prohibitions on fishing and trade were to last only until the rebellious colonies returned to their obedience. Up rose the Whig orators to protest in pathetic strains against such hardship. The New Englanders were dependent for their livelihood on the fishery of the banks. Witnesses were called to the bar to show that over 600 vessels and over 6,000 men were employed in that fishery, that it was the foundation of nearly all the other occupations in New England and that its prohibition would ruin or starve one half the population. We are glad to hear that, said the Tories, for then they will return the sooner to obedience. They would have returned to their obedience long ago if they had not been encouraged in rebellion by Whig oratory and eloquence in England. When information arrived that the rebellion was spreading, the Tory ministry introduced another bill extending the prohibitions of the Fisheries Act to all the colonies except loyal New York and North Carolina. They intended, they said, as far as possible to separate the innocent from the guilty. Only the guilty should be punished. We do not wish to oppress them, argued Lord North. As soon as they return to their duty, acknowledge our supreme authority and obey the laws of the realm their real grievances shall be redressed. We must bring them to obedience or abandon them. There is no middle. On the 20th of February Lord North presented the last measure of the ministry's policy, in a bill which provided that, if any colony would make such voluntary contribution to the common defense of the empire, and establish such fixed provision for the support of its own civil government and administration of justice as met the approval of Parliament, that colony should be exempted from all imperial taxation for the purpose of revenue. This measure was also intended to break up the union of the colonies. Lord North was a methodical and good man of business. His speeches as we read them today in the debates are full of dignity and force. It is a great mistake to suppose that he was not an able man, or to say that his failure to be sufficiently conciliatory lost the American colonies to Great Britain or that the king was to blame and North was merely the king's tool. Lack of conciliation was certainly not the trouble, and the attempt to assign some one person as the cause of the revolution is a cheap and easy method of writing history, but absolutely unwarranted by the facts. Neither the king nor Lord North's ministry were any more to blame for the loss of the colonies than were the majority of Englishmen in and out of Parliament. The policy of the ministry, whether right or wrong, was heartily supported by the majority of Englishmen and the majority of the intelligent classes, and their arguments can be read in the pamphlets and the debates. The king was guiding his policy by what he knew to be the overwhelming sentiment of the nation, which had the same desire to maintain dominion over as many countries as possible that it has today. 1. Eight or nine years before, in the Stamp Act times, mildness and a withdrawal of taxation and other parliamentary authority might possibly have kept the American communities nominally within the empire for another generation as semi-independent states. 
but if they were to be retained as colonies the only course that could have the least chance of success would be one of severity and relentless cruelty even to the point of extermination or banishment of the Patriot Party. 13. Lexington and the Number of the Loyalists The Fisheries Act wrought a most profound change among the colonists. It proved that England would no longer yield. From that moment both Patriot and Loyalist were compelled to look at the situation from a new point of view. No nation, not even Spain, they said, had ever passed such an act against colonies, an act which closed and blockaded all ports, which was intended to kill all trade, and cut off the great supply of the fisheries. It was to be enforced, they heard, by sending out additional troops and new generals. And this was the result of the petitions and appeals of that Congress of the Colonies which, it was fondly supposed, would compel an amicable settlement. The Fisheries Bill had been introduced into Parliament early in 1775, and news of the debates on it and the evident probability of its passage reached the colonies within five or six weeks, but the bill did not become a law until the last week in March and before the news of this dread event could travel across the ocean, during the month of April another event happened which opened the eyes of everyone, and gave them a year's political growth within a week. Evidence of treason and rebellion had been accumulating against the leaders in Massachusetts, and especially against Samuel Adams and John Hancock. An attempt had been made by General Gage to win over Adams. Colonel Fenton was sent to him with an intimation that it would be greatly to his profit and safety should he withdraw from the rebellion. Asterisk the exact nature of the reward he was to receive is not known, but, no doubt, it was considerable, and most tactfully and delicately offered. Adams, however, was incorruptible and inflexible, and continued to be as busy as a bee with his plans for independence. Life of Samuel Adams, p. 302. Gage soon had instructions to seize both him and Hancock at the first convenient opportunity and send them to England. But he also had instructions not to provoke the colonists, and to avoid a conflict as long as possible. The seizure of Adams, who managed so many of the details of the Patriot movement in Massachusetts, would surely mean a conflict. Meantime, spring came and just about the time the fisheries bill was passed, in the end of March, Samuel Adams became very busy with a meeting held out at Concord to send delegates to another congress which was to assemble at Philadelphia in May. This meeting at Concord was a meeting of that provincial congress which had been created by the Suffolk Resolutions, and now professed to govern Massachusetts in opposition to the old government, under the altered charter, with Gage at its head. Gage also learned that powder and all sorts of military stores were being quietly hauled over the roads to that same village of Concord. The meeting at Concord lasted from March 22 to April 15, and, just before it adjourned, Gage seems to have thought that the time for prompt action had come. He could now seize the military stores at Concord, and at the same time capture Adams and also John Hancock who had made a large fortune out of smuggling, and was willing to risk it and his neck by joining the rebels. The government was about to secure passage of the fisheries bill, reinforcements were about to start for America, and there must be no more laxity or delay in subduing the rebellion. The rebel meeting at Concord had adjourned. But Adams and Hancock had not returned to Boston, and were staying at the house of the Reverend Jonas Clark at Lexington. This was exactly what Gage wanted. The seizure could be made much more quietly at Clark's house than in Boston. So, on the evening of the 18th of April he sent 800 troops to Lexington to take both Adams and Hancock, and at the same time capture the military stores at Concord. Thus it came to pass that Samuel Adams, who had purposely widened the breach between the colonies and the mother country, now made that breach absolutely irreparable by unwittingly bringing on the Battle of Lexington. The deepest wish of the old man's heart was gratified that day. The devoted labors of long years culminated. Blood was spilt at last, and now there could be no turning back. We all know the story, how Gage's troops left Boston, as they supposed very secretly, in the darkness. 
but their movements were watched, and Paul Revere, the silversmith, who had not hoped for any more good riding till Congress should meet in May, had a grand ride that night. He stirred Adams and Hancock out of their beds, and then sped on through the exhilarating air to warn the Minutemen. The next morning Gage's troops found that their birds had flown from Lexington, and that the military stores had been largely removed from Concord. They were soon exchanging shots with the farmers and Minutemen, and then were in full retreat, with the farmers peppering them from behind the stone walls. Meantime, Adams and Hancock were making their way across the fields. As the reports of the muskets reached their ears, Adams knew that the crowning day of his life had come, and he is said to have exclaimed, What a glorious morning is this! But to many thousands in the colonies, and perhaps to nearly one half of the people, that morning of April 19th at Lexington did not seem glorious at all. It was a serious business, these farmers, these boers, these colonial peasants, hastily summoned, and killing 273 British regulars, a detestable, horrible affair, with consequences leading no man knew whither. One of the first consequences was that the Minutemen all through New England were summoned, and were soon streaming along the roads that led to Boston. Huff, ungainly, unassorted men, round-shouldered and stiff from a labor, some of them, perhaps, in the old, ill-fitting militia uniform of blue turned back with red, but most of them in smock frocks, as they had worked in the fields, or with faded red or green coats, old yellow embroidered waistcoats, greasy and dirty, some with great wigs that had once been white, some in their own hair, with every imaginable kind of hat or fur cap, trailing every variety of old musket and shotgun, without order or discipline, joking with their leaders, talking, excited, welcoming to their ranks students from New Haven and clerks from country stores, they hurried from the bleak hills of New Hampshire and the sunny valleys of Connecticut until within four or five days they had collected sixteen thousand strong at the little village of Cambridge, where they remained, half starved, shivering in the cold nights without blankets. Their leaders distributed these starving, shivering, motley patriots, about a thousand to the mile, in a large half-circle on the west side of Boston, from the Mystic River on the north, through Cambridge, and round to Roxbury and Dorchester on the south shutting in Gage and his handful of four or five thousand men, who, the Patriots said, must now take ship and leave Boston free. A rebellion always seems ridiculous, impossible, and mistaken, except to those that have drunk its inspiration. Horrible stories were circulated about the atrocities committed by the farmers on the dead and wounded regulars at Lexington. They had not forgotten, it was said, their habits in the French and Indian War. They scalped some of the wounded British soldiers, leaving them to drag themselves about in torture with their bleeding, skinless skulls, and they gouged out the eyes of others in true Virginian fashion. Two Americans never believed these tales, but they were circulated and believed in England. What sane man, English people argued, could approve of this rebellion against the great righteous British Empire, that, having already conquered India and America, was proceeding to absorb half the earth and outnumbered the colonists four to one. Such was the opinion of nearly a million of our people at that time. Certainly more than a third, and some have said more than half, of our white population believed that the rabble of farmers surrounding the handful of self-restrained and handsome troops in Boston was not merely a rabble of the misguided, but a rabble of criminals, who were bringing destruction on the innocent along with themselves map of the siege of Boston, showing the importance of Breed's Hill, Dorchester Heights, and Nukes Hill. How shall I describe the people who held this opinion? Some of them were living within sight of the rebel farmers and looking at them from their windows, and the rest were scattered through the colonies to the swamps and pines of Georgia. No census was taken, and there is no collection of statistics by which we can learn the relative numbers of loyalists and patriots. It is all estimating and guessing, and in this respect the men who took part in the revolution were not much better off than we are. The loyalists themselves always believed that they were a majority. 
their upholders have supported this assertion by showing that over 25,000 of them enlisted in the British Army, and that, without counting those in the privateers and navy, there were in 1779 and at several other times more of them in the British Army than there were soldiers in the rebel armies of the Congress. 3. Washington never had 25,000 men under his command, and sometimes only 4,000. If the British generals, the loyalists said, had given suitable encouragement, there would have been still larger loyalist enlistments. When we examine the estimates which were made of their numbers by their contemporaries, we find the most extraordinary disagreement. John Adams, writing in 1780, estimated them at not more than a twentieth part of the whole population. In 1815 he estimated them at a little more than a third. Galloway, in his examination before Parliament, and in one of his pamphlets, estimated them at nine-tenths and at four-fifths. General Robertson, in his testimony before the Committee on the Conduct of the War, estimated them at two-thirds. He described the population as one-third for the Congress, one-third neutral, and one-third loyal, which he thought gave two-thirds which could be called loyal. I can suggest only one way of reconciling these statements, and that is by defining what is meant by the term loyalist. There were, in a general way, four classes of persons to whom the name could be applied. The first class was composed of people who were thoroughly English, untouched by the American environment and aggressiveness, and not only uninfluenced by the rights of man and Whig principles, but loathing and detesting anything of that kind. Most of these people finally left the country and went to live in England, Canada, or the West Indies. Governor Hutchinson, of Massachusetts, and that very muscular Christian, Reverend Dr. Boucher, of Maryland, were of this class, and perhaps Jonathan Sewall and Daniel Leonard might be included in it. The second class were somewhat more Americanized. They were anxious to remain, but they wished the country to be ruled by England. They had no confidence in any other rule. They were willing to argue and struggle in a legal and constitutional manner, as they called it, for greater privileges, or for redress of grievances, but if England decided against them that would end the matter. These were the people who were willing to accept British rule without guarantees of liberty, having full confidence that in the long run that rule would be satisfactory, and that the guarantees which the patriots demanded were unnecessary. They were strong believers in the empire, and wished to live in colonies which were part of the empire. Kerwin, of Massachusetts, and Van Schack, of New York, who have left us such interesting memoirs, seem to have been of this class, so also were some of the Delancey family, of New York, and Joseph Galloway and the Allen family, of Pennsylvania. The great stumbling block with them was the Declaration of Independence. Thomas Jones, of New York, a typical loyalist. In the early stages of the revolution they had acted for the most part with the patriots and prevented any distinct line of demarcation between the parties. But when the movement for independence showed itself strongly, as in the approval by the Congress of the Suffolk Resolutions, they began to drop out of the patriot ranks, and when it became evident that there was to be an open declaration of independence, they went out in greater numbers. They were often treated with contempt by British officers and called whitewash trebles. The well-to-do among them, as Graydon tells us, were sometimes informed that by their former association with the rebels they had forfeited their right to be treated as gentlemen. A very large proportion of this second class left the country before the war was over and never returned, and, as they were out of sympathy with the American national spirit, their absence was an advantage to us. These two classes included all that could be strictly called loyalists. But the term was often applied to the neutrals and those who, for want of a better name, may be called the hesitating class. The neutrals would have nothing to do with the contest either one way or the other. Most of the Quakers of Pennsylvania, and many of the Pennsylvania Germans were neutrals. There were also individuals of all sorts of creeds scattered over the country some of them persons of wealth and prominence, who held entirely aloof, and are properly described as neutral. 
The hesitating class have sometimes been described as the people who were wondering on which side their bread was buttered. Some of them would at times enlist for a few weeks with the patriots, but a patriot disaster would scatter them, and many of them deserted to the British or took the British oath of allegiance, which they frequently broke at the first opportunity. Most of them, however, never enlisted at all. They were more or less willing that the patriots should win, but they were waiting for that event to happen. All through the revolution we hear of the prominent ones among them, especially in New York, going over to the British side, having made up their minds that at last the current had set that way. In the dark days of 1780 a great many of them went over, and they were apparently quite numerous in the southern colonies. When all these classes were counted together, there was a certain amount of plausibility in General Robertson saying that the loyalists were two-thirds of the people, and when Galloway says that they were four-fifths or nine-tenths he was evidently counting with considerable exaggeration all the people that could be in any way relied upon, positively or negatively, to assist the British cause. When Adams said that the loyalists were only one-twentieth of the people, he was interested in making their numbers seem as small as possible and we may assume that he was speaking only of the extreme loyalists, possibly only of the class first mentioned. He was then in Amsterdam trying to persuade the Dutch to take the side of the American patriots with loans of money, if not by actual war. He was answering a request of the famous Dutch lawyer, Carl Cohn, who had asked him to prove by striking facts that an implacable hatred of England reigns throughout America, and, to show that this is general, that the Tories are in so small a number and of such little force that they are counted as nothing. Adams complied to the best of his ability, and did not think it necessary to count the neutrals and hesitating class, or to exaggerate at all the numbers of the extreme loyalists. Many years after the revolution, in 1813, he said that the loyalists had been about a third, and he was then evidently counting the first and second classes. In 1815 he said substantially the same, and gives an interesting estimate which is very like that of General Robertson. I should say that full one third were averse to the revolution. These, retaining that overweening fondness, in which they had been educated, for the English, could not cordially like the French, indeed, they most heartily detested them. An opposite third conceived a hatred for the English and gave themselves up to an enthusiastic gratitude to France. The middle third, composed principally of the yeomanry, the soundest part of the nation, and always averse to war, were rather lukewarm to both England and France, and sometimes stragglers from them, and sometimes the whole body, united with the first or last third, according to circumstances. Adams, Works, Volume X. P. 110. The violence with tar and feathers and the restricted freedom of speech must, as Sabine points out, have turned many patriots into loyalists. Many who sympathized with patriot principles wanted to check the patriot disorders and compel them to respect the rights of person and property. But failing in this, and being treated with suspicion, abuse, and contempt, they were forced in self defense into the ranks of the loyalists. After hostilities began and the revolution was well underway, the loyalists were probably a majority in New York, in South Carolina, and in Georgia. In Pennsylvania, Maryland, and New Jersey they are supposed to have been more evenly balanced, each side claiming the majority. Even in New England and Virginia the loyalists were more numerous than is generally supposed. We may form a more distinct idea of their numbers when we learn that all through the revolution they were leaving the country by thousands, 3,000 here, 4,000 there, 12,000 at another place, up even to 100,000 which are said to have left with Sir Guy Carlton when he evacuated New York. In spite of all these migrations, the Patriots found it necessary, all through the revolution, to banish, confiscate, lessen their numbers, and break their spirit in every possible way. Some of the worst atrocities committed upon them happened after peace was declared, and this is said to have caused the great migration with Sir Guy Carlton. 
many of them became convinced that there would be no use in trying to live in the country even in peaceful times. There was quite a strong opinion among the patriots that if the extreme loyalists remained they would form a dangerous political party which would check the growth of nationality and watch every opportunity to assist England to gain again some sort of suzerainty or control over America, and there is no doubt that England had hopes of this for many years. The province of New Brunswick in Canada was settled by loyalists, and cut off from Nova Scotia for their satisfaction and accommodation. They became also the founders of Upper Canada. Thousands of them returned to England. Other thousands, especially the neutrals and hesitating class, remained, and their descendants are with us today. While it is true that a large portion of the professional classes, clergy, lawyers, doctors, teachers, and graduates of Harvard College were represented among the loyalists, yet we must disabuse our minds of the fancy so many have that most of the loyalists were upper class people. Three fourths of them and more were of the lower and middle classes, as can readily be seen in the lists which were published in Philadelphia, Boston, and New York giving each one's occupation or rank. Candlemakers, carpenters, blacksmiths, sailors, shopkeepers, clerks, tied waiters, and yeomen, as laboring men were then called, are profusely mingled with merchants, physicians, lawyers, and gentlemen. The serious effect which the neutrals and hesitating class had in increasing the strength of the loyalists and in weakening the patriots is seen in the number of Washington's forces. The highest guess at the number of the patriot population puts them at two-thirds, or, say, 1,400,000 out of the 2,200,000 white population. But if there were really 1,400,000 enthusiastic patriots, they would surely have furnished more than the 10,000 men which Washington usually had. He should have had at least 50,000 out of a patriot population of 1,400,000, and, indeed, 50,000 is the number which the Congress always expected, but never obtained. Even in their direst need and by the greatest urging and compulsion of all the patriot leaders, by offering bounties, gifts of land, and by drafting they could never get quite 25,000 all told. 4. During the winter of 1777-78 the patriots must have been very few in number in Pennsylvania and New Jersey for during that winter Washington's small force of less than 9,000 men almost starved to death at Valley Forge. They were surrounded in every direction by a rich farming country. The British army of 20,000 shut up in Philadelphia relied chiefly on ships which brought supplies up the river. But the farmers of the surrounding country voluntarily brought and sold their supplies to the British in Philadelphia, leaving the Patriot army to starve. The few provisions Washington had were obtained by raiding these loyalist supply wagons on their way to Philadelphia and by sending far to the south in Virginia and the Carolinas. If the Patriots were as numerous and enthusiastic as some have supposed, the starving time at Valley Forge is inexplicable. The usual difficulty of putting down a rebellion, or destroying independence, is that the native population support the Patriots. Hence the concentration camps that have been used in modern times to prevent such assistance and to exert a moral pressure by imprisoning the patriot women and children, where they will be subjected to the diseases, demoralization, and misery of close quarters. This method had not been thought of at the time Howe was in Philadelphia, and he had not much need of it, for Washington's force very nearly perished by simply leaving him to the mercy of his own people. The truth is that those who were really willing to risk themselves or their property in the cause of independence, and die in the last ditch, were comparatively few. There is every reason to suppose that they were less than a million. They were the heroic element, deeply inspired by the desire for a country of their own. Then there were those only a little inspired, who were willing that the heroes should perform the miracle of succeeding but they could not see any advantage in risking their own necks, health, property, or comfort in the performance of something, which, after all, might be superhuman. They were waiting and watching. If the rebellion were crushed they would be sorry, but they would also be safe. 
14. The Second Continental Congress and the Protests of the Loyalists. With Lexington fresh in everybody's mind, the Second Continental Congress, which some had professed to think would never be necessary, assembled on May 10, in Philadelphia. Many of the former members were present and a few new ones. In June, a new member appeared, comma, a tall young man with a prominent chin, light colored eyes, and red hair. He was not an orator or even a good speaker, but in ordinary intercourse he could keep up an enthusiastic, hopeful conversation, full of varied information and point. This young Virginian, of good estate, half lawyer and half planter, had no respect for conservatism. He not only approved of the farmer army besieging Boston, but would overwhelm the whole of Europe with such things. People were soon hearing a great deal of this Thomas Jefferson, and some of them described him as the most delightful destroyer of dust and cobwebs that they had ever known. Franklin had just returned from England, and had been immediately elected to the Congress. He had sailed almost on the day the fisheries bill had passed, not quite sure that he would not be seized before he could start, and locked up in the tower. He had steadily declared his belief in the possibility of a compromise, and expected to go back to England in a few months charged with the mission of finally settling all difficulties. But when he reached Philadelphia and heard of Lexington, he quickly abandoned all talk of a peaceful settlement and took his place among the extreme patriots. Lexington, the unorganized army besieging Boston, the final passage of the Fisheries Bill, the savage, blunt refusal of all colonial suggestions of liberty, and fresh troops and armaments sailing for America were now the great and deplorable facts of the day. What was to be done? Philadelphia and the Congress could no longer be gay and jovial. Dinner parties and entertainments were few. The Congress had no time for them for they were at work from morning till far into the night. Those who engage in an open rebellion against Great Britain have no time to lose. Moreover, many of the people who, the year before, had entertained the members at their houses were no longer friendly to the Congress. John Adams was advocating most extreme measures in both public and private. He was proposing to recommend to each colony to seize all the Crown officers and officials within its limits and hold them as hostages for the safety of the people shut up with the British army in Boston. That done, the colonies were to be declared free and independent states, and then Great Britain could be informed that they would negotiate for a settlement of all difficulties on permanent principles. If she refused to negotiate, and insisted on war, she was to be informed that the colonies, now independent states, would seek for the alliance of France, Spain, or any European country that would assist them. And all this by those who had just declared that they had a horror of independence, and would not have it under any conditions. To cap the climax, the Congress was to adopt the unorganized farmers at Cambridge as its army, and appoint a general to command them. Conservatives and loyalists shrank from such proceedings. They were horrified to hear that the Congress was proposing to ask assistance of France and Spain. Old England's bitterest enemies. They were shocked when they heard that Arnold, who had set out from the Patriot Army at Cambridge, had, with the assistance of Ethan Allen, in Vermont, actually had the temerity to attack the two British forts on Lake Champlain, Ticonderoga, and Crown Point, and had taken them on May 10, the very day the Rebel Congress had assembled in Philadelphia. He sent the British flags he captured to the Congress and they decorated their walls of Carpenter's Hall with them as trophies, to show how much they loved the dear old mother. The doctrine, exclusively American in its origin, that rebels were merely men in arms fighting for an idea, mistaken or otherwise, who, when once subdued, were to be allowed to go their way like paroled prisoners of war, had not yet gained ground. Rebellion was at that time a more serious thing than it has since become under the American doctrine of the right of revolution. Most of the colonists could remember the slaughter and beheading inflicted in England on the rebels under the pretender of 1745. The frightful hanging, torturing, and transportation of men, women, and even children, for such rebellions as that of Monmouth, 
were by no means yet forgotten. There was not a colonist who had not heard descriptions of London after a rebellion, with the bloody arms and hind quarters of rebels hung about like butcher's meat, the ghastly heads rotting and stinking for months on the poles at Temple Bar and on London Bridge, with the hair gradually falling off the grinning skulls, as the people passed them day by day. A printed statement of the punishment for treason, taken from the British statute, was handed about in the colonies, no doubt to the great terror of many, and to the enforcement of the belief that it would be well to let the great civilizer, Britain, continue to govern America. That the offender be drawn to the gallows, and not be carried or walk, that he be hanged by the neck, and then cut down alive, that his entrails be taken out and burned while he is yet alive, that his head be cut off, that his body be divided into four parts, that his head and quarters be at the king's disposal. The loyalists reminded the restless revolutionists that they were opposing a country which, by the testimony of all time, had always given more liberty to its people and more orderly good government than any other nation in the world. As against the present outrageous violators of personal rights, the loyalists pointed to the peaceful security of those rights in the colonies under British rule previous to the recent outbreak of conceited colonial self-confidence. They pointed to the peaceful security of all rights of personal liberty in England and wherever the sway of the British Empire was undisturbed, that wondrous empire with its constitution, such a perfect balance between despotic power and popular licentiousness, that could protect the colonies forever by its military and naval greatness. Government and good order are its strength, liberty, civil and religious, its glory. Everything that contributes to its reputation and happiness I love, everything that tends to distress and disgrace it I abhor. What think you of the Congress now? New York, 1775. One of the ablest of the loyalist writers, after describing what he considered the atrocious mob rule of the patriot colonists, condensed in a sentence the deepest feeling of the loyalist party. All the hardships which you complain of, all the evils which you say you fear, from the weight of parliamentary power, endured for a century, would not injure this province so much as this mode of conduct, mob rule, continued for a twelve month. The Congress canvassed, p. 23, New York, 1774. In another pamphlet we find a similar passage. Be not deceived, my countrymen, order is in every respect more eligible than confusion. Tis heaven's first law, tis the basis of liberty. Let us therefore restore order and good government among ourselves, for until we do that it is impossible to be free. Short advice to the counties of New York, p. 15, New York, 1774. From the writings of other loyalists like Sewall and Leonard we can learn what an alarming appeal they made to those patriots who were timid and hesitating. The strength, they said which Great Britain is able to exert is more than sufficient to crush you to atoms in spite of all your bragging and vaporing. You will encounter a veteran army and navy lately come from sweeping the seas in all quarters of the globe. Your revenue, by your own calculation, will be only £75,000 a year against a nation which in the last war spent £17 million a year. Your towns are all on deep water and exposed to Britain's fleet. The greater part of your plantations and farms can be reached by the small boats of men of war, you will be exposed to calamities from which even demons turn their eyes. One summer will suffice to ruin you. Many of the colonists who had inclined to the patriot side were driven from it by the impossibility, as it seemed to them, of the colonies uniting in one government. The disintegrating forces of sectionalism would bring anarchy and confusion. Writers like Sewell made a strong appeal on this point. No radically distinct states, they said, have ever been successfully united in one government. You cannot keep eleven clocks all striking at the same time. History is full of such failures, and you, like the others, will become the prey of military despotism, and soon be parceled out, Poland-like, between France and Spain. Even if you escape this fate, your so-called independence will be a curse, because personal liberty, the security for life and property which Britain alone can protect, 
will be extinct among you. Even now you tire and feather, torture, and ruin those among you who are guilty of no other crime than upholding by argument the government under which you have lived and flourished for nearly two hundred years. We can now easily answer these arguments by merely stating the events that have since happened, but it was by no means easy to answer them when those events had not happened, when nobody really knew whether they would, and when there was very strong probability that they would not happen. That we should, at what was rapidly becoming our last moment, obtain the assistance of France, not to mention the assistance of Spain, and, later, of Holland, and that France, after helping us, would allow us to remain independent, was a statement which, in the year 1775, was by no means clear to everyone. The loyalists were disgusted with the thought of even asking France for assistance. They had fought the French in Canada, they had an hereditary hatred of France as the ancient and perpetual enemy of the English race. That she might possibly assist us for the purpose of weakening England they were willing to believe, but even this was uncertain, because French finances were generally thought to be in such a deplorable state as to prohibit her from another war with England, and she would not want to encourage rebellion, because she had colonies of her own in the West Indies. But supposing her reckless enough to enter upon such a war, and that she should succeed in doing what she had failed to do a few years before, comma, namely, drive Great Britain from the American continent, comma, was it believable that after that she would voluntarily let us go free? Such a supposition was contrary to history, contrary to human nature, and contrary to all that was known of the French monarchy. Even men like John Adams, who eagerly sought the assistance of France, believed to the last that she intended to enslave us. A political party grew up, especially in New England, inspired by this belief. Adams quarreled with Franklin because he thought him blind to this danger, and at the close of the revolution, when the treaty of peace with Great Britain was being negotiated, some American public men were seriously alarmed and lost faith in Franklin as a negotiator because they still felt sure of the evil intentions of France. In 1782, when the revolution was to all intents finished, both Kerwin and Van Schaak expressed what was the general opinion among loyalists and many others, that America was completely in the grip of France, and would remain so. Kerwin expected to see French dominion and wooden shoes remain forever in what had once been free British colonies. Asterisk. That France gave up all claim of suzerainty over us was part of our good fortune. But that such ideal conduct on the side of human liberty should really take place, and have to be credited to a French monarch, whose people were ground down under such a weight of despotism that they soon burst forth like a volcano, in what we call the French Revolution, was more than many of the educated, well-informed men of the year 1775 felt justified in believing. Spain, it was said, would certainly not assist us, for it would be an encouragement for all her South American colonies to break away from her. It was more likely that she and France would help to subdue us and demand part of our territory as a reward. Many loyalists believed that, even with the assistance of France and Spain, we could not win our independence. 7. The recent struggles of small states in Europe to secure independence were not encouraging. Sweden had been very unfortunate, and the liberties of the free towns of Germany had been curtailed. Within the last two or three years Austria, Russia, and Prussia had joined forces in conquering and making the first division of Poland's territory. In fact, this first attempt on Poland had been so successful that many expected soon to see a division of Switzerland and of the United Provinces. The Corsicans had won a temporary independence by the heroism and intelligence of their leader, General Paoli, who was popular in America, where a famous inn on the western road from Philadelphia was named after him. But in 1769 France completely crushed Corsican independence. Behold your fate when you appeal to France, slash said the loyalists. Do you suppose that the power which destroyed the independence of Corsica will give you independence? 8. In fact, at this period the aggressions of the great nations over the small had very much increased. The day for small nationalities seemed to be passing, 
and in England Toryism was becoming more and more powerful. 9. Even stout and pugnacious patriots like John Adams could at times find no comfort. Suppose Great Britain crushed the whole outbreak, as she evidently intended to do, and governed the colonies as she had governed Ireland or India, where would he be? If I go mourning in my heart all the day long, though I say nothing, I am melancholy for the public and anxious for my family. As for myself, a frock and trousers, a hoe and spade would do for my remaining days. I feel unutterable anxiety, he writes again. God grant us wisdom and fortitude else should the opposition be suppressed, should this country submit, what infamy, what ruin, God forbid. Death in any form is less terrible. There is one ugly reflection, he says, in a letter to Joseph Warren. Brutus and Cassius were conquered and slain, Hampton died in the field, Sidney on the scaffold, Harrington in jail. This is cold comfort. Apostrophe Morse, Adams pp. 54, 60. It was simply a desperate chance, a forlorn hope, which the patriot colonists seized with that faith, that determination to do or perish, which only rebels and enthusiasts inspired by great ideas possess. They could not prove conclusively that their ideal and hope of independence was either possible or practicable, and the clever writers among the loyalists could easily make it seem to be a delusion or a chimera. After a certain point was reached on the patriot side all argument became useless, and hundreds of humble instances of this were occurring every day. Thomas Johnston, for example, of Charlotte County, Virginia, had been argued and expostulated with, and doubtless balanced and worried in his own mind a great deal. But at last he reduced it all to the simple announcement, I expect to share with the Americans in the present unhappy contest, whether the event proves good or bad, asterisk and that was really all that could be said. 15. Bunker Hill. During the month of May, while the Congress was debating whether it would adopt the extreme measures which such men as John Adams were advocating, General Howe, accompanied by Burgoyne, Clinton, and several thousand men, was on the ocean, and on the 25th of May, they sailed into Boston Harbor and joined Gage in the town. Gage's force was by this means raised to about 10,000 so that it seemed comparatively easy for him to face the 16,000 farmers who shut him in on the land side. After all that Howe had said to his constituents about the righteousness of the American cause, and that he would not fight against such people, there was surprise and some indignation among the Whigs in England when his appointment was announced. The Congress at Philadelphia declared that America was amazed to find the name of Howe in the catalogue of her enemies she loved his brother. Asterisk. You should have refused to go against the Americans, said his old supporters at Nottingham, as you said you would. But how, not in the least disconcerted, replied that his appointment came not as an offer, but as an order from the king, and he had no choice but to obey. Asterisk he was to serve as a subordinate for a few months, and then supersede Gage as commander-in-chief, to put down the American rebellion so he was in Boston, with the troops camped on that hill where we now follow the streets called Beacon and Tremont. From the hill one could then look over the houses below and see far out into the harbor and watch the approaching ships rise up out of the horizon. Beacon Hill, on which the troops encamped on vacant lots of ground and on the common, was then exactly what its name implies. On the top of it was constructed a sort of high platform which could be heaped up with pitch pine and combustibles, which a few strokes of a flint and steel would send blazing into the air. It was a monument of rebellion, a symbol of the passion for self-government, and might have been made the Massachusetts coat of arms. Nearly a hundred years before, when Massachusetts heard that James II, the symbol of British despotism, had been driven from the throne, this beacon was kindled. The modern telegraph and telephone could not have delivered their message more speedily. The people understood. They poured into the town. They seized the officials of the British power, governor and all, and, gently placing them on ships, sent them back to England. The colony belonged to the people again for a little while, 
as in the old days before they lost their first charter, and one moment of self-government was to a Massachusetts man worth the sacrifice of all the rest of life. But now there was a different scene on Beacon Hill. The British government was more powerful than it had ever been before, and one could gaze with amused interest on the 10,000 troops shut up in a town with the townsfolk who were their enemies. The soldiers, Lieutenant Clark tells us, seemed shorter in stature than the Americans. There were some regiments of veterans, famous organizations, such as the 47th, Wolf's Own, the 38th, and the 52nd. There were Irishmen in the ranks, and a regiment called the Royal Irish. It was rather curious that Irishmen should be fighting to destroy the ideas and principles which in the next century saved thousands of their race from death in the Irish famine, and gave millions more a refuge and a home, a liberty and prosperity unattainable for them under Britain's rule. In Boston, however, at this time, Britain's soldiery, boisterous and boastful, were living merrily enough. They took the old South Church for the cavalry, or, as an officer described it, a meeting house where sedition has been often preached, is clearing out to be a riding school for the dragoons. 10. Sentinels posted in all parts of the town were perpetually challenging the people, and quarrels were frequent because of the strained conditions. The people were ready to believe any evil of the soldiery, and the soldiery were anxious to find evil among the people. The people insisted that they had caught Captain Wilson, of the 59th, inciting the Negro slaves of the town to attack their masters, and the army believed that it had complete evidence of a plot among the townsfolk to massacre all the British officers who were quartered in dwelling houses. 11. Most of the rebel townsfolk, especially the prominent ones, had gone away. Hancock's handsome residence was closed. No one would have answered a knock at Samuel Adams's rickety dwelling. But many of the ordinary people, who could not very well be tried for treason, remained. Loyalists were numerous, and Gage had a citizen's patrol of three hundred of them, whom he made very proud by giving them badges. No doubt they ridiculed the farmer's army, gave plenty of suggestions for suppressing the wicked rebellion as quickly as possible and were happy in their confidence that the beneficence of British rule would soon be re-established. Soon, however, there came a day, a Saturday afternoon, of the greatest possible excitement, when all the inhabitants then in the town, loyalists, rebels, and soldiers, could stand on the hill or climb on the roofs of the houses, or on the masts of ships, and, looking across towards Charlestown, see redcoats mowed down, whole ranks at a time, by old fowling pieces and Queen Anne muskets in the hands of farmers, see the blood staining the bright June grass, and wounded men rising on their elbows to vomit, than which, after a bullfight, what could be a grander or more ennobling sight? It is not often that a battle is seen with perfect distinctness by non-combatant spectators who outnumber by thousands the forces engaged on both sides of the fight. But Gage, military governor and commander-in-chief of Massachusetts, insisted on giving his people this spectacle. It had been for a long time quite obvious to him that the hill north of Boston across a narrow strip of water should be occupied as an outpost, because if the farmers seized it they could cannonade the town. So now, being greatly reinforced by the new arrivals, he made preparations for occupying and fortifying that hill, when lo! One morning, June 17, 1775, he beheld the farmers in full possession of it. They had worked like beavers all night, making breastworks of earth, hay, and fence rails, after their absurd rustic manner, and they kept working away all morning in spite of the guns fired at them from the men of war. The hill which the farmers had seized was Breed's Hill, on a peninsula connected with the mainland by a very narrow passage. The Patriot Army, which at this time was commanded by General Ward, assisted by Putnam, Stark, Prescott, and others, had learned of the probability of the British seizing the hill, and had determined to forestall them. In the judgment of military critics it was a rather desperate undertaking, because they were going out on a peninsula where the British, by seizing the narrow passage at the mainland, might catch them like sheep in a pen. 
it is probable that they were led to take this risk by the feeling that, if they remained inactive and avoided fighting, the Patriot cause would be injured and discouraged. This explanation applies to several battles during the first three years of the revolution which were fought under great disadvantages, and in which defeat for the Americans was certain. But certain defeat was far less injurious than a refusal to fight. They, however, risked on the peninsula only 1500 men, who went out under the leadership of Putnam, Prescott, and Stark. They at first intended to seize Bunker Hill, but found Breed's Hill easier to fortify and nearer to Boston. They built the earth redoubt on Breed's Hill, and then extended their line to the water on their left by means of fence rails, hay, and a low stone wall. Gage declined to take the obvious course of sending a force behind the rebels at the neck of the peninsula. He said he would be placing such a force in a dangerous position between the rebels on Breed's Hill and their reinforcements near Cambridge. There was no necessity, he thought, for taking so much risk as that, because two or three thousand of His Majesty's troops could easily send these peasants flying by attacking them in front in British fashion. This force he placed in command of Howe, with General Pigott to assist him. It was a strange position for a Whig, the brother of George Howe, to lead such an attack on the New England farmers, who had fought under both him and his brother in the French and Indian War. If left to himself, he would never have made such a front attack. He would have made one of those flanking and rear movements with which afterwards, whenever compelled to fight, he was invariably successful against Washington without a great loss of life. But he was not yet in supreme command. He was a subordinate and must obey. In all the controversy over Howe's conduct in the Revolution, his courage was never questioned. In fact, his reputation for rather remarkable courage had long before this been well established. Sending Pigott up against the redoubt. How led his own division against that part of the farmer's line where the rail fences had been placed together and stuffed with hay. He had chosen the worst place, for behind that hay was the old trapper, Stark, from New Hampshire, and that other mad rebel, old put the wolf hunter from Connecticut. How is said to have made a speech to his men, which was, in substance, you must drive these farmers from the hill or it will be impossible for us to remain in Boston. But I shall not desire any of you to advance a single step beyond where I am at the head of your line. Asterisk. Asterisk. The card player was always very precise on the battlefield. When within 100 yards of the hay he compelled his troops to deploy into line. For this he was afterwards severely criticized. He should have taken them up, it was said, in columns but in columns they would have been just as much of a target. The card player usually knew what he was doing, especially in sparing the lives of his men. They moved up, about twelve feet apart in front, but very close after one another, in deep, long files. They were beautiful, brilliant, their red coats, white knee breeches, and shining musket barrels glittering in the sun. At the distance of about a hundred yards they began firing at the hay, from which there was an occasional shot from some patriot who could not be restrained. Map of the Battle of Bunker Hill No doubt they joked and encouraged one another, and shouted at the Mohairs and Dunghill tribe, as they called the colonists. Let us take the bull by the horns, some of them are reported to have said, and they may have sung snatches from their favorite song, Hot Stuff. From such rascals as these may we fear a rebuff? advance, grenadiers, and let fly your hot stuff. Unfortunately, our accounts of this remarkable battle are very meager in reliable details. We know, however, that they moved up to within fifty steps of the hay, amazed that not a shot answered their volleys. Fifty steps seem now a very short range, but all the battles of that time were fought at about that distance because the smooth bore muskets and shotguns that were used were inaccurate beyond fifty yards, and practically useless at a hundred. Suddenly, when the front line of the regulars had moved a few steps nearer, the faces of the farmers rose above the barrier and the sweep of the farmers' scythe, those dreadful volleys of miscellaneous missiles that had been crammed into the old guns, 
made a terrible day for British soldiers asterisk. Whole ranks were cut down to a man. The survivors hesitated, and then turned down the hill like frightened sheep, to halt at the bottom and stare back at their comrades, struggling and dying on the grass. Piggott's division was in a similar plight. The men of war in the harbour now renewed their cannonade. The balls ricocheted up the hillside, and the shells burst savagely overhead, but the farmers were again entirely silent. Howe rallied his men. He had been with some of these regiments in Canada in the French War, and no doubt addressed to them some stirring words which have not been recorded. He led them up again, up to within that same fifty paces, without a shot in reply. They moved nearer. Could it be that they could reach the breastwork and spring over it unharmed? They moved on, drew closer, they were within thirty yards of the hay, which suddenly, at a word from the trapper and the wolf hunter, turned into a spitting flame and smoke, and how must have believed that this was the last fight of his career. They stayed a little longer this time, they had come so far that they tried to move up closer, they saw the American face as no Englishman had ever seen it before. Colonel Abercrombie, are the Yankees cowards? A farmer would shout, as he rested his piece on the breastwork. No doubt also terrible curses and fierce denunciations of British rake hells, tyrants, and brutes were poured over with the bullets. It was something new for a British officer to see an old farmer let a young redcoat come up close and then, leveling his rusty duck gun of vast bore, draw on the boy the deadly aim that tore him to pieces with buckshot and slugs. There, there. They would cry, see that officer. Shoot him. And two or three would cover him with their guns, terrible old pieces, loaded with all manner of missiles. They had been told to aim for the belt and nearly every soldier was hit in the thighs and loins. When he had received the discharge from an old duck gun he was a horrible sight for the surgeon. But how, though resolved, if necessary, to make that day his last, could not hold his men up there by the hay. They fled panic-stricken. Some even rushed into their boats at the shore, and Howe soon found himself at the bottom of the hill, no doubt very much surprised to be yet alive. His white silk knee breeches and long white stockings were soaked with blood, but it was the blood of his men among whom he had trampled. He had not a single subordinate officer remaining, they were all lying up on the hillside. A long time elapsed, while he consulted with Piggott and his officers, who were for giving it up and going back. But the card player had a reputation to support, and was determined to see it out. The village of Charleston along the right of the Patriot line, was now on fire. The thick, black smoke that comes from burning dwelling houses was rolled out by the wind in a vast cloud clear-cut against the brilliant, sunny sky of that June day. Beneath the terrible gloomy canopy that was ploughing through the glittering sunlight crouched the silent Americans, looking down at a thousand dead and dying Englishmen on the hillside, while all around, almost as close as in a theatre, the thousands of spectators in windows, and perched on the tops of houses and chimneys and ship masts, watched this wondrous close of the second act. Ho oh, such battle with such a large audience close at hand can never be fought again, unless we go back to firearms that are useless at one hundred yards. The curtain rose on the third act in this theatre, this drama of history that has become a sign and a monument to the world the sneer and sarcasm of monarchs, conquerors, and lovers of dominion, the hope of the enthusiastic and the oppressed. Was it the design that it should be enacted like a gladiator's show in a little natural arena with overwhelming clouds of witnesses that it might become a symbol, an example to keep alive the endless struggle, the unsolvable problem of the world? How sent Piggott up again, and he went up himself. He ordered the men to free themselves of their heavy knapsacks. He concentrated the whole British force on the redoubt, and used the artillery more effectively. Even with this advantage the first volley his men received was very destructive. But the ammunition of the Patriots was exhausted. They were hurling stones over the breastwork and retreating. The regulars sprang up upon the redoubt. 
they saw barefooted countrymen with trousers rolled up to their knees walking away, and there were scarcely any dead or wounded in the trenches. But only a few of those regulars who first mounted the redoubt lived to tell what they saw, for they were shot down almost to a man with the remains of the ammunition. Then the whole British force swarmed over the breastwork, and for a time there was confusion and hand-to-hand -hand conflicts as the Americans retreated. The British were finally able to deliver a crossfire, which caused most of the loss to the Patriots that day. But they moved off in good order. A few yards retreat easily put them beyond the effective range of the muskets. Howe ordered no pursuit, although Clinton urged him to do it, and the helplessness of the farmers was obvious. He had been ordered to take the hill, he would do no more. But the loyalists always believed that he could have inflicted a terrible disaster, could have slaughtered or captured three-fourths of the rebels, and seriously crippled the rebellion. This was the first specimen of his line of policy, and also the beginning of the serious criticism upon him. From that time, though invariably successful in any battle he personally directed, he never pursued never followed up the advantage of a victory or allowed it to be followed up by others. The farmers, grouped in an irregular mass, a most miscellaneous, strangely clad, disorganized body to soldiers' eyes, withdrew from the arena on which they had played their part while the black smoke of the burning town was still rolling high overhead. They had represented their new idea, and they returned somewhat leisurely along Charlestown neck, pelted as their only applause, by spent and random balls and cannonaded to no purpose from two gunboats or floating batteries. Asterisk. There had been about 1,500 or 1,700 of them, and they had lost in dead and wounded 449. How took out from Boston between 2,500 and 3,000 regulars, and he left 1,054, more than a third, on the hillside. 16. The Character and Condition of the Patriot Army. Historians and Fourth of July orators have described the thrill of exultation which they say passed like a wave southward through the colonies with the news of the Battle of Bunker Hill. The Patriots were defeated, lost their hill and 449 in killed and wounded, but they had laid low 1,054 British regulars in resplendent uniforms of whom 89 were commissioned officers. They were encouraged, they could afford to sell the English many hills at the same price, and all manner of inferences have been drawn as to the inspiriting effect of this battle upon the Patriot colonists. This, however, is all modern rhetoric and supposition.